26, Prince of Mercy, or Scottish Trinitarian. While you were veiled in darkness, you heard repeated by the voice of the great past its most ancient doctrines. None has the right to object, if the Christian Mason sees foreshadowed in Krishna and Sosiash, in Mithras and Osiris, the divine word that, as he believes, became man, and died upon the cross to redeem a fallen race. Nor can he object if others see reproduced, in the word of the beloved disciple, that was in the beginning with God, and that was God, and by whom everything was made, only the logos of Plato. And the word or uttered thought or first emanation of light, or the perfect reason of the great, silent, supreme, uncreated deity, believed in and adored by all. We do not undervalue the importance of any truth. We utter no word that can be deemed irreverent by any one of any faith. We do not tell the Moslem that it is only important for him to believe that there is but one God, and wholly unessential whether Muhammad was his prophet. We do not tell the Hebrew that the Messiah whom he expects was born in Bethlehem nearly two thousand years ago, and that he is a heretic because he will not so believe. And as little do we tell the sincere Christian that Jesus of Nazareth was but a man like us, or his history but the unreal revival of an older legend. To do either is beyond our jurisdiction. Masonry, of no one age, belongs to all time. Of no one religion, it finds its great truths in all. To every Mason, there is a God, one, supreme, infinite in goodness, wisdom, foresight, justice, and benevolence, creator, disposer, and preserver of all things. How, or by what intermediates he creates and acts, and in what way he unfolds and manifests himself, Masonry leaves to creeds and religions to inquire. To every Mason, the soul of man is immortal. Whether it emanates from and will return to God, and what its continued mode of existence hereafter, each judges for himself. Masonry was not made to settle that. To every Mason, wisdom or intelligence, force or strength, and harmony, or fitness and beauty, are the trinity of the attributes of God. With the subtleties of philosophy concerning them Masonry does not meddle, nor decide as to the reality of the supposed existences which are their personifications, nor whether the Christian trinity be such a personification. Or a reality of the gravest import and significance. To every Mason, the infinite justice and benevolence of God give ample assurance that evil will ultimately be dethroned, and the good, the true, and the beautiful reign triumphant and eternal. It teaches, as it feels and knows, that evil, and pain, and sorrow exist as part of a wise and beneficent plan, all the parts of which work together under God's eye to a result which shall be perfection. Whether the existence of evil is rightly explained in this creed or in that, by Typhon the great serpent, by Araman and his armies of wicked spirits, by the giants and titans that war against heaven. By the two coexistent principles of good and evil, by Satan's temptation and the fall of man, by Locke and the serpent Fenris, it is beyond the domain of masonry to decide, nor does it need to inquire. Nor is it within its province to determine how the ultimate triumph of light and truth and good, over darkness and error and evil, is to be achieved. Nor whether the Redeemer, looked and longed for by all nations, hath appeared in Judea, or is yet to come. It reverences all the great reformers. It sees in Moses, the lawgiver of the Jews, in Confucius and Zoroaster, in Jesus of Nazareth, and in the Arabian iconoclast, great teachers of morality, and eminent reformers. If no more, and allows every brother of the order to assign to each such higher and even divine character as his creed and truth require. Thus Masonry disbelieves no truth, and teaches unbelief in no creed, except so far as such creed may lower its lofty estimate of the deity, degrade him to the level of the passions of humanity, deny the high destiny of man. Impugn the goodness and benevolence of the supreme God, strike at those great columns of masonry, faith, hope, and charity, or inculcate immorality, and disregard of the active duties of the order. Masonry is a worship, but one in which all civilized men can unite, for it does not undertake to explain or dogmatically to settle those great mysteries, that are above the feeble comprehension of our human intellect. It trusts in God, and hopes. It believes, like a child, and is humble. 
It draws no sword to compel others to adopt its belief, or to be happy with its hopes and it waits with patience to understand the mysteries of nature and nature's God hereafter. The greatest mysteries in the universe are those which are ever going on around us, so trite and common to us that we never note them nor reflect upon them. Wise men tell us of the laws that regulate the motions of the spheres, which, flashing in huge circles and spinning on their axes, are also ever darting with inconceivable rapidity through the infinities of space. While we atoms sit here, and dream that all was made for us. They tell us learnedly of centripetal and centrifugal forces, gravity, and attraction, and all the other sounding terms invented to hide a want of meaning. There are other forces in the universe than those that are mechanical. Here are two-minute seeds, not much unlike in appearance, and two of larger size. Hand them to the learned pundit, chemistry, who tells us how combustion goes on in the lungs, and plants are fed with phosphorus and carbon, and the alkalis and silex. Let her decompose them, analyze them, torture them in all the ways she knows. The net result of each is a little sugar, a little fibrin, a little water, carbon, potassium, sodium, and the like, one cares not to know what. We hide them in the ground, and the slight rains moisten them, and the sun shines upon them, and little slender shoots spring up and grow, and what a miracle is the mere growth. The force, the power, the capacity by which the little feeble shoot, that a small worm can nip off with a single snap of its mandibles, extracts from the earth and air and water the different elements, so learnedly catalogued. With which it increases in stature, and rises imperceptibly toward the sky. One grows to be a slender, fragile, feeble stalk, soft of texture, like an ordinary weed. Another a strong bush, of woody fiber, armed with thorns, and sturdy enough to bid defiance to the winds, the third a tender tree, subject to be blighted by the frost, and looked down upon by all the forest. While another spreads its rugged arms abroad, and cares for neither frost nor ice, nor the snows that for months lie around its roots. But lo! Out of the brown foul earth, and colorless invisible air, and limpid rain water, the chemistry of the seeds has extracted colors, for different shades of green, that paint the leaves which put forth in the spring upon our plants, our shrubs, and our trees. Later still come the flowers, the vivid colors of the rose, the beautiful brilliance of the carnation, the modest blush of the apple, and the splendid white of the orange. Whence come the colors of the leaves and flowers? By what process of chemistry are they extracted from the carbon, the phosphorus, and the lime? Is it any greater miracle to make something out of nothing? Pluck the flowers. Inhale the delicious perfumes, each perfect, and all delicious. Whence have they come? By what combination of acids and alkalis could the chemist's laboratory produce them? And now on too comes the fruit, the ruddy apple and the golden orange. Pluck them, open them. The texture and fabric how totally different. The taste how entirely dissimilar, the perfume of each distinct from its flower and from the other. Whence the taste and this new perfume? The same earth and air and water have been made to furnish a different taste to each fruit, a different perfume not only to each fruit, but to each fruit and its own flower. Is it any more a problem whence come thought and will and perception and all the phenomena of the mind, than this, whence come the colors, the perfumes, the taste, of the fruit and flower? And lo! In each fruit new seeds, each gifted with the same wondrous power of reproduction, each with the same wondrous forces wrapped up in it to be again in turn evolved. Forces that had lived three thousand years in the grain of wheat found in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy, forces of which learning and science and wisdom know no more than they do of the nature and laws of action of God. What can we know of the nature, and how can we understand the powers and mode of operation of the human soul, when the glossy leaves, the pearl-white flower, and the golden fruit of the orange are miracles wholly beyond our comprehension? We but hide our ignorance in a cloud of words, and the words too often are mere combinations of sounds without any meaning. What is the centrifugal force? A tendency to go in a particular direction. What external force, then, produces that tendency? What force draws the needle round to the north? What force moves the muscle that raises the arm, when the will determines it shall rise? 
whence comes the will itself? Is it spontaneous, a first cause, or an effect? These two are miracles, inexplicable as the creation, or the existence and self-existence of God. Who will explain to us the passion, the peevishness, the anger, the memory, and affections of the small canary wren? The consciousness of identity and the dreams of the dog? The reasoning powers of the elephant? The wondrous instincts, passions, government, and civil policy, and modes of communication of ideas of the ant and bee? Who has yet made us to understand, with all his learned words, how heat comes to us from the sun, and light from the remote stars, setting out upon its journey earthward from some, at the time the Chaldeans commenced to build the Tower of Babel? Or how the image of an external object comes to and fixes itself upon the retina of the eye, and when there, how that mere empty, unsubstantial image becomes transmuted into the wondrous thing that we call sight? Or how the waves of the atmosphere striking upon the tympanum of the ear, those thin, invisible waves, produce the equally wondrous phenomenon of hearing, and become the roar of the tornado, the crash of the thunder, the mighty voice of the ocean. The chirping of the cricket, the delicate sweet notes and exquisite trills and variations of the wren and mockingbird, or the magic melody of the instrument of Paganini. Our senses are mysteries to us, and we are mysteries to ourselves. Philosophy has taught us nothing as to the nature of our sensations, our perceptions, our cognizances, the origin of our thoughts and ideas, but words. By no effort or degree of reflection, never so long continued, can man become conscious of a personal identity in himself, separate and distinct from his body and his brain. We torture ourselves in the effort to gain an idea of ourselves, and weary with the exertion. Who has yet made us understand how, from the contact with a foreign body, the image in the eye, the wave of air impinging on the ear, particular particles entering the nostrils, and coining in contact with the palate, come sensations in the nerves. And from that, perception in the mind, of the animal or the man. What do we know of substance? Men even doubt yet whether it exists. Philosophers tell us that our senses make known to us only the attributes of substance, extension, hardness, color, and the like. But not the thing itself that is extended, solid, black or white, as we know the attributes of the soul, its thoughts and its perceptions, and not the soul itself which perceives and thinks. What a wondrous mystery is there in heat and light, existing, we know not how, within certain limits, narrow in comparison with infinity, beyond which on every side stretch out infinite space and the blackness of unimaginable darkness. And the intensity of inconceivable cold. Think only of the mighty power required to maintain warmth and light in the central point of such an infinity, to whose darkness that of midnight, to whose cold that of the last arctic island is nothing. And yet God is everywhere. And what a mystery are the effects of heat and cold upon the wondrous fluid that we call water. What a mystery lies hidden in every flake of snow and in every crystal of ice, and in their final transformation into the invisible vapor that rises from the ocean or the land, and floats above the summits of the mountains. What a multitude of wonders, indeed, has chemistry unveiled to our eyes. Think only that if some single law enacted by God were at once repealed, that of attraction or affinity or cohesion, for example, the whole material world, with its solid granite and adamant, its veins of gold and silver, its trap and porphyry, its huge beds of coal, our own frames and the very ribs and bones of this apparently indestructible earth, would instantaneously dissolve, with all suns and stars and worlds throughout all the universe of God into a thin invisible vapor of infinitely minute particles or atoms, diffused throughout infinite space. And with them light and heat would disappear, unless the Deity Himself be, as the ancient Persians thought, the eternal light and the immortal fire. The mysteries of the great universe of God. How can we with our limited mental vision expect to grasp and comprehend them? Infinite space, stretching out from us every way, without limit, infinite time, without beginning or end, and we, here, and now, in the center of each. An infinity of suns, the nearest of which only diminish in size, viewed with the most powerful telescope, each with its retinue of worlds. 
infinite numbers of such suns, so remote from us that their light would not reach us, journeying during an infinity of time, while the light that has reached us, from some that we seem to see, has been upon its journey for fifty centuries, our world spinning upon its axis, and rushing ever in its circuit round the sun. And it, the sun, and all our system revolving round some great central point. And that, and suns, stars, and worlds evermore flashing onward with incredible rapidity through illimitable space, and then, in every drop of water that we drink, in every morsel of much of our food, in the air, in the earth, in the sea. Incredible multitudes of living creatures, invisible to the naked eye, of a minuteness beyond belief, yet organized, living, feeding, perhaps with consciousness of identity, and memory and instinct. Such are some of the mysteries of the great universe of God. And yet we, whose life and that of the world on which we live form but a point in the center of infinite time, we, who nourish animalculi within, and on whom vegetables grow without, would fain learn how God created this universe. Would understand His powers, His attributes, His emanations, His mode of existence and of action. Would fain know the plan according to which all events proceed, that plan profound as God Himself, would know the laws by which He controls His universe. Would fain see and talk to Him face to face, as man talks to man, and we try not to believe, because we do not understand. He commands us to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourself. And we dispute and wrangle, and hate and slay each other, because we cannot be of one opinion as to the essence of His nature, as to His attributes, whether He became man born of a woman, and was crucified. Whether the Holy Ghost is of the same substance with the Father, or only of a similar substance, whether a feeble old man is God's vicegerent, whether some are elected from all eternity to be saved, and others to be condemned and punished. Whether punishment of the wicked after death is to be eternal, whether this doctrine or the other be heresy or truth, drenching the world with blood, depopulating realms, and turning fertile lands into deserts. Until, for religious war, persecution, and bloodshed, the earth for many a century has rolled round the sun, a charnel house, steaming and reeking with human gore, the blood of brother slain by brother for opinion's sake. That has soaked into and polluted all her veins, and made her a horror to her sisters of the universe. And if men were all masons, and obeyed with all their heart her mild and gentle teachings, that world would be a paradise, while intolerance and persecution make of it a hell. For this is the Masonic creed, believe, in God's infinite benevolence, wisdom, and justice, hope, for the final triumph of good over evil. And for perfect harmony as the final result of all the concords and discords of the universe, and be charitable as God is, toward the unfaith, the errors, the follies, and the faults of men, for all make one great brotherhood. Instruction Underscore Sen, W. Brother Junior Warden, are you a Prince of Mercy? Underscore June, W. I have seen the Delta and the Holy Names upon it, and am an Ameth like yourself, in the Triple Covenant, of which we bear the mark. Chu what is the first word upon the Delta? Ans the ineffable name of Deity, the true mystery of which is known to the Ameth alone. Chu what do the three sides of the Delta denote to us? Ans to us, and to all Masons, the three great attributes or developments of the essence of the Deity. Wisdom, or the reflective and designing power, in which, when there was naught but God, the plan and idea of the universe was shaped and formed, force, or the executing and creating power, which instantaneously acting. Realize the type and idea framed by wisdom. And the universe, and all stars and worlds, and light and life, and men and angels and all living creatures were. And harmony, or the preserving power, order, and beauty, maintaining the universe in its state, and constituting the law of harmony, motion, proportion, and progression, wisdom, which thought the plan. Strength, which created, harmony, which upholds and preserves, the Masonic Trinity, three powers and one essence, the three columns which support the universe, physical, intellectual, and spiritual. Of which every Masonic Lodge is a type and symbol, while to the Christian Mason, they represent the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, which three are one. Chu what do the three Greek letters upon the Delta, 
iota eta sigma, iota, eta, and sigma, represent. ANS 3 of the names of the supreme deity among the Syrians, Phoenicians, and Hebrews. Ihu, Hebrew. Self-existence. Al, Hebrew, the nature god, or soul of the universe. Shaddai, Hebrew, supreme power. Also three of the six chief attributes of God, among the Kabbalists, wisdom, i.e.h., the intellect, Greek, new omicron, of the Egyptians, the word, Greek, lambda gamma omicron, of the Platonists, and the wisdom, Greek, sigma omicron phi alpha, of the Gnostics. Magnificence, Al. The symbol of which was the lion's head, and victory and glory, Tzabaoth, which are the two columns Jachin and Boaz, that stand in the portico of the Temple of Masonry. To the Christian Mason they are the first three letters of the name of the Son of God, who died upon the cross to redeem mankind. Chu what is the first of the three covenants, of which we bear the mark? Ans that which God made with Noah. When he said, I will not again curse the earth any more for man's sake, neither will I smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. I will establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature. All mankind shall no more be cut off by the waters of a flood, nor shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the token of my covenant, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, an everlasting covenant between me and every living creature on the earth. Chu what is the second of the three covenants? Ans that which God made with Abraham, when he said, I am the absolute uncreated God. I will make my covenant between me and thee, and thou shalt be the father of many nations, and kings shall come from thy loins. I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy descendants after thee, to the remotest generations, for an everlasting covenant, and I will be thy God and their God, and will give thee the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Chu what is the third covenant? Ans that which God made with all men by his prophets, when he said, I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. The sun shall no more shine by day, nor the moon by night, but the Lord shall be an everlasting light and splendor. His spirit and his word shall remain with men forever. The heavens shall vanish away like vapor, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not end. And there shall be light among the Gentiles, and salvation unto the ends of the earth. The redeemed of the Lord shall return, and everlasting joy be on their heads, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Chu what is the symbol of the triple covenant? Ans the triple triangle. Chu of what else is it the symbol to us? Ans of the trinity of attributes of the deity. And of the triple essence of man, the principle of life, the intellectual power, and the soul or immortal emanation from the deity. Chu what is the first great truth of the sacred mysteries? Ans no man hath seen God at any time. He is one, eternal, all-powerful, all-wise, infinitely just, merciful, benevolent, and compassionate, creator and preserver of all things, the source of light and life, coextensive with time and space. Who thought, and with the thought created the universe and all living things, and the souls of men, that is, the permanent, while everything beside is a perpetual genesis. Chu what is the second great truth of the sacred mysteries? Ans the soul of man is immortal, not the result of organization, nor an aggregate of modes of action of matter, nor a succession of phenomena and perceptions. But an existence, one and identical, a living spirit, a spark of the great central light, that hath entered into and dwells in the body. To be separated therefrom at death, and return to God who gave it, that doth not disperse nor vanish at death, like breath or a smoke, nor can be annihilated. But still exists and possesses activity and intelligence, even as it existed in God, before it was enveloped in the body. Chu what is the third great truth in masonry? 
ANS the impulse which directs to right conduct, and deters from crime, is not only older than the ages of nations and cities, but coeval with that divine being who sees and rules both heaven and earth. Nor did Tarquin less violate that eternal law, though in his reign there might have been no written law at Rome against such violence. For the principle that impels us to right conduct, and warns us against guilt, springs out of the nature of things. It did not begin to be law when it was first written, nor was it originated, but it is coeval with the divine intelligence itself. The consequence of virtue is not to be made the end thereof, and laudable performances must have deeper roots, motives, and instigations, to give them the stamp of virtues. Chu what is the fourth great truth in masonry? ANS the moral truths are as absolute as the metaphysical truths. Even the deity cannot make it that there should be effects without a cause, or phenomena without substance. As little could he make it to be sinful and evil to respect our pledged word, to love truth, to moderate our passions. The principles of morality are axioms, like the principles of geometry. The moral laws are the necessary relations that flow from the nature of things, and they are not created by, but have existed eternally in God. Their continued existence does not depend upon the exercise of His will. Truth and justice are of His essence. Not because we are feeble and God omnipotent, is it our duty to obey His law. We may be forced, but are not under obligation, to obey the stronger. God is the principle of morality, but not by His mere will, which, abstracted from all other of His attributes, would be neither just nor unjust. Good is the expression of His will, in so far as that will is itself the expression of eternal, absolute, uncreated justice, which is in God, which His will did not create. But which it executes and promulgates, as our will proclaims and promulgates and executes the idea of the good which is in us. He has given us the law of truth and justice, but He has not arbitrarily instituted that law. Justice is inherent in His will, because it is contained in his intelligence and wisdom, in his very nature and most intimate essence. Chu what is the fifth great truth in masonry? ANS there is an essential distinction between good and evil, what is just and what is unjust, and to this distinction is attached, for every intelligent and free creature, the absolute obligation of conforming to what is good and just. Man is an intelligent and free being, free, because he is conscious that it is his duty, and because it is made his duty, to obey the dictates of truth and justice, and therefore he must necessarily have the power of doing so. Which involves the power of not doing so. Capable of comprehending the distinction between good and evil, justice and injustice, and the obligation which accompanies it, and of naturally adhering to that obligation, independently of any contract or positive law. Capable also of resisting the temptations which urge him toward evil and injustice, and of complying with the sacred law of eternal justice. That man is not governed by a resistless fate or inexorable destiny. But is free to choose between the evil and the good, that justice and right, the good and beautiful, are of the essence of the divinity, like his infinitude. And therefore they are laws to man, that we are conscious of our freedom to act, as we are conscious of our identity and the continuance and connectedness of our existence, and have the same evidence of one as of the other. And if we can put one in doubt, we have no certainty of either, and everything is unreal, that we can deny our free will and free agency, only upon the ground that they are in the nature of things impossible. Which would be to deny the omnipotence of God. Chu what is the sixth great truth of masonry? ANS the necessity of practicing the moral truths, is obligation. The moral truths, necessary in the eye of reason, are obligatory on the will. The moral obligation, like the moral truth that is its foundation, is absolute. As the necessary truths are not more or less necessary, so the obligation is not more or less obligatory. There are degrees of importance among different obligations. But none in the obligation itself. We are not nearly obliged, almost obliged. We are wholly so or not at all. If there be any place of refuge to which we can escape from the obligation, it ceases to exist. If the obligation is absolute, it is immutable and universal. For if that of today may not be that of tomorrow, if what is obligatory on me may not be obligatory on you, 
the obligation would differ from itself and be variable and contingent. This fact is the principle of all morality. That every act contrary to right and justice deserves to be repressed by force and punished when committed, equally in the absence of any law or contract, that man naturally recognizes the distinction between the merit and demerit of actions. As he does that between justice and injustice, honesty and dishonesty. And feels, without being taught, and in the absence of law or contract, that it is wrong for vice to be rewarded or go unpunished, and for virtue to be punished or left unrewarded, and that, the deity being infinitely just and good. It must follow as a necessary and inflexible law that punishment shall be the result of sin, its inevitable and natural effect and corollary, and not a mere arbitrary vengeance. Chu what is the seventh great truth in masonry? ANS The immutable law of God requires, that besides respecting the absolute rights of others, and being merely just, we should do good, be charitable, and obey the dictates of the generous and noble sentiments of the soul. Charity is a law, because our conscience is not satisfied nor at ease if we have not relieved the suffering, the distressed, and the destitute. It is to give that which he to whom you give has no right to take or demand. To be charitable is obligatory on us. We are the almoners of God's bounties. But the obligation is not so precise and inflexible as the obligation to be just. Charity knows neither rule nor limit. It goes beyond all obligation. Its beauty consists in its liberty. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God in him. To be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, to relieve the necessities of the needy, and be generous, liberal, and hospitable, to return to no man evil for evil. To rejoice at the good fortune of others, and sympathize with them in their sorrows and reverses, to live peaceably with all men, and repay injuries with benefits and kindness. These are the sublime dictates of the moral law, taught from the infancy of the world, by masonry. Chu what is the eighth great truth in masonry? ANS that the laws which control and regulate the universe of God, are those of motion and harmony. We see only the isolated incidents of things, and with our feeble and limited capacity in vision cannot discern their connection, nor the mighty chords that make the apparent discord perfect harmony. Evil is merely apparent, and all is in reality good and perfect. For pain and sorrow, persecution and hardships, affliction and destitution, sickness and death are but the means, by which alone the noblest virtues could be developed. Without them, and without sin and error, and wrong and outrage, as there can be no effect without an adequate cause, there could be neither patience under suffering and distress, nor prudence in difficulty, nor temperance to avoid excess. Nor courage to meet danger, nor truth, when to speak the truth is hazardous, nor love, when it is met with ingratitude, nor charity for the needy and destitute, nor forbearance and forgiveness of injuries, nor toleration of erroneous opinions nor charitable judgment and construction of men's motives and actions, nor patriotism, nor heroism, nor honor, nor self-denial, nor generosity. These and most other virtues and excellencies would have no existence, and even their names be unknown. And the poor virtues that still existed, would scarce deserve the name, for life would be one flat, dead, low level, above which none of the lofty elements of human nature would emerge. And man would lie lapped in contented indolence and idleness, a mere worthless negative, instead of the brave, strong soldier against the grim legions of evil and rude difficulty. Chu what is the ninth great truth in masonry? ANS the great leading doctrine of this degree, that the justice, the wisdom, and the mercy of God are alike infinite, alike perfect, and yet do not in the least jar nor conflict one with the other but form a great perfect trinity of attributes, three in yet one, that, the principle of merit and demerit being absolute, and every good action deserving to be rewarded, and every bad one to be punished, and God being as just as he is good. And yet the cases constantly recurring in this world, in which crime and cruelty, oppression, tyranny, 
and injustice are prosperous, happy, fortunate, and self-contented, and rule and reign, and enjoy all the blessings of God's beneficence. While the virtuous and good are unfortunate, miserable, destitute, pining away in dungeons, perishing with cold, and famishing with hunger, slaves of oppression, and instruments and victims of the miscreants that govern. So that this world, if there were no existence beyond it, would be one great theater of wrong and injustice, proving God wholly disregardful of his own necessary law of merit and demerit. It follows that there must be another life in which these apparent wrongs shall be repaired, that all the powers of man's soul tend to infinity. And his indomitable instinct of immortality, and the universal hope of another life, testified by all creeds, all poetry, all traditions, establish its certainty, for man is not an orphan. But hath a father near at hand, and the day must come when light and truth, and the just and good shall be victorious, and darkness, error, wrong, and evil be annihilated, and known no more forever, that the universe is one great harmony, in which, according to the faith of all nations, deep-rooted in all hearts in the primitive ages, light will ultimately prevail over darkness, and the good principle over the evil, and the myriad souls that have emanated from the divinity. Purified and ennobled by the struggle here below, will again return to perfect bliss in the bosom of God to offend against whose laws will then be no longer possible. Chu what, then, is the one great lesson taught to us, as Masons, in this degree? ANS that to that state and realm of light and truth and perfection, which is absolutely certain, all the good men on earth are tending. And if there is a law from whose operation none are exempt, which inevitably conveys their bodies to darkness and to dust, there is another not less certain nor less powerful. Which conducts their spirits to that state of happiness and splendor and perfection, the bosom of their Father and their God. The wheels of nature are not made to roll backward. Everything presses on to eternity. From the birth of time an impetuous current has set in, which bears all the sons of men toward that interminable ocean. Meanwhile, heaven is attracting to itself whatever is congenial to its nature, is enriching itself by the spoils of the earth, and collecting within its capacious bosom whatever is pure, permanent, and divine. Leaving nothing for the last fire to consume but the gross matter that creates concupiscence. While everything fit for that good fortune shall be gathered and selected from the ruins of the world, to adorn that eternal city. Let every mason then obey the voice that calls him thither. Let us seek the things that are above, and be not content with a world that must shortly perish, and which we must speedily quit, while we neglect to prepare for that in which we are invited to dwell forever. While everything within us and around us reminds us of the approach of death, and concurs to teach us that this is not our rest, let us hasten our preparations for another world, and earnestly implore that help and strength from our Father which alone can put an end to that fatal war which our desires have too long waged with our destiny. When these move in the same direction, and that which God's will renders unavoidable shall become our choice, all things will be ours, life will be divested of its vanity, and death disarmed of its terrors. Chew what are the symbols of the purification necessary to make us perfect masons? A.N.S. Lavation with pure water, or baptism, because to cleanse the body is emblematical of purifying the soul. And because it conduces to the bodily health, and virtue is the health of the soul, as sin and vice are its malady in sickness, unction, or anointing with oil. Because thereby we are set apart and dedicated to the service and priesthood of the beautiful, the true, and the good, and robes of white, emblems of candor, purity, and truth. Chew what is to us the chief symbol of man's ultimate redemption and regeneration. A.N.S. the fraternal supper, of bread which nourishes, and of wine which refreshes and exhilarates, symbolical of the time which is to come, when all mankind shall be one great harmonious brotherhood. And teaching us these great lessons, that as matter changes ever, but no single atom is annihilated. It is not rational to suppose that the far nobler soul does not continue to exist beyond the grave, that many thousands who have died before us might claim to be joint owners with ourselves of the particles that compose our mortal bodies. For matter ever forms, new combinations. And the bodies of the ancient dead, the patriarchs before and since the flood, the kings and common people of all ages, 
resolved into their constituent elements, are carried upon the wind over all continents. And continually enter into and form part of the habitations of new souls, creating new bonds of sympathy and brotherhood between each man that lives and all his race. And thus, in the bread we eat, and in the wine we drink tonight may enter into and form part of us the identical particles of matter that once formed parts of the material bodies called Moses, Confucius, Plato, Socrates, or Jesus of Nazareth. In the truest sense, we eat and drink the bodies of the dead, and cannot say that there is a single atom of our blood or body, the ownership of which some other soul might not dispute with us. It teaches us also the infinite beneficence of God who sends us seed time and harvest, each in its season, and makes his showers to fall and his sun to shine alike upon the evil and the good, bestowing upon us unsolicited his innumerable blessings. And asking no return. For there are no angels stationed upon the watchtowers of creation to call the world to prayer and sacrifice. But he bestows his benefits in silence, like a kind friend who comes at night, and, leaving his gifts at the door, to be found by us in the morning, goes quietly away and asks no thanks, nor ceases his kind offices for our ingratitude. And thus the bread and wine teach us that our mortal body is no more we than the house in which we live, or the garments that we wear. But the soul is I, the one, identical, unchangeable, immortal emanation from the Deity, to return to God and be forever happy, in His good time. As our mortal bodies, dissolving, return to the elements from which they came, their particles coming and going ever in perpetual genesis. To our Jewish brethren, this supper is symbolical of the Passover, to the Christian Mason, of that eaten by Christ and his disciples when, celebrating the Passover, he broke bread and gave it to them, saying, Take. Eat. This is my body. And giving them the cup, he said, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, thus symbolizing the perfect harmony and union between himself and the faithful. And his death upon the cross for the salvation of man. The history of Masonry is the history of philosophy. Masons do not pretend to set themselves up for instructors of the human race, but, though Asia produced and preserved the mysteries, Masonry has, in Europe and America, given regularity to their doctrines, spirit, and action and developed the moral advantages which mankind may reap from them. More consistent, and more simple in its mode of procedure, it has put an end to the vast allegorical pantheon of ancient mythologies, and itself become a science. None can deny that Christ taught a lofty morality. Love one another, forgive those that despitefully use you and persecute you, be pure of heart, meek, humble, contented, lay not up riches on earth, but in heaven submit to the powers lawfully over you, become like these little children. Or ye cannot be saved, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, forgive the repentant. And cast no stone at the sinner, if you too have sinned, do unto others as ye would have others do unto you, such, and not abstruse questions of theology, were his simple and sublime teachings. The early Christians followed in his footsteps. The first preachers of the faith had no thought of domination. Entirely animated by his saying, that he among them should be first, who should serve with the greatest devotion, they were humble, modest, and charitable. And they knew how to communicate this spirit of the inner man to the churches under their direction. These churches were at first but spontaneous meetings of all Christians inhabiting the same locality. A pure and severe morality, mingled with religious enthusiasm, was the characteristic of each, and excited the admiration even of their persecutors. Everything was in common among them, their property, their joys, and their sorrows. In the silence of night they met for instruction and to pray together. Their love feasts, or fraternal repasts, ended these reunions, in which all differences in social position and rank were effaced in the presence of a paternal divinity. Their sole object was to make men better, by bringing them back to a simple worship, of which universal morality was the basis, and to end those numerous and cruel sacrifices which everywhere inundated with blood the altars of the gods. Thus did Christianity reform the world, and obey the teachings of its founder. It gave to woman her proper rank and influence, it regulated domestic life. And by admitting the slaves to the love feasts, 
it by degrees raised them above that oppression under which half of mankind had grown for ages. This, in its purity, as taught by Christ himself, was the true primitive religion, as communicated by God to the patriarchs. It was no new religion, but the reproduction of the oldest of all. And its true and perfect morality is the morality of masonry, as is the morality of every creed of antiquity. In the early days of Christianity, there was an initiation like those of the pagans. Persons were admitted on special conditions only. To arrive at a complete knowledge of the doctrine, they had to pass three degrees of instruction. The initiates were consequently divided into three classes, the first, auditors, the second, catechumens, and the third, the faithful. The auditors were a sort of novices, who were prepared by certain ceremonies and certain instruction to receive the dogmas of Christianity. A portion of these dogmas was made known to the catechumens, who, after particular purifications, received baptism, or the initiation of the theogenesis, divine generation. But in the grand mysteries of that religion, the incarnation, nativity, passion, and resurrection of Christ, none were initiated but the faithful. These doctrines, and the celebration of the holy sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, were kept with profound secrecy. These mysteries were divided into two parts, the first styled the Mass of the Catechumens. The second, the Mass of the Faithful. The celebration of the mysteries of Mithras was also styled a Mass, and the ceremonies used were the same. There were found all the sacraments of the Catholic Church, even the breath of confirmation. The priest of Mithras promised the initiates deliverance from sin, by means of confession and baptism, and a future life of happiness or misery. He celebrated the oblation of bread, image of the resurrection. The baptism of newly born children, extreme unction, confession of sins, all belonged to the Mithriac rites. The candidate was purified by a species of baptism, a mark was impressed upon his forehead, he offered bread and water, pronouncing certain mysterious words. During the persecutions in the early ages of Christianity, the Christians took refuge in the vast catacombs which stretched for miles in every direction under the city of Rome, and are supposed to have been of Etruscan origin. There, amid labyrinthine windings, deep caverns, hidden chambers, chapels, and tombs, the persecuted fugitives found refuge, and there they performed the ceremonies of the mysteries. The Basilidians, a sect of Christians that arose soon after the time of the Apostles, practiced the mysteries, with the old Egyptian legend. They symbolized Osiris by the sun, Isis by the moon, and Typhon by Scorpio. And wore crystals bearing these emblems, as amulets or talismans to protect them from danger, upon which were also a brilliant star and the serpent. They were copied from the talismans of Persia and Arabia, and given to every candidate at his initiation. Irenaeus tells us that the Simonians, one of the earliest sects of the Gnostics, had a priesthood of the mysteries. Tertullian tells us that the Valentinians, the most celebrated of all the Gnostic schools, imitated, or rather perverted, the mysteries of Eleusis. Irenaeus informs us, in several curious chapters, of the mysteries practiced by the Marcosians. And Origen gives much information as to the mysteries of the Ophites, and there is no doubt that all the Gnostic sects had mysteries and an initiation. They all claimed to possess a secret doctrine, coming to them directly from Jesus Christ, different from that of the Gospels and Epistles, and superior to those communications, which in their eyes, were merely exoteric. This secret doctrine they did not communicate to every one, and among the extensive sect of the Basilidians hardly one in a thousand knew it, as we learn from Irenaeus. We know the name of only the highest class of their initiates. They were styled elect or elus, Greek, kapilamda epsilon kapitaomicron, and strangers to the world, Greek, zinuomicron iota nu kappa sigma mu. They had at least three degrees, the material, the intellectual, and the spiritual, and the lesser and greater mysteries. And the number of those who attained the highest degree was quite small. Baptism was one of their most important ceremonies, and the Basilidians celebrated the 10th of January, as the anniversary of the day on which Christ was baptized in Jordan. They had the ceremony of laying on of hands, by way of purification, and that of the mystic banquet, emblem of that to which they believed the 
heavenly wisdom would one day admit them, in the fullness of things. Greek, Pilamdaro Omegamu Alpha. Their ceremonies were much more like those of the Christians than those of Greece. But they mingled with them much that was borrowed from the Orient and Egypt, and taught the primitive truths, mixed with a multitude of fantastic errors and fictions. The discipline of the secret was the concealment, occultatio, of certain tenets and ceremonies. So says Clemens of Alexandria. To avoid persecution, the early Christians were compelled to use great precaution, and to hold meetings of the faithful, of the household of faith, in private places, under concealment by darkness. They assembled in the night, and they guarded against the intrusion of false brethren and profane persons, spies who might cause their arrest. They conversed together figuratively, and by the use of symbols, lest cowans and eavesdroppers might overhear, and there existed among them a favored class, or order who were initiated into certain mysteries which they were bound by solemn promise not to disclose, or even converse about, except with such as had received them under the same sanction. They were called brethren, the faithful, stewards of the mysteries, superintendents, devotees of the secret, and architects. In the hierarchio, attributed to St. Dionysius the Areopagite, the first bishop of Athens, the tradition of the sacrament is said to have been divided into three degrees, or grades, purification, initiation, and accomplishment or perfection. And it mentions also, as part of the ceremony, the bringing to sight. The apostolic constitutions, attributed to Clemens, bishop of Rome, describe the early church, and say, these regulations must on no account be communicated to all sorts of persons, because of the mysteries contained in them. They speak of the deacon's duty to keep the doors, that none uninitiated should enter at the oblation. Ostiarii, or doorkeepers, kept guard, and gave notice of the time of prayer and church assemblies. And also by private signal, in times of persecution, gave notice to those within, to enable them to avoid danger. The mysteries were open to the fideles or faithful only, and no spectators were allowed at the communion. Tertullian, who died about AD 216, says in his Apology, None are admitted to the religious mysteries without an oath of secrecy. We appeal to your Thracian and Eleusinian mysteries. And we are especially bound to this caution, because if we prove faithless, we should not only provoke heaven, but draw upon our heads the utmost rigor of human displeasure. And should strangers betray us? They know nothing but by report and hearsay. Far hence, ye profane! Is the prohibition from all holy mysteries. Clemens, Bishop of Alexandria, born about A.D. 191, says, in his Stramata, that he cannot explain the mysteries, because he should thereby, according to the old proverb, put a sword into the hands of a child. He frequently compares the discipline of the secret with the heathen mysteries, as to their internal and recondite wisdom. Whenever the early Christians happened to be in company with strangers, more properly termed the profane, they never spoke of their sacraments, but indicated to one another what they meant by means of symbols and secret watchwords, disguisedly. And as by direct communication of mind with mind, and by enigmas. Origen, born A.D. 134 or 135, answering Celsus, who had objected that the Christians had a concealed doctrine said, inasmuch as the essential and important doctrines and principles of Christianity are openly taught. It is foolish to object that there are other things that are recondite. For this is common to Christian discipline with that of those philosophers in whose teaching some things were exoteric and some esoteric, and it is enough to say that it was so with some of the disciples of Pythagoras. The formula which the primitive church pronounced at the moment of celebrating its mysteries, was this, Depart, ye profane. Let the catechumens, and those who have not been admitted or initiated, go forth. Archelaus, bishop of Cascara in Mesopotamia, who, in the year 278, conducted a controversy with the Manichaeans, said, These mysteries the church now communicates to him who has passed through the introductory degree. They are not explained to the Gentiles at all. Nor are they taught openly in the hearing of catechumens, but much that is spoken is in disguised terms, that the faithful, Greek, pi iota sigma tau omicron, who possess the knowledge, may be still more informed, and those who are not acquainted with it. 
may suffer no disadvantage. Cyril, Bishop of Jerusalem, was born in the year 315, and died in 386, in his catechesis he says, the Lord spake in parables to his hearers in general. But to his disciples he explained in private the parables and allegories which he spoke in public. The splendor of glory is for those who are early enlightened, obscurity and darkness are the portion of the unbelievers and ignorant. Just so the Church discovers its mysteries to those who have advanced beyond the class of catechumens, we employ obscure terms with others. St. Basil, the great bishop of Caesarea, born in the year 326, and dying in the year 376, says, We receive the dogmas transmitted to us by writing, and those which have descended to us from the apostles. Beneath the mystery of oral tradition, for several things have been handed to us without writing, lest the vulgar, too familiar with our dogmas, should lose a due respect for them. This is what the uninitiated are not permitted to contemplate, and how should it ever be proper to write and circulate among the people an account of them? St. Gregory Nazianzen, Bishop of Constantinople, A.D. 379, says, You have heard as much of the mystery as we are allowed to speak openly in the ears of all, the rest will be communicated to you in private, and that you must retain within yourself. Our mysteries are not to be made known to strangers. St. Ambrose, Archbishop of Milan, who was born in 340, and died in 393, says in his work De Mysteries, all the mysteries should be kept concealed, guarded by faithful silence, lest it should be inconsiderately divulged to the ears of the profane. It is not given to all to contemplate the depths of our mysteries. That they may not be seen by those who ought not to behold them, nor received by those who cannot preserve them. And in another work, he sins against God, who divulges to the unworthy the mysteries confided to him. The danger is not merely in violating truth, but in telling truth, if he allow himself to give hints of them to those from whom they ought to be concealed, beware of casting pearls before swine. Every mystery ought to be kept secret. As it were, to be covered over by silence, lest it should rashly be divulged to the ears of the profane. Take heed that you do not incautiously reveal the mysteries. St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, who was born in 347, and died in 430, says in one of his discourses, having dismissed the catechumens, we have retained you only to be our hearers. Because besides those things which belong to all Christians in common, we are now to discourse to you of sublime mysteries, which none are qualified to hear, but those who, by the Master's favor, are made partakers of them. To have taught them openly, would have been to betray them. And he refers to the Ark of the Covenant and says that it signified a mystery, or secret of God, shadowed over by the cherubim of glory, and honored by being veiled. St. Chrysostom and St. Augustine speak of initiation more than fifty times. St. Ambrose writes to those who are initiated, and initiation was not merely baptism, or admission into the church, but it referred to initiation into the mysteries. To the baptized and initiated the mysteries of religion were unveiled, they were kept secret from the catechumens. Who were permitted to hear the scriptures read and the ordinary discourses delivered, in which the mysteries, reserved for the faithful, were never treated of. When the services and prayers were ended, the catechumens and spectators all withdrew. Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, was born in 354, and died in 417. He says, I wish to speak openly, but I dare not, on account of those who are not initiated. I shall therefore avail myself of disguised terms, discoursing in a shadowy manner. Where the holy mysteries are celebrated, we drive away all uninitiated persons, and then close the doors, he mentions the acclamations of the initiated. Which, he says, I hear pass over in silence, for it is forbidden to disclose such things to the profane. Palladius, in his Life of Chrysostom, records, as a great outrage, that, a tumult having been excited against him by his enemies, they forced their way into the penetralia, where the uninitiated beheld what was not proper for them to see. And Chrysostom mentions the same circumstance in his epistle to Pope Innocent. St. Cyril of Alexandria, who was made bishop in 412, and died in 444, says in his seventh book against Julian, 
these mysteries are so profound and so exalted, that they can be comprehended by those only who are enlightened. I shall not, therefore, attempt to speak of what is so admirable in them, lest by discovering them to the uninitiated, I should offend against the injunction not to give what is holy to the impure. Nor cast pearls before such as cannot estimate their worth. I should say much more, if I were not afraid of being heard by those who are uninitiated, because men are apt to deride what they do not understand. And the ignorant, not being aware of the weakness of their minds, condemn what they ought most to venerate. Theodoret, Bishop of Syropolis in Syria, was born in 393, and made bishop in 420. In one of his three dialogues, called the Immutable, he introduces Orthodoxus, speaking thus, Answer me, if you please, in mystical or obscure terms, for perhaps there are some persons present who are not initiated into the mysteries. And in his preface to Ezekiel, tracing up the secret discipline to the commencement of the Christian era, he says, These mysteries are so august, that we ought to keep them with the greatest caution. Minutius Felix, an eminent lawyer of Rome, who lived in 212, and wrote a defense of Christianity, says, Many of them, the Christians, know each other by tokens and signs, not as et in signibus, and they form a friendship for each other. Almost before they become acquainted. The Latin word, tessera, originally meant a square piece of wood or stone, used in making tessellated pavements, afterward a tablet on which anything was written, and then a cube or die. Its most general use was to designate a piece of metal or wood, square in shape, on which the watchword of an army was inscribed, whence tessera came to mean the watchword itself. There was also a tessera hospitalis, which was a piece of wood cut into two parts, as a pledge of friendship. Each party kept one of the parts, and they swore mutual fidelity by Jupiter. To break the tessera was considered a dissolution of the friendship. The early Christians used it as a mark, the watchword of friendship. With them it was generally in the shape of a fish, and made of bone. On its face was inscribed the word, Greek, chi theta, a fish, the initials of which represented the Greek words, Greek, iota eta sigma omicron chi rho iota sigma tau epsilon omicron upsilon sigma omega tau rho, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. St. Augustine, de fide de symbolis, says, This is the faith which in a few words is given to the novices to be kept by a symbol, these few words are known to all the faithful, that by believing they may be submissive to God. By being thus submissive, they may live rightly, by living rightly, they may purify their hearts and with a pure heart may understand what they believe. Maximus Torinus says, the tessera is a symbol and sign by which to distinguish between the faithful and the profane. There are three degrees in blue masonry. And in addition to the two words of two syllables each, embodying the binary, three of three syllables each. There were three grand masters, the two kings, and Kiro M. the artificer. The candidate gains admission by three raps, and three raps call up the brethren. There are three principal officers of the lodge, three lights at the altar, three gates of the temple, all in the east, west, and south. The three lights represent the sun, the moon, and Mercury, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the father, the mother, and the child, wisdom, strength, and beauty, Hakama, Bina, and Dath, Gedula, Gabura, and Tepereth. The candidate makes three circuits of the lodge, there were three assassins of Kiroem, and he was slain by three blows while seeking to escape by the three gates of the temple. The ejaculation at his grave was repeated three times. There are three divisions of the temple, and three, five, and seven steps. A master works with chalk, charcoal, and a vessel of clay, there are three movable and three immovable jewels. The triangle appears among the symbols, the two parallel lines enclosing the circle are connected at top, as are the columns Jachin and Boaz, symbolizing the equilibrium which explains the great mysteries of nature. This continual reproduction of the number three is not accidental, nor without a profound meaning, and we shall find the same repeated in all the ancient philosophies. The Egyptian gods formed triads, the third member in each proceeding from the other two. Thus we have the triad of Thebes, Ammonius, Mount, and Carso, that of Philae, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. 
that of Elephantini in the cataracts, Neph, Sate, and Anuk. Osiris, Isis, and Horus were the father, mother, and son, the latter being light, the soul of the world, the son, the protogonos or first begotten. Sometimes this triad was regarded as spirit, or the active principle or generative power, matter, or the passive principle or productive capacity, and the universe, which proceeds from the two principles. We also find in Egypt this triad or trinity, Amenare, the creator, Osiris Are, the giver of fruitfulness, Horus Are, the queller of light, symbolized by the summer, autumn, and spring sun. For the Egyptians had but three seasons, the three gates of the temple, and on account of the different effects of the sun on those three seasons, the deity appears in these three forms. The Phoenician trinity was Yolomos, Chusoros, and the egg out of which the universe proceeded. The Chaldean triad consisted of Bel, the Persian Zervana Akarana, Oromastes, and Araman. The good and evil principle alike outflowing from the father, by their equilibrium and alternating preponderance to produce harmony. Each was to rule, in turn, for equal periods, until finally the evil principle should itself become good. The Chaldean and Persian oracles of Zoroaster give us the triad, fire, light, and ether. Orpheus celebrates the triad of fans, arenas, and chronos. Kori says the Orphic trinity consisted of Metis, fans, and Erechipeus will, light or love, and life. Acusilus makes it consist of Metis, Eros, and Aether, will, love, and Aether. Fairy sides of Cyros, of fire, water, and air or spirit. In the two former we readily recognize Osiris and Isis, the sun and the Nile. The first three of the Persian Amshus bands were Bauman, the lord of light, Artabiast, the lord of fire, and Sharivar the Lord of Splendor. These at once lead us back to the Kabbalah. Plutarch says, the better and diviner nature consists of three. The intelligible, i.e. that which exists within the intellect only as yet, and matter. Greek, tau omicron nu omicron eta tau omicron, and, Greek, lambda eta, and that which proceeds from these, which the Greeks call cosmos, of which Plato calls the intelligible, the idea, the exemplar, the father, matter, the mother, the nurse. And the receptacle and place of generation, and the issue of these two, the offspring in Genesis. The Pythagorean fragments say, therefore, before the heaven was made, there existed idea and matter, and God the demiurgos, workman or active instrument, of the former. He made the world out of matter, perfect, only begotten, with a soul and intellect, and constituted it a divinity. Plato gives us thought, the father, primitive matter, the mother, and cosmos, the son, the issue of the two principles. Cosmos is the ensouled universe. With the later Platonists, the triad was potence, intellect, and spirit. Philo represents Sankaniathans as fire, light, and flame, the three sons of Genos, but this is the Alexandrian, not the Phoenician idea. Aurelius says the demiurgos or creator is triple, and the three intellects are the three kings, he who exists, he who possesses, he who beholds. The first is that which exists by its essence. The second exists in the first, and contains or possesses in itself the universal of things, all that afterward becomes, the third beholds this universal, formed and fashioned intellectually, and so having a separate existence. The third exists in the second, and the second in the first. The most ancient Trinitarian doctrine on record is that of the Brahmins. The eternal supreme essence, called Parabrahma, Brahm, Paratma, produced the universe by self-reflection, and first revealed himself as Brahma, the creating power, then as Vishnu, the preserving power, and lastly as Shiva, the destroying and renovating power. The three modes in which the supreme essence reveals himself in the material universe, but which soon came to be regarded as three distinct deities. These three deities they styled the Trimurti, or Triad. The Persians received from the Indians the doctrine of the three principles, and changed it to that of a principle of life, which was individualized by the sun, and a principle of death, which was symbolized by cold and darkness. 
parallel of the moral world, and in which the continual and alternating struggle between light and darkness, life and death, seemed but a phase of the great struggle between the good and evil principles, embodied in the legend of Ormazd and Ahriman. Mithras, a Median reformer, was deified after his death, and invested with the attributes of the sun, the different astronomical phenomena being figuratively detailed as actual incidents of his life. In the same manner as the history of Buddha was invented among the Hindus. The trinity of the Hindus became among the Ethiopians and Abyssinians Enipiachaman, Pihta, and Enipich, the God-Creator, whose emblem was a ram, matter, or the primitive mud, symbolized by a globe or an egg, and thought. Or the light which contains the germ of everything. Triple manifestation of one and the same God, Atham, considered in three aspects, as the creative power, goodness, and wisdom. Other deities were speedily invented. And among them Osiris, represented by the sun, Isis, his wife, by the moon or earth, Typhon, his brother, the principle of evil and darkness, who was the son of Osiris and Isis. And the trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus became subsequently the chief gods and objects of worship of the Egyptians. The ancient Etruscans, a race that emigrated from the Rhetian Alps into Italy, along whose root evidences of their migration have been discovered, and whose language none have yet succeeded in reading, acknowledged only one supreme god. But they had images for his different attributes, and temples to these images. Each town had one national temple, dedicated to the three great attributes of God, strength, riches, and wisdom, were Tina, Tauna, and Minerva. The national deity was always a triad under one roof, and it was the same in Egypt, where one supreme God alone was acknowledged, but was worshipped as a triad, with different names in each different home. Each city in Etruria might have as many gods and gates and temples as it pleased, but three sacred gates, and one temple to three divine attributes were obligatory, wherever the laws of Tages, or Taunt or Thoth, were received. The only gate that remains in Italy, of the olden time, undestroyed, is the Porta del Circo at Volterra. And it has upon it the three heads of the three national divinities, one upon the keystone of its magnificent arch, and one above each side pillar. The Buddhists hold that the god Sakya of the Hindus, called in Ceylon, Gautama, in India beyond the Ganges, Somanakadam, and in China, Chykya, or Fo, constituted a trinity, Triratna, of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, intelligence, law, and union or harmony. The Chinese Sabaeans represented the supreme deity as composed of Chang Tiai, the supreme sovereign, Tian, the heavens, and Tao, the universal supreme reason and principle of faith. And that from chaos, an immense silence, an immeasurable void without perceptible forms, alone, infinite, immutable, moving in a circle in illimitable space, without change or alteration, when vivified by the principle of truth, issued all beings. Under the influence of Tao, principle of faith, who produced one, one produced two, two produced three, and three produced all that is. The Sklavonovens typified the trinity by the three heads of the god. Triclav. And the Pruxy or Prussians by the Trion god per town. Picalos, and Patrimpos, the deities of light and thunder, of. Hell and the earth, its fruits and animals, and the Scandinavians by. Odin, Fra, and Thor. In the Kabbalah, or the Hebrew traditional philosophy, the infinite deity, beyond the reach of the human intellect, and without name, form, or limitation, was represented as developing himself, in order to create, and by self-limitation. In ten emanations or outflowings, called Sephiroth, or rays. The first of these, in the world Azaloth, that is, within the deity, was Kether, or the crown, by which we understand the divine will or potency. Next came, as a pair, Hakama and Bina, ordinarily translated wisdom and intelligence, the former termed the father, and the latter the mother. Hakama is the active power or energy of deity, by which he produces within himself intellect ion or thinking, and Bina, the passive capacity, from which, acted on by the power, the intellect ion flows. This intellect ion is called Daath, 
and it is the word of Plato and the Gnostics, the unuttered word within the deity. Here is the origin of the Trinity of the Father, the Mother or Holy Spirit, and the Son or Word. Another trinity was composed of the fourth Sapphira, Gedula or Kost, Benignity or Mercy, also termed Father, Aba, the fifth, Gabura, Severity or Strict Justice, also termed the Mother, Ima. And the sixth, the Son or Issue of these, Tifereth, Beauty or Harmony. Everything, says the Sohar, proceeds according to the mystery of the balance, that is, by the equilibrium of opposites, and thus from the infinite mercy and the infinite justice, in equilibrium, flows the perfect harmony of the universe. Infinite power, which is lawless, and infinite wisdom, in equilibrium, also produce beauty or harmony, as sun, issue, or result, the word, or utterance of the thought of God. Power and justice or severity are the same, wisdom and mercy or benignity are the same, in the infinite divine nature. According to Philo of Alexandria, the Supreme Being, primitive light or archetype of light, uniting with wisdom, Sigma Omicron Psi Iota Alpha, the mother of creation, forms in himself the types of all things, and acts upon the universe through the word, Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron. Logos. Who dwells in God, and in whom all his powers and attributes develop themselves. A doctrine borrowed by him from Plato. Simon Magus and his disciples taught that the supreme being or center of light produced first of all, three couples of united existences, of both sexes, Greek, Sigma Upsilon Zeta Upsilon Gamma Alpha, Suzugias, which were the origins of all things, reason and inventiveness. Speech and thought, calculation and reflection, Greek, New Omicron, and, Greek, Epsilon Pi Nu Omicron Iota A, Phi Omega Nu, and, Greek, Epsilon Nu Nu Omicron Iota Alpha, Lambda Omicron Gamma Iota Sigma Mu, and, Greek, Epsilon Nu Theta Mu Eta Sigma Iota. Nus and Epinoia, Phone and Enoia, Logismos and Enthomasis. Of which Enoia or Wisdom was the first produced, and mother of all that exists. Other disciples of Simon, and with them most of the Gnostics, adopting and modifying the doctrine, taught that the, Greek, Pi Lambda Rho Omega Mu Alpha. Pleroma, or plenitude of superior intelligences, having the supreme being at their head, was composed of eight eons, Greek, Alpha Nu Eta. Ions, of different sexes. Profundity and silence, spirit and truth, the word and life. Man and the church, Greek, Beta Upsilon Theta, and, Greek, Sigma Iota Gamma, Pi Nu Epsilon Nu Alpha, and, Greek, Alpha Lambda Theta Epsilon Iota Alpha, Lambda Gamma Omicron, and, Greek, Zeta Omega, Alpha Nu Theta Rho Omega Pi Omicron, and, Greek, Kappa Kappa Lambda Eta Sigma Alpha. But Hose and Sigi, Numa and Eletheia, Logos and Zoe, Anthropos and Ecclesia. Bardasanes, whose doctrines the Syrian Christians long embraced, taught that the unknown father, happy in the plenitude of his life and perfections, first produced a companion for himself, Greek, Sigma Zeta Upsilon Gamma Omicron. Suzugos. Whom he placed in the celestial paradise and who became, by him, the mother of Christos, son of the living God, I. E. Laying aside the allegory, that the Eternal conceived, in the silence of his decrees, the thought of revealing himself by a being who should be his image or his son, that to the son succeeded his sister and spouse, the Holy Spirit. And they produced four spirits of the elements, male and female, Mayo and Japsaho, Nuro and Rucho. Then seven mystic couples of spirits, and heaven and earth, and all that is. Then seven spirits governing the planets, twelve governing the constellations of the zodiac, and thirty-six starry intelligences whom he called deacons, while the Holy Spirit, Sophia Akamoth. Being both the holy intelligence and the soul of the physical world, went from the Pleroma into that material world and there mourned her degradation, until Christos, her former spouse, coming to her with his divine light and love, guided her in the way to purification, and she again united herself with him as his primitive companion. Basilides, the Christian Gnostic, taught that there were seven emanations from the Supreme Being, the firstborn, thought, the word, reflection, wisdom, power, and righteousness. Greek, Pyro Omega Tau Omicron Gamma Omicron Nu Omicron, 
Nu Omicron Upsilon, Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron, Phyro Omicron Nu Tau Sigma Iota, Sigma Omicron Psi Alpha, Delta Upsilon Nu Alpha Mu Iota, and, Greek, Delta Iota Kappa Alpha Iota Omicron Sigma Nu Eta, Protagonos, Nus, Logos, Phronesis, Sophia, Dunamis, and Dicarasum. From whom emanated other intelligences in succession, to the number, in all, of 365, which were God manifested, and composed the plenitude of the divine emanations, or the god Abraxas. Of which the thought, or intellect, Greek, nu. Nus, united itself, by baptism in the river Jordan, with the man Jesus, servant, Greek, delta iota kappa omicron nu omicron. Diakonos, of the human race, but did not suffer with him. And the disciples of Basilides taught that the, Greek, nu omicron, put on the appearance only of humanity, and that Simon of Cyrene was crucified in his stead and ascended into heaven. Basilides held that out of the unrevealed God, who is at the head of the world of emanations, and exalted above all conception or designation, Greek, Alpha Tau Omicron Nu Mu Alpha Sigma Tau Omicron, Rho Rho Eta Tau Omicron, were evolved seven living, self-subsistent, ever-active hypocitized powers. First, the intellectual powers. First, Nus, Greek, Nu Omicron, the mind. 2D, Logos, Greek, Lambda Gamma Omicron, the reason. 3D, Phronesis, Greek, Phyro Nu Eta Sigma Iota, the thinking power. Fourth, Sophia, Greek, Sigma Omicron Phi Alpha, wisdom. Second, the active or operative power. Fifth, Dunamis, Greek, Delta Upsilon Nu Alpha Mu Iota, might, accomplishing the purposes of wisdom. Third, the moral attributes. Sixth, Dikaeusun, Greek, Delta Iota Kappa Alpha Iota Omicron Sigma Nu Eta, holiness or moral perfection. Seventh, Irene, Greek, Epsilon Rho Nu Eta, inward tranquility. These seven powers, Greek, Delta Upsilon Nu Mu Epsilon Iota. Dunamis, with the primal ground out of which they were evolved, constituted in his scheme the, Greek, Pyro Omega Tau Eta Gamma Delta Omicron, Prot Ogdoas, or First Octave, the root of all existence. From this point, the spiritual life proceeded to evolve out of itself continually many gradations of existence, each lower one being still the impression, the antitype, of the immediate higher one. He supposed there were 365 of these regions or gradations, expressed by the mystical word, Greek, Alpha Beta Rho Alpha Xi Alpha, Abraxas. The th Greek, Alpha Beta Rho Alpha Xi Alpha, is thus interpreted, by the usual method of reckoning Greek letters numerically. Greek, Alpha, 1, Beta, 2, Rho, 100. A, L, Psi, 60, Greek, Alpha, L, Final Sigma, 200 equals 365, which is the whole emanation world, as the development of the Supreme Being. In the system of Basilides, light, life, soul, and good were opposed to darkness, death, matter, and evil, throughout the whole course of the universe. According to the Gnostic view, God was represented as the imminent, incomprehensible and original source of all perfection, the unfathomable abyss, Greek, Beta Upsilon Theta Omicron. But Hose, according to Valentinus, exalted above all possibility of designation. Of whom, properly speaking, nothing can be predicated, the, Greek, Kappa Alpha Tau Omicron Nu Mu Alpha Sigma Tau, of Basilides, the, Greek, Nu, of Philo. From this incomprehensible essence of God, an immediate transition to finite things is inconceivable. Self-limitation is the first beginning of a communication of life on the part of God, the first passing of the hidden deity into manifestation, and from this proceeds all further self-developing manifestation of the divine essence. From this primal link in the chain of life there are evolved, in the first place, the manifold powers or attributes inherent in the divine essence, which, until that first self-comprehension, were all hidden in the abyss of his essence. Each of these attributes presents the whole divine essence under one particular aspect, and to each, therefore, in this respect, the title of God may appropriately be applied. These divine powers evolving themselves to self-subsistence, become thereupon the germs and principles of all further developments of life. 
The life contained in them unfolds and individualizes itself more and more, but in such a way that the successive grades of this evolution of life continually sink lower and lower. The spirits become feebler, the further they are removed from the first link in the series. The first manifestation they termed, Greek, Pyro tau eta kappa alpha tau lambda eta psi iota alpha upsilon tau omicron prot. Catalepsis hutu, or, Greek, Pyro tau omicron nu kappa alpha tau alpha lambda eta pi tau nu tau omicron theta epsilon omicron upsilon, proton. Catalepton tu theu. Which was hypostatically represented in a Greek, nu, or, Greek, lambda gamma omicron, nus or logos. In the Alexandrian Gnosis, the Platonic notion of the Greek, Lambda Eta, Hul, predominates. This is the dead, the unsubstantial, the boundary that limits from without the evolution of life in its gradually advancing progression, whereby the perfect is ever evolving itself into the less perfect. This, Greek, Lambda Eta, again, is represented under various images, at one time as the darkness that exists alongside of the light, at another, as the void, Greek, Kappa Nu Omega Mu Alpha, Kappa Epsilon Nu Nu. Kenoma, Kenon, in opposition to the fullness, Greek, Pi Lambda Rho Omega Mu Alpha, Pleroma, of the divine life, or as the shadow that accompanies the light, or as the chaos, or the sluggish, stagnant, dark water. This matter, dead in itself, possesses by its own nature no inherent tendency, as life of every sort is foreign to it, itself makes no encroachment on the divine. As, however, the evolutions of the divine life, the essences developing themselves out of the progressive emanation, become feebler, the further they are removed from the first link in the series. And as their connection with the first becomes looser at each successive step, there arises at the last step of the evolution, an imperfect, defective product, which, unable to retain its connection with the chain of divine life, sinks from the world of eons into the material chaos, or, according to the same notion, somewhat differently expressed, according to the Ophites and to Bardasanes, a drop from the fullness of the divine life bubbles over into the bordering void. Hereupon the dead matter, by commixture with the living principle, which it wanted, first of all receives animation. But, at the same time, also, the divine, the living, becomes corrupted by mingling with the chaotic mass. Existence now multiplies itself. There arises a subordinate, defective life, there is ground for a new world, a creation starts into being, beyond the confines of the world of emanation. But on the other hand, since the chaotic principle of matter has acquired vitality, there now arises a more distinct and more active opposition to the godlike, a barely negative, blind, ungodly nature power. Which obstinately resists all influence of the divine. Hence, as products, of the spirit of the, Greek, Lambda Eta, of the, Greek, Pi Nu Epsilon Nu Alpha Lambda Iota Kappa Omicron Nu. Nu Mahulican, are Satan, malignant spirits, wicked men, in none of whom is there any reasonable or moral principle, or any principle of a rational will. But blind passions alone have the ascendancy. In them there is the same conflict, as the scheme of Platonism supposes, between the soul under the guidance of divine reason the Greek, nu omicron, nous, and the soul blindly resisting reason, between the Greek, pyro nu omicron iota alpha, pronoia, and the Greek, alpha nu alpha gamma eta, anage, the divine principle and the natural. The Syrian Gnosis assured the existence of an active, turbulent kingdom of evil, or of darkness, which, by its encroachments on the kingdom of light, brought about a commixture of the light with the darkness, of the godlike with the ungodlike. Even among the Platonists, some thought that along with an organized, inert matter, the substratum of the corporeal world, there existed from the beginning a blind, lawless motive power, an ungodlike soul. As its original motive and active principle. As the inorganic matter was organized into a corporeal world, by the plastic power of the deity, so, by the same power, law and reason were communicated to that turbulent, irrational soul. Thus the chaos of the, Greek, Lambda Eta, was transformed into an organized world, and that blind soul into a rational principle, a mundane soul, animating the universe. As from the latter proceeds all rational, spiritual life in humanity, 
so from the former proceeds all that is irrational, all that is under the blind sway of passion and appetite, and all malignant spirits are its progeny. In one respect all the Gnostics agreed, they all held, that there was a world purely emanating out of the vital development of God, a creation evolved directly out of the divine essence. Far exalted above any outward creation produced by God's plastic power, and conditioned by pre-existing matter. They agreed in holding that the framer of this lower world was not the father of that higher world of emanation. But the Demiurge, Greek, Delta Epsilon Mu Iota Omicron Upsilon Rho Gamma Omicron, a being of a kindred nature with the universe framed and governed by him, and far inferior to that higher system and the father of it. But some, setting out from ideas which had long prevailed among certain Jews of Alexandria, Suppose that the Supreme God created and governed the world by His ministering spirits, by the angels. At the head of these angels stood one who had the direction and control of all, therefore called the artificer and governor of the world. This demiurge they compared with the plastic, animating mundane spirit of Plato and Platonists, the Greek, Delta Epsilon Tau Epsilon Rho Omicron Theta Epsilon. Deuteros Theos. The Greek, Theta Epsilon Gamma Epsilon Nu Eta Tau, Theos Genitos, who, moreover, according to the Timaeus of Plato, strives to represent the idea of the divine reason, in that which is becoming, as contradistinguished from that which is, and temporal. This angel is a representative of the Supreme God, on the lower stage of existence, he does not act independently, but merely according to the ideas inspired in him by the Supreme God. Just as the plastic, mundane soul of the Platonists creates all things after the pattern of the ideas communicated by the supreme reason, Greek, nu omicron. Nous, the, Greek, sigma tau iota zeta omicron nu. Ho esti zoon, the, Greek, pi alpha rho delta epsilon iota gamma mu alpha. Paradema, of the divine reason hypostatized. But these ideas transcend his limited essence, he cannot understand them, he is merely their unconscious organ and therefore is unable himself to comprehend the whole scope and meaning of the work which he performs. As an organ under the guidance of a higher inspiration, he reveals higher truths than he himself can comprehend. The mass of the Jews, they held, recognized not the angel, by whom, in all the theophanies of the Old Testament, God revealed himself. They knew not the demiurge in his true relation to the hidden supreme God, who never reveals himself in the sensible world. They confounded the type and the archetype, the symbol and the idea. They rose no higher than the demiurge. They took him to be the supreme God himself. But the spiritual men among them, on the contrary, clearly perceived, or at least divined, the ideas veiled under Judaism, they rose beyond the demiurge, to a knowledge of the supreme God. And are therefore properly his worshippers, Greek Theta Epsilon Rho Alpha Pi Epsilon Upsilon Tau Alpha. Therapeutai. Other Gnostics, who had not been followers of the Mosaic religion, but who had, at an earlier period, framed to themselves an Oriental Gnosis, regarded the Demiurge as a being absolutely hostile to the Supreme God. He and his angels, notwithstanding their finite nature, wish to establish their independence, they will tolerate no foreign rule within their realm. Whatever of a higher nature descends into their kingdom, they seek to hold imprisoned there, lest it should raise itself above their narrow precincts. Probably, in this system, the kingdom of the demiurgic angels corresponded, for the most part, with that of the deceitful star spirits, who seek to rob man of his freedom, to beguile him by various arts of deception, and who exercise a tyrannical sway over the things of this world. Accordingly, in the system of these Sabaeans, the seven planet spirits, and the twelve star spirits of the zodiac, who sprang from an irregular connection between the cheated Fetahil and the spirit of darkness. Play an important part in everything that is bad. The Demiurge is a limited and limiting being, proud, jealous, and revengeful, and this his character betrays itself in the Old Testament, which, the Gnostics held, came from him. They transferred to the Demiurge himself, whatever in the idea of God, as presented by the Old Testament, appeared to them defective. Against his will and rule the Greek, Upsilon Nueda, was continually rebelling, revolting without control against the dominion which he, the fashioner, would exercise over it, casting off the yoke imposed on it, and destroying the work he had begun. 
the same jealous being, limited in his power, ruling with despotic sway, they imagined they saw in nature. He strives to check the germination of the divine seeds of life which the supreme God of holiness and love, who has no connection whatever with the sensible world, has scattered among men. That perfect God was at most known and worshipped in mysteries by a few spiritual men. The Gospel of Esti John is in great measure a polemic against the Gnostics, whose different sects, to solve the great problems, the creation of a material world by an immaterial being, the fall of man, the incarnation. The redemption and restoration of the spirits called men, admitted a long series of intelligences, intervening in a series of spiritual operations. And which they designated by the names, the beginning, the word, the only begotten, life, light, and spirit, ghost, in Greek, Greek, Rokai, Delta Gamma Omicron, Mu Omicron Nu Omicron Gamma Epsilon Nu, Zeta Omega, Phi, and, Greek, Pi Nu Epsilon Mu Alpha, Archie, Logos, Monogenes, Zoe, Phos, and Numa. St. John, at the beginning of his Gospel, avers that it was Jesus Christ who existed in the beginning, that he was the Word of God by which everything was made. That he was the only begotten, the life and the light, and that he diffuses among men the Holy Spirit, or Ghost, the divine life and light. So the Pleroma, Greek, Pylandero Omega Mu Alpha, plenitude or fullness, was a favorite term with the Gnostics, and truth and grace were the Gnostic Eons. And the Simonians, Dokites, and other Gnostics held that the Ian Christ Jesus was never really, but only apparently clothed with a human body, but St. John replies that the Word did really become flesh, and dwelt among us. And that in him were the pleroma and truth and grace. In the doctrine of Valentinus, reared a Christian at Alexandria, God was a perfect being, an abyss, Greek, beta upsilon theta. But hose, which no intelligence could sound, because no eye could reach the invisible and ineffable heights on which he dwelt, and no mind could comprehend the duration of his existence, he has always been. He is the primitive father and beginning, the Greek, Pyro Omicron Pi Alpha Tau Omega Rho, and, Greek, Rho Omicron Alpha Rho Chi. Propater and Prork, he will be always, and does not grow old. The development of his perfections produced the intellectual world. After having passed infinite ages in repose and silence, he manifested himself by his thought, source of all his manifestations, and which received from him the germ of his creations. Being of his being, his thought, Greek, Nu Nu Omicron Iota Alpha. Enoia, is also termed, Greek, Cairo Iota, Charis, Grace or Joy, and, Greek, Sigma Iota Gamma, or, Greek, Rho Rho Eta Tau Omicron Nu, Sigi or Ariton, Silence or the Ineffable. Its first manifestation was, Greek, Nu Omicron Upsilon, Nus, the Intelligence, first of the Eons, commencement of all things, first revelation of the Divinity, the, Greek, Mu Omicron Nu Omicron Gamma Epsilon Nu, Monogenes, or Only Begotten, next, Truth, Greek, Lambda Theta Epsilon Iota Alpha. Aletheia, his companion. Their manifestations were the word, Greek, Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron. Logos, and life, Greek, Zeta Omicron. Zoe, and theirs, man and the church, Greek, Alpha Nu Theta Rho Omicron Pi Omicron, and, Greek, Kappa Kappa Lambda Eta Sigma Alpha. Anthropos and Ecclesia, and from these, other twelve, six of whom were hope, faith, charity, intelligence, happiness, and wisdom, or, in the Hebrew, Keston, Kina, Amphi, Wananim, Thedes, and Ubina. The harmony of the Eons, struggling to know and be united to the primitive God, was disturbed, and to redeem and restore them, the intelligence, Greek, New Omicron, produced Christ and the Holy Spirit his companion, who restored them to their first estate of happiness and harmony, and thereupon they formed the Ian Jesus, born of a virgin, to whom the Christos united himself in baptism, and who, with his companion Sophia Akimoth, saved and redeemed the world. The Marcosians taught that the supreme deity produced by his words the Greek, Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron, Logos, or Plenitude of Eons, his first utterance was a syllable of four letters, each of which became a being. His second of four, his third of ten, and his fourth of twelve, 
30 in all, which constituted the Greek Pylandero Omega Mu Alpha Pleroma. The Valentinians, and others of the Gnostics, distinguished three orders of existences, first. The divine germs of life, exalted by their nature above matter, and akin to the, Greek, Sigma Omicron Phi Alpha, Sophia, to the mundane soul and to the Pleroma, the spiritual natures, Greek, Phi Sigma Epsilon Iota Pi Nu Epsilon Mu Alpha Tau Iota Kappa Alpha, Fusius Nematicae, 2D. The natures originating in the life, divided from the former by the mixture of the, Greek, Lambda Eta, the psychical natures, Greek, Phi Sigma Epsilon Iota Psi Upsilon Chi Iota Kappa Alpha, Fusius Suchikai. With which begins a perfectly new order of existence, an image of that higher mind and system, in a subordinate grade, and finally, 3D. The ungodlike or hylic nature, which resists all amelioration, and whose tendency is only to destroy, the nature of blind lust and passion. The nature of the, Greek, Pi Nu Epsilon Upsilon Mu Alpha Tau Iota Kappa Nu, Nematican, the spiritual, is essential relationship with God, the, Greek, Mu Omicron Omicron Sigma Iota Omicron Nu Tau Theta Epsilon. Homoousian to Theo hence the life of unity, the undivided, the absolutely simple, Omicron Sigma Alpha Nu Iota Kappa, Mu Omicron Nu Omicron Epsilon Iota Delta. Ujia Henike, Monoiades. The essence of the Psi Upsilon Chi Iota Kappa Omicron, Suchikoi, is disruption into multiplicity, manifoldness, which, however, is subordinate to a higher unity, by which it allows itself to be guided, first unconsciously, then consciously. The essence of the Lambda Iota Kappa Omicron, Hulikoi, of whom Satan is the head, is the direct opposite to all unity, disruption and disunion in itself, without the least sympathy, without any point of coalescence whatever for unity. Together with an effort to destroy all unity, to extend its own inherent disunion to everything, and to rend everything asunder. This principle has no power to posit anything. But only to negative, it is unable to create, to produce, to form, but only to destroy, to decompose. By Marcus, the disciple of Valentinus, the idea of a lambda omicron gamma omicron tau omicron upsilon omicron nu tau omicron, logos tu ontus, of a word, manifesting the hidden divine essence, in the creation, was spun out into the most subtle details, the entire creation being, in his view. A continuous utterance of the ineffable. The way in which the germs of divine life, the sigma pi rho mu alpha tau alpha pi nu epsilon upsilon mu alpha tau iota kappa. Spermata nematica, which lie shut up in the eons, continually unfold and individualize themselves more and more, is represented as a spontaneous analysis of the several names of the ineffable, into their several sounds. An echo of the pleroma falls down into the lambda eta, kyul, and becomes the forming of a new but lower creation. One formula of the nematical baptism among the Gnostics ran thus, in the name which is hidden from all the divinities and powers, of the Demiurge, the name of truth, the Alpha Lambda Theta Epsilon Iota Alpha, Aletheia, self-manifestation of the buttholes. Which Jesus of Nazareth has put on in the light zones of Christ, the living Christ, through the Holy Ghost, for the redemption of the angels, the name by which all things attain to perfection. The candidate then said, I am established and redeemed, I am redeemed in my soul from this world, and from all that belongs to it, by the name of, who has redeemed the soul of Jesus by the living Christ. The assembly then said, Peace, or salvation, to all on whom this name rests. The boy Dionysos, torn in pieces, according to the Bakshik mysteries, by the Titans, was considered by the Manichaeans as simply representing the soul, swallowed up by the powers of darkness. The divine life rent into fragments by matter, that part of the luminous essence of the primitive man, the Greek, Pyro Tau Omicron Nu Theta Rho Omega Pi Omicron, Protos Anthropos, of Mani, the Greek, Pyro Omega Nu Nu Theta Rho Omega Pi Omicron, Prayon Anthropos, of the Valentinians. The Adam Cadman of the Kabbalah. And the Kaimorts of the Zendavesta, swallowed up by the powers of darkness, the mundane soul, mixed with matter, the seed of divine life, which had fallen into matter, and had thence to undergo a process of purification and development. The Greek, Gamma Nu Sigma Iota, Gnosis, 
of Carpocrates and his son Epiphanes consisted in the knowledge of one supreme original being, the highest unity, from whom all existence has emanated, and to whom it strives to return. The finite spirits that rule over the several portions of the earth, seek to counteract this universal tendency to unity. And from their influence, their laws, and arrangements, precedes all that checks, disturbs, or limits the original communion, which is the basis of nature, as the outward manifestation of that highest unity. These spirits, moreover, seek to retain under their dominion the souls which, emanating from the highest unity, and still partaking of its nature, have lapsed into the corporeal world, and have there been imprisoned in bodies, in order, under their dominion, to be kept within the cycle of migration. From these finite spirits, the popular religions of different nations derive their origin. But the souls which, from a reminiscence of their former condition, soar upward to the contemplation of that higher unity, reach to such perfect freedom and repose, as nothing afterward can disturb or limit and rise superior to the popular deities and religions. As examples of this sort, they named Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, and Christ. They made no distinction between the latter and the wise and good men of every nation. They taught that any other soul which could soar to the same height of contemplation, might be regarded as equal with him. The Ophites commenced their system with a supreme being, long unknown to the human race, and still so the greater number of men. The th Greek, Beta Upsilon Theta Omicron, but Hos, or Profundity, source of light, and of Adam Cadman, the primitive man, made by the Demiurgos, but perfected by the Supreme God by the communication to him of the Spirit, Greek, Pi Nu Epsilon Nu Alpha. Numa. The first emanation was the thought of the Supreme Deity, the th Greek, Nu Nu Omicron Iota Alpha. Enoia, the conception of the universe in the thought of God. This thought, called also silence, Greek, sigma iota gamma eta. Sigi, produced the spirit, Greek, pi nu epsilon upsilon nu alpha. Numa, mother of the living, and wisdom of God. Together with this primitive existence, matter existed also, the waters, darkness, abyss, and chaos, eternal like the spiritual principle. But Hose and his thought, uniting with wisdom, made her fruitful by the divine light, and she produced a perfect and an imperfect being, Christos, and a second and inferior wisdom, Sophia Akamoth, who falling into chaos remained entangled there. Became enfeebled, and lost all knowledge of the superior wisdom that gave her birth. Communicating movement to chaos, she produced Ialdabaoth, the Demiurgos, agent of material creation, and then ascended toward her first place in the scale of creation. Ialdabaoth produced an angel that was his image, and this a second, and so on in succession to the sixth after the Demiurgos, the seven being reflections one of the other, yet different and inhabiting seven distinct regions. The names of the six thus produced were Iao, Sabaoth, Adonai, Eloi, Orai, and Astaphi. Ialdabaoth, to become independent of his mother, and to pass for the supreme being, made the world, and man, in his own image. And his mother caused the spiritual principle to pass from him into man so made, and henceforward the contest between the Demiurgos and his mother, between light and darkness, good and evil, was concentrated in man. And the image of Ialdabaoth, reflected upon matter, became the serpent spirit, Satan, the evil intelligence. Eve, created by Ialdabaoth, had by his son's children that were angels like themselves. The spiritual light was withdrawn from man by Sophia, and the world surrendered to the influence of evil, until the spirit, urged by the entreaties of wisdom, induced the supreme being to send Christos to redeem it. Compelled, despite himself, by his mother, Ialdabaoth caused the man Jesus to be born of a virgin, and the celestial Saviour, uniting with his sister, wisdom, descended through the regions of the seven angels. Appeared in each under the form of its chief, concealed his own, and entered with his sister into the man Jesus at the baptism in Jordan. Ialdabaoth, finding that Jesus was destroying his empire and abolishing his worship, caused the Jews to hate and crucify him, before which happened, Christos and Wisdom had ascended to the celestial regions. They restored Jesus to life and gave him an ethereal body, in which he remained eighteen mouths on earth, and receiving from Wisdom the perfect knowledge, Gamma Nu Omega Sigma Iota. 
Gnosis, communicated it to a small number of his apostles, and then arose to the intermediate region inhabited by Ialdabaoth, where, unknown to him, he sits at his right hand, taking from him the souls of light purified by Christos. When nothing of the spiritual world shall remain subject to Ialdabaoth, the redemption will be accomplished, and the end of the world, the completion of the return of light into the plenitude, will occur. Tadian adopted the theory of emanation, of eons, of the existence of a God too sublime to allow himself to be known, but displaying himself by intelligences emanating from his bosom. The first of these was his spirit, pi nu epsilon upsilon nu alpha. Numa, God himself, God thinking, God conceiving the universe. The second was the word, lambda omicron gamma omicron. Logos, no longer merely the thought or conception, but the creative utterance, manifestation of the divinity, but emanating from the thought or spirit, the first begotten, author of the visible creation. This was the Trinity, composed of the Father, Spirit, and Word. The Elksites adopted the seven spirits of the Gnostics, but named them Heaven, Water, Spirit, the Holy Angels of Prayer, Oil, Salt, and the Earth. The opinion of the Dokites as to the human nature of Jesus Christ, was that most generally received among the Gnostics. They deemed the intelligences of the superior world too pure and too much the antagonists of matter, to be willing to unite with it, and held that Christ, an intelligence of the first rank, in appearing upon the earth, did not become confounded with matter, but took upon himself only the appearance of a body, or at the most used it only as an envelope. Noetus termed the Son the first utterance of the Father, the Word, not by himself, as an intelligence, and unconnected with the flesh, a real Son, but a Word, and a perfect only begotten, light emanated from the light. Water flowing from its spring, a ray emanated from the Son. Paul of Samosata taught that Jesus Christ was the Son of Joseph and Mary. But that the Word, Wisdom, or intelligence of God, the new Omicron Upsilon, Nous, of the Gnostics, had united itself with him, so that he might be said to be at once the Son of God, and God himself. Arius called the Saviour the first of creatures, non emanated from God, but really created, by the direct will of God, before time and the ages. According to the Church, Christ was of the same nature as God. According to some dissenters, of the same nature as man. Arius adopted the theory of a nature analogous to both. When God resolved to create the human race, he made a being which he called the Word, the Son, Wisdom, Lambda Gamma Omicron, Upsilon, Sigma Omicron Phi Alpha. Logos, Yuyos, Sophia, to the end that he might give existence to men. This word is the Ormazd of Zoroaster, the Ensof of the Kabbalah, the New Omicron, Nous, of Platonism and Philonism, and the Sigma Omicron Phi Iota Alpha or Delta Epsilon Mu Iota Omicron Upsilon Rho Gamma Omicron, Sophia or Demiurgos, of the Gnostics. He distinguished the inferior wisdom, or the daughter, from the superior wisdom. The latter being in God, inherent in his nature, and incapable of communication to any creature, the second, by which the Son was made, communicated itself to him, and therefore he himself was entitled to be called the Word and the Son. Manes, founder of the sect of the Manichaeans, who had lived and been distinguished among the Persian Magi, profited by the doctrines of Scythianus, a Kabbalist or Judaizing Gnostic of the times of the Apostles. And knowing those of Bardesanes and Harmonius, derived his doctrines from Zoroasterism, Christianity, and Gnosticism. He claimed to be the Pyalphoro Kapalanda Eta Tau Omicron, Paracletos, or Comforter, in the sense of a teacher, organ of the deity, but not in that of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, and commenced his Epistola Fundamenti in these words, Manes, Apostle of Jesus Christ. Elect of God the Father. Behold the words of salvation, emanating from the living and eternal fountain. The dominant idea of his doctrine was pantheism, derived by him from its source in the regions of India and on the confines of China, that the cause of all that exists is in God, and at last, God is all in all. All souls are equal, God is in all, in men, animals, and plants. 
There are two gods, one of good and the other of evil, each independent, eternal, chief of a distinct empire, necessarily, and of their very natures, hostile to one another. The evil god, Satan, is the genius of matter alone. The god of good is infinitely his superior, the true god, while the other is but the chief of all that is the enemy of God, and must in the end succumb to his power. The empire of light alone is eternal and true, and this empire is a great chain of emanations, all connected with the supreme being which they make manifest, all him, under different forms, chosen for one end, the triumph of the good. In each of his members lie hidden thousands of ineffable treasures. Excellent in his glory, incomprehensible in his greatness, the Father has joined to himself those fortunate and glorious eons, Alpha Iota Omega Nu Epsilon. Ions, whose power and number it is impossible to determine. This is Spinoza's infinity of infinite attributes of God. Twelve chief eons, at the head of all, were the genii of the twelve constellations of the zodiac, and called by Manes Olamin. Satan, also, Lord of the Empire of Darkness, had an army of eons or demons, emanating from his essence, and reflecting more or less his image, but divided and inharmonious among themselves. A war among them brought them to the confines of the realm of light. Delighted, they sought to conquer it. But the chief of the celestial empire created a power which he placed on the frontiers of heaven to protect his eons, and destroy the empire of evil. This was the mother of life, the soul of the world, an emanation from the supreme being, too pure to come in immediate contact with matter. It remained in the highest region. But produced a son, the first man the Kaimorts, Adam Cadman, Pyro Tau Omicron Alpha Nu Theta Rho Omega Pi Omicron, Protos Anthropos, and Hivil Ziva, of the Zendavesta, the Kabbalah, the Gnosis, and Sabaism. Who commenced the contest with the powers of evil, but, losing part of his panoply, of his light, his son and many souls born of the light, who were devoured by the darkness, God sent to his assistance the living spirit. Or the son of the first man Upsilon Nu Theta Rho Pi Omicron Upsilon. Yuyos Anthropu, or Jesus Christ. The mother of life, general principle of divine life, and the first man, primitive being that reveals the divine life, are too sublime to be connected with the empire of darkness. The son of man or soul of the world, enters into the darkness, becomes its captive, to end by tempering and softening its savage nature. The divine spirit, after having brought back the primitive man to the empire of light, raises above the world that part of the celestial soul that remained unaffected by being mingled with the empire of darkness. Placed in the region of the sun and moon, this pure soul, the son of man, the redeemer or Christ, labors to deliver and attract to himself that part of the light or of the soul of the first man diffused through matter. Which done, the world will cease to exist. To retain the rays of light still remaining among his eons, and ever tending to escape and return, by concentrating them, the prince of darkness, with their consent, made Adam, whose soul was of the divine light, contributed by the eons. And his body of matter, so that he belonged to both empires, that of light and that of darkness. To prevent the light from escaping at once, the demons forbade Adam to eat the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, by which he would have known the empire of light and that of darkness. He obeyed. An angel of light induced him to transgress, and gave him the means of victory, but the demons created Eve, who seduced him into an act of sensualism, that enfeebled him, and bound him anew in the bonds of matter. This is repeated in the case of every man that lives. To deliver the soul, captive in darkness, the principle of light, or genius of the sun, charged to redeem the intellectual world, of which he is the type, came to manifest himself among men. Light appeared in the darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not, according to the words of St. John. The light could not unite with the darkness. It but put on the appearance of a human body, and took the name of Christ in the Messiah, only to accommodate itself to the language of the Jews. The light did its work, turning the Jews from the adoration of the evil principle, and the pagans from the worship of demons. But the chief of the empire of darkness caused him to be crucified by the Jews. Still he suffered in appearance only, and his death gave to all souls the symbol of their enfranchisement. 
the person of Jesus having disappeared, there was seen in his place a cross of light, over which a celestial voice pronounced these words, The cross of light is called the Word, Christ, the Gate, Joy, the Bread, the Son, the Resurrection, Jesus. The Father, the Spirit, Life, Truth, and Grace. With the Priscillianists there were two principles, one the divinity, the other, primitive matter and darkness, each eternal. Satan is the son and lord of matter, and the secondary angels and demons, children of matter. Satan created and governs the visible world. But the soul of man emanated from God, and is of the same substance with God. Seduced by the evil spirits, it passes through various bodies, until, purified and reformed, it rises to God and is strengthened by his light. These powers of evil hold mankind in pledge. And to redeem this pledge, the Saviour, Christ the Redeemer, came and died upon the cross of expiation, thus discharging the written obligation. He, like all souls, was of the same substance with God, a manifestation of the divinity, not forming a second person, unborn, like the divinity, and nothing else than the divinity under another form. It is useless to trace these vagaries further. And we stop at the frontiers of the realm of the 365,000 emanations of the mandates from the primitive light, Phyro or Pharaoh and Yaver, and return contentedly to the simple and sublime creed of masonry. Such were some of the ancient notions concerning the deity, and taken in connection with what has been detailed in the preceding degrees, this lecture affords you a true picture of the ancient speculations. From the beginning until now, those who have undertaken to solve the great mystery of the creation of a material universe by an immaterial deity, have interposed between the two, and between God and man, divers manifestations of, or emanations from, or personified attributes or agents of, the great supreme God, who is coexistent with time and coextensive with space. The universal belief of the Orient was, that the supreme being did not himself create either the earth or man. The fragment which commences the book of Genesis, consisting of the first chapter and the three first verses of the second, assigns the creation or rather the formation or modeling of the world from matter already existing in confusion. Not to Ihuh, but to the Alan, well known as subordinate deities, forces, or manifestations, among the Phoenicians. The second fragment imputes it to Ihuh Alam, three and St. John assigns the creation to the Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron or Word and asserts that Christ was that word, as well as light and life, other emanations from the great primeval deity, to which other faiths had assigned the work of creation. An absolute existence, wholly immaterial, in no way within the reach of our senses. A cause, but not an effect, that never was not, but existed during an infinity of eternities, before there was anything else except time and space, is wholly beyond the reach of our conceptions. The mind of man has wearied itself in speculations as to his nature, his essence, his attributes, and ended in being no wiser than it began. In the impossibility of conceiving of immateriality, we feel at sea and lost whenever we go beyond the domain of matter. And yet we know that there are powers, forces, causes, that are themselves not matter. We give them names, but what they really are, and what their essence, we are wholly ignorant. But, Fortunately, it does not follow that we may not believe, or even know, that which we cannot explain to ourselves, or that which is beyond the reach of our comprehension. If we believed only that which our intellect can grasp, measure, comprehend, and have distinct and clear ideas of, we sh plus will believe scarce anything. The senses are not the witnesses that bear testimony to us of the loftiest truths. Our greatest difficulty is, that language is not adequate to express our ideas, because our words refer to things, and are images of what is substantial and material. If we use the word emanation, our mind involuntarily recurs to something material, flowing out of some other thing that is material, and if we reject this idea of materiality, nothing is left of the emanation but an unreality. The word thing itself suggests to us that which is material and within the cognizance and jurisdiction of the senses. If we cut away from it the idea of materiality, it presents itself to us as no thing, but an intangible unreality, which the mind vainly endeavors to grasp. Existence and being are terms that have the same color of materiality. 
And when we speak of a power or force, the mind immediately images to itself one physical and material thing acting upon another. Eliminate that idea. And the power or force, devoid of physical characteristics, seems as unreal as the shadow that dances on a wall, itself a mere absence of light, as spirit is to us merely that which is not matter. Infinite space and infinite time are the two primary ideas. We formulize them thus, add body to body and sphere to sphere, until the imagination wearies. And still there will remain beyond, a void, empty, unoccupied space, limitless, because it is void. Add event to event in continuous succession, forever and forever, and there will still remain, before and after, a time in which there was and will be no event, and also endless because it too is void. Thus these two ideas of the boundlessness of space and the endlessness of time seem to involve the ideas that matter and events are limited and finite. We cannot conceive of an infinity of worlds or of events. But only of an indefinite number of each, for, as we struggle to conceive of their infinity, the thought ever occurs in despite of all our efforts, there must be space in which there are no worlds, there must have been time when there were no events. We cannot conceive how, if this earth moves millions of millions of miles a million times repeated, it is still in the center of space. Nor how, if we lived millions of millions of ages and centuries, we should still be in the center of eternity, with still as much space on one side as on the other, with still as much time before us as behind. For that seems to say that the world has not moved nor we lived at all. Nor can we comprehend how an infinite series of worlds, added together, is no larger than an infinite series of atoms. Or an infinite series of centuries no longer than an infinite series of seconds, both being alike infinite, and therefore one series containing no more nor fewer units than the other. Nor have we the capacity to form in ourselves any idea of that which is immaterial. We use the word, but it conveys to us only the idea of the absence and negation of materiality. Which vanishing, space and time alone, infinite and boundless, seem to us to be left. We cannot form any conception of an effect without a cause. We cannot but believe, indeed we know, that, how far soever we may have to run back along the chain of effects and causes, it cannot be infinite. But we must come at last to something which is not an effect, but the first cause, and yet the fact is literally beyond our comprehension. The mind refuses to grasp the idea of self-existence, of existence without a beginning. As well expect the hair that grows upon our head to understand the nature and immortality of the soul. It does not need to go so far in search of mysteries. Nor have we any right to disbelieve or doubt the existence of a great first cause, itself no effect, because we cannot comprehend it, because the words we use do not even express it to us adequately. We rub a needle for a little while, on a dark, inert mass of iron ore, that had lain idle in the earth for many centuries. Something is thereby communicated to the steel, we term it a virtue, a power, or a quality, and then we balance it upon a pivot, and, lo! Drawn by some invisible, mysterious power, one pole of the needle turns to the north, and there the same power keeps the same pole for days and years. We'll keep it there, perhaps, as long as the world lasts, carry the needle where you will, and no matter what seas or mountains intervene between it and the north pole of the world. And this power, thus acting, and indicating to the mariner his course over the trackless ocean, when the stars shine not for many days, saves vessels from shipwreck, families from distress. And those from sudden death on whose lives the fate of nations and the peace of the world depend. But for it, Napoleon might never have reached the ports of France on his return from Egypt, nor Nelson lived to fight and win at Trafalgar. Men call this power magnetism, and then complacently think that they have explained it all. And yet they have but given a new name to an unknown thing, to hide their ignorance. What is this wonderful power? It is a real, actual, active power, that we know and see. But what its essence is, or how it acts, we do not know, any more than we know the essence or the mode of action of the creative thought and word of God. And again, what is that which we term galvanism and electricity, which, evolved by the action of a little acid on two metals, aided by a magnet, 
circles the earth in a second. Sending from land to land the thoughts that govern the transactions of individuals and nations. The mind has formed no notion of matter, that will include it, and no name that we can give it, helps us to understand its essence and its being. It is a power, like thought and the will. We know no more. What is this power of gravitation that makes everything upon the earth tend to the center? How does it reach out its invisible hands toward the erratic meteor stones, arrest them in their swift course, and draw them down to the earth's bosom? It is a power. We know no more. What is that heat which plays so wonderful a part in the world's economy, that caloric, latent everywhere, within us and without us, produced by combustion, by intense pressure, and by swift motion? Is it substance, matter, spirit, or immaterial, a mere force or state of matter? And what is light? A substance, say the books, matter, that travels to us from the sun and stars, each ray separable into seven, by the prism, of distinct colors, and with distinct peculiar qualities and actions. And if a substance, what is its essence, and what power is inherent in it, by which it journeys incalculable myriads of miles, and reaches us ten thousand years or more after it leaves the stars. All power is equally a mystery. Apply intense cold to a drop of water in the center of a globe of iron, and the globe is shattered as the water freezes. Confine a little of the same limpid element in a cylinder which Enceladus or Typhon could not have riven asunder, and apply to it intense heat, and the vast power that couched latent in the water shivers the cylinder to atoms. A little shoot from a minute seed, a shoot so soft and tender that the least bruise would kill it, forces its way downward into the hard earth, to the depth of many feet, with an energy wholly incomprehensible. What are these mighty forces, locked up in the small seed and the drop of water? Nay, what is life itself, with all its wondrous, mighty energies, that power which maintains the heat within us, and prevents our bodies, that decay so soon without it, from resolution into their original, elements, life, that constant miracle. The nature and essence whereof have eluded all the philosophers. And all their learned dissertations on it are a mere jargon of words. No wonder the ancient Persians thought that light and life were one, both emanations from the supreme deity, the archetype of light. No wonder that in their ignorance they worshipped the sun God breathed into man the spirit of life, not matter, but an emanation from himself, not a creature made by him, nor a distinct existence. But a power, like his own thought, and light, to those great-souled ancients, also seemed no creature, and no gross material substance, but a pure emanation from the deity, immortal and indestructible like himself. What, indeed, is reality? Our dreams are as real, while they last, as the occurrences of the daytime. We see, hear, feel, act, experience pleasure and suffer pain, as vividly and actually in a dream as when awake. The occurrences and transactions of a year are crowded into the limits of a second, and the dream remembered is as real as the past occurrences of life. The philosophers tell us that we have no cognizance of substance itself, but only of its attributes, that when we see that which we call a block of marble, our perceptions give us information only of something extended, solid, colored, heavy, and the like. But not of the very thing itself, to which these attributes belong. And yet the attributes do not exist without the substance. They are not substances, but adjectives. There is no such thing or existence as hardness, weight or color, by itself, detached from any subject, moving first here, then there, and attaching itself to this and to the other subject. And yet, they say, the attributes are not the subject. So thought, volition, and perception are not the soul, but its attributes, and we have no cognizance of the soul itself, but only of them, its manifestations. Nor of God, but only of His wisdom, power, magnificence, truth, and other attributes. And yet we know that there is matter, a soul within our body, a God that lives in the universe. Take, then, the attributes of the soul. I am conscious that I exist and am the same identical person that I was twenty years ago. I am conscious that my body is not I, that if my arms were lopped away, this person that I call me, would still remain, complete, entire, identical as before. 
but I cannot ascertain, by the most intense and long-continued reflection, what I am, nor where within my body I reside, nor whether I am a point, or an expanded substance. I have no power to examine and inspect. I exist, will, think, perceive. That I know, and nothing more. I think a noble and sublime thought. What is that thought? It is not matter, nor spirit. It is not a thing, but a power and force. I make upon a paper certain conventional marks, that represent that thought. There is no power or virtue in the marks I write, but only in the thought which they tell to others. I die, but the thought still lives. It is a power. It acts on men, excites them to enthusiasm, inspires patriotism, governs their conduct, controls their destinies, disposes of life and death. The words I speak are but a certain succession of particular sounds, that by conventional arrangement communicate to others the immaterial, intangible, eternal thought. The fact that thought continues to exist an instant, after it makes its appearance in the soul, proves it immortal, for there is nothing conceivable that can destroy it. The spoken words, being mere sounds, may vanish into thin air, and the written ones, mere marks, be burned, erased, destroyed, but the thought itself lives still, and must live on forever. A human thought, then, is an actual existence, and a force and power, capable of acting upon and controlling matter as well as mind. Is not the existence of a God, who is the immaterial soul of the universe, and whose thought, embodied or not embodied in his word, is an infinite power, of creation and production, destruction and preservation. Quite as comprehensible as the existence of a soul, of a thought separated from the soul, of the power of that thought to mold the fate and influence the destinies of humanity. And yet we know not when that thought comes, nor what it is. It is not we. We do not mold it, shape it, fashion it. It is neither our mechanism nor our invention. It appears spontaneously, flashing, as it were, into the soul, making that soul the involuntary instrument of its utterance to the world. It comes to us, and seems a stranger to us, seeking a home. As little can we explain the mighty power of the human will. Volition, like thought, seems spontaneous, an effect without a cause. Circumstances provoke it, and serve as its occasion, but do not produce it. It springs up in the soul, like thought, as the waters gush, upward in a spring. Is it the manifestation of the soul, merely making apparent what passes within the soul, or an emanation from it, going abroad and acting outwardly, itself a real existence, as it is an admitted power? We can but own our ignorance. It is certain that it acts on other souls, controls, directs them, shapes their action, legislates for men and nations, and yet it is not material nor visible, and the laws it writes merely inform one soul of what has passed within another. God, therefore, is a mystery, only as everything that surrounds us, and as we ourselves, are mysteries. We know that there is and must be a first cause. His attributes, severed from himself, are unrealities. As color and extension, weight and hardness, do not exist apart from matter as separate existences and substantives, spiritual or immaterial. So the goodness, wisdom, justice, mercy, and benevolence of God are not independent existences, personify them as men may, but attributes of the deity, the adjectives of one great substantive. But we know that he must be good, true, wise, just, benevolent, merciful, and in all these, and all his other attributes, perfect and infinite. Because we are conscious that these are laws imposed on us by the very nature of things, necessary, and without which the universe would be confusion and the existence of a God incredible. They are of his essence, and necessary, as his existence is. He is the living, thinking, intelligent soul of the universe, the permanent, the stationary, Epsilon Sigma Tau Omega. Estos, of Simon Magus, the one that always is, to Omicron Nu, to On, of Plato, as contradistinguished from the perpetual flux and reflux, or genesis, of things. And, as the thought of the soul, emanating from the soul, becomes audible and visible in words, so did the thought of God, springing up within himself, immortal as himself, when once conceived, immortal before, 
because in himself. Utter itself in the word, its manifestation and mode of communication, and thus create the material, mental, spiritual universe, which, like him, never began to exist. This is the real idea of the ancient nations, God, the Almighty Father, and Source of all. His thought, conceiving the whole universe, and willing its creation, His Word, uttering that thought, and thus becoming the Creator or Demiurgos, in whom was life and light, and that light the life of the universe. Nor did that Word cease at the single act of creation, and having set going the great machine, and enacted the laws of its motion and progression, of birth and life, and change and death, cease to exist, or remain thereafter in inert idleness. For the thought of God lives and is immortal. Embodied in the Word, is not only created, but it preserves. It conducts and controls the universe, all spheres, all worlds, all actions of mankind, and of every animate and inanimate creature. It speaks in the soul of every man who lives. The stars, the earth, the trees, the winds, the universal voice of nature, tempest, and avalanche, the sea's roar and the grave voice of the waterfall, the hoarse thunder and the low whisper of the brook, the song of birds, the voice of love. The speech of men, all are the alphabet in which it communicates itself to men, and informs them of the will and law of God, the soul of the universe. And thus most truly did the Word become flesh and dwell among men. God, the unknown Father, Pi Alpha Tauro Gamma Nu Omega Sigma Tau Omicron. Pater Agnostos, known to us only by his attributes, the Absolute I Am. The thought of God, Nu 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 Omicron Iota Alpha, Enoya, and the word, Lambda Gamma Omicron. Logos, manifestation and expression of the thought. Behold the true Masonic Trinity, the universal soul, the thought in the soul, the word, or thought expressed, the three in one, of a Trinitarian Ecosize. Here Masonry pauses, and leaves its initiates to carry out and develop these great truths in such manner as to each may seem most accordant with reason, philosophy, truth, and his religious faith. It declines to act as arbiter between them. It looks calmly on, while each multiplies the intermediates between the deity and matter, and the personifications of God's manifestations and attributes, to whatever extent his reason, his conviction, or his fancy dictates. While the Indian tells us that Parabrahma, Brahm, and Paratma were the first triune God, revealing himself as Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, creator, preserver, and destroyer. The Egyptian, of Amunre, Neith, and Phtha, creator, matter, thought or light, the Persian of his trinity of three powers in Ormazd, sources of light, fire, and water. The Buddhists of the god Sakya, a trinity composed of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, intelligence, law, and union or harmony, the Chinese Sabaeans of their trinity of Changtiai, the supreme sovereign, Tn, the heavens. And Tao, the universal supreme reason and principle of all things, who produced the unit, that, two, two, three, and three, all that is. While the Sklavonovend typifies his trinity by the three heads of the god Triglav. The ancient Prussian points to his triune god, Perkaun, Pekalos, and Petrimpos, deities of light and thunder, of hell and of the earth, the ancient Scandinavian to Odin, Free, and Thor. And the old Etruscans to Tina, Talna, and Minerva, strength, abundance, and wisdom. While Plato tells us of the supreme good, the reason or intellect, and the soul or spirit. And Philo of the archetype of light, wisdom, Sigma Omicron Psi Iota Alpha, and the word, Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron, the Kabbalists, of the triads of the Sephiroth. While the disciples of Simon Magus, and the many sects of the Gnostics, confuse us with their eons, emanations, powers, wisdom superior and inferior, Ialdabaoth, Adam Cadman. Even to the 365,000 emanations of the Maldates. And while the pious Christian believes that the word dwelt in the mortal body of Jesus of Nazareth, and suffered upon the cross, and that the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the apostles, and now inspires every truly Christian soul. While all these faiths assert their claims to the exclusive possession of the truth, Masonry inculcates its old doctrine, and no more. That God is one. 
that his thought uttered in his word, created the universe, and preserves it by those eternal laws which are the expression of that thought, that the soul of man, breathed into him by God, is immortal as his thoughts are. That he is free to do evil or to choose good, responsible for his acts and punishable for his sins, that all evil and wrong and suffering are but temporary, the discords of one great harmony. And that in his good time they will lead by infinite modulations to the great, harmonic final chord and cadence of truth, love, peace, and happiness, that will ring forever and ever under the arches of heaven, among all the stars and worlds. And in all souls of men and angels. 27. Knight Commander of the Temple. This is the first of the really chivalric degrees of the ancient and accepted Scottish rite. It occupies this place in the calendar of the degrees between the twenty-sixth and the last of the philosophical degrees, in order, by breaking the continuity of these, to relieve what might otherwise become wearisome. And also to remind you that, while engaged with the speculations and abstractions of philosophy and creeds, the mason is also to continue engaged in the active duties of this great warfare of life. He is not only a moralist and philosopher, but a soldier, the successor of those knights of the Middle Age, who, while they wore the cross, also wielded the sword, and were the soldiers of honor, loyalty, and duty. Times change, and circumstances. But virtue and duty remain the same. The evils to be warred against but take another shape, and are developed in a different form. There is the same need now of truth and loyalty as in the days of Frederick Barbarossa. The characters, religious and military, attention to the sick and wounded in the hospital, and war against the infidel in the field, are no longer blended. But the same duties, to be performed in another shape, continue to exist and to environ us all. The innocent virgin is no longer at the mercy of the brutal baron or licentious man at arms, but purity and innocence still need protectors. War is no longer the apparently natural state of society, and for most men it is an empty obligation to assume, that they will not recede before the enemy, but the same high duty and obligation still rest upon all men. Truth, in act, profession, and opinion, is rarer now than in the days of chivalry. Falsehood has become a current coin, and circulates with a certain degree of respectability, because it has an actual value. It is indeed the great vice of the age, it, and its twin sister, dishonesty. Men, for political preferment, profess whatever principles are expedient and profitable. At the bar, in the pulpit, and in the halls of legislation, men argue against their own convictions, and, with what they term logic, prove to the satisfaction of others that which they do not themselves believe. Insincerity and duplicity are valuable to their possessors, like estates in stocks, that yield a certain revenue, and it is no longer the truth of an opinion or a principle, but the net profit that may be realized from it. Which is the measure of its value? The press is the great sower of falsehood. To slander a political antagonist, to misrepresent all that he says, and, if that be impossible, to invent for him what he does not say. To put in circulation whatever baseless calumnies against him are necessary to defeat him, these are habits so common as to have ceased to excite notice or comment, much less surprise or disgust. There was a time when a knight would die rather than utter a lie, or break his knightly word. The knight commander of the temple revives the old knightly spirit, and devotes himself to the old knightly worship of truth. No profession of an opinion not his own, for expediency's sake or profit, or through fear of the world's disfavor, no slander of even an enemy, no coloring or perversion of the sayings or acts of other men. No insincere speech and argument for any purpose, or under any pretext, must soil his fair escutcheon. Out of the chapter, as well as in it, he must speak the truth, and all the truth, no more and no less, or else speak not at all. To purity and innocence everywhere, the knight commander owes protection, as of old, against bold violence, or those, more guilty than murderers, who by art and treachery seek to slay the soul. And against that want and destitution that drive too many to sell their honor and innocence for food. In no age of the world has man had better opportunity than now to display those lofty virtues and that noble heroism that so distinguished the three great military and religious orders, in their youth. 
before they became corrupt and vitiated by prosperity and power. When a fearful epidemic ravages a city, and death is inhaled with the air men breathe. When the living scarcely suffice to bury the dead, most men flee in abject terror, to return and live, respectable and influential, when the danger has passed away. But the old knightly spirit of devotion and disinterestedness and contempt of death still lives, and is not extinct in the human heart. Everywhere a few are found to stand firmly and unflinchingly at their posts, to front and defy the danger, not for money, or to be honored for it, or to protect their own household, but for mere humanity, and to obey the unerring dictates of duty. They nurse the sick, breathing the pestilential atmosphere of the hospital. They explore the abodes of want and misery. With the gentleness of woman, they soften the pains of the dying, and feed the lamp of life in the convalescent. They perform the last sad offices to the dead, and they seek no other reward than the approval of their own consciences. These are the true knights of the present age, these, and the captain who remains at his post on board his shattered ship until the last boat, loaded to the water's edge with passengers and crew, has parted from her side. And then goes calmly down with her into the mysterious depths of the ocean, the pilot who stands at the wheel while the swift flames eddy round him and scorch away his life, the fireman who ascends the blazing walls. And plunges amid the flames to save the property or lives of those who have upon him no claim by tie of blood, or friendship, or even of ordinary acquaintance, these, and others like these, all men, who, set at the post of duty, stand there manfully. To die, if need be, but not to desert their post, for these, too, are sworn not to recede before the enemy. To the performance of duties and of acts of heroism like these, you have devoted yourself, my brother, by becoming a knight commander of the temple. Soldier of the truth and of loyalty. Protector of purity and innocence. Defier of plague and pestilence. Nurser of the sick and burier of the dead. Knight, preferring death to abandonment of the post of duty. Welcome to the bosom of this order. 28. Knight of the Sun, or Prince Adept. God is the author of everything that existeth, the Eternal, the Supreme, the Living, and Awful Being, from whom nothing in the universe is hidden. Make of Him no idols and visible images. But rather worship Him in the deep solitudes of sequestered forests, for He is invisible, and fills the universe as its soul, and liveth not in any temple. Light and darkness are the world's eternal ways. God is the principle of everything that exists, and the Father of all beings. He is eternal, immovable and self-existent. There are no bounds to His power. At one glance He sees the past, the present, and the future. And the procession of the builders of the pyramids, with us and our remotest descendants, is now passing before Him. He reads our thoughts before they are known to ourselves. He rules the movements of the universe and all events and revolutions are the creatures of His will. For He is the infinite mind and supreme intelligence. In the beginning man had the Word, and that Word was from God, and out of the living power which, in and by that Word, was communicated to man, came the light of his existence. Let no man speak the Word, for by it the Father made light and darkness, the world and living creatures. The Chaldean upon his plains worshipped me, and the sea-loving Phoenician. They builded me temples and towers, and burned sacrifices to me upon a thousand altars. Light was divine to them, and they thought me a god. But I am nothing, nothing. And light is the creature of the unseen god that taught the true religion to the ancient patriarchs, awful, mysterious, the absolute. Man was created pure, and God gave him truth, as he gave him light. He has lost the truth and found error. He has wandered far into darkness, and round him sin and shame hover evermore. The soul that is impure, and sinful, and defiled with earthly stains, cannot again unite with God, until, by long trials and many purifications, it is finally delivered from the old calamity. And light overcomes darkness and dethrones it, in the soul. God is the first, indestructible, eternal, uncreated, indivisible. Wisdom, justice, truth, and mercy, with harmony and love, 
are of his essence, and eternity and infinitude of extension. He is silent, and consents with mind, and is known to souls through mind alone. In him were all things originally contained, and from him all things were evolved. For out of his divine silence and rest, after an infinitude of time, was unfolded the Word, or the divine power, and then in turn the mighty, ever-acting, measureless intellect. And from the Word were evolved the myriads of suns and systems that make the universe, and fire, and light, and the electric harmony, which is the harmony of spheres and numbers, and from the intellect all souls and intellects of men. In the beginning, the universe was but one soul. He was the All, alone with time and space, and infinite as they. He had this thought, I create worlds, and lo! The universe, and the laws of harmony and motion that rule it, the expression of a thought of God, and bird and beast, and every living thing but man, and light and air, and the mysterious currents, and the dominion of mysterious numbers. He had this thought, I create man, whose soul shall be my image, and he shall rule. And lo! Man, with senses, instinct, and a reasoning mind. And yet not man. But an animal that breathed, and saw, and thought, until an immaterial spark from God's own infinite being penetrated the brain, and became the soul, and lo, man the immortal. Thus, threefold, fruit of God's thought, is man. That sees and hears and feels, that thinks and reasons, that loves and is in harmony with the universe. Before the world grew old, the primitive truth faded out from men's souls. Then man asked himself, What am I? And how and whence am I? And whither do I go? And the soul, looking inward upon itself, strove to learn whether that, I, were mere matter, its thought and reason and its passions and affections mere results of material combination. Or a material being enveloping an immaterial spirit, and further it strove, by self-examination, to learn whether that spirit were an individual essence, with a separate immortal existence, or an infinitesimal portion of a great first principle. Interpenetrating the universe and the infinitude of space, and undulating like light and heat, and so they wandered further amid the mazes of error. And imagine vain philosophies, wallowing in the sloughs of materialism and sensualism, of beating their wings vainly in the vacuum of abstractions and idealities. While yet the first oaks still put forth their leaves, man lost the perfect knowledge of the one true God, the ancient absolute existence, the infinite mind and supreme intelligence. And floated helplessly out upon the shoreless ocean of conjecture. Then the soul vexed itself with seeking to learn whether the material universe was a mere chance combination of atoms, or the work of infinite, uncreated wisdom, whether the deity was a concentrated, and the universe an extended immateriality. Or whether he was a personal existence, an omnipotent, eternal, supreme essence, regulating matter at will, or subjecting it to unchangeable laws throughout eternity, and to whom, himself infinite and eternal, space and time are unknown. With their finite limited vision they sought to learn the source and explain the existence of evil, and pain, and sorrow, and so they wandered ever deeper into the darkness, and were lost, and there was for them no longer any God. But only a great, dumb, soulless universe, full of mere emblems and symbols. You have heretofore, in some of the degrees through which you have passed, heard much of the ancient worship of the sun, the moon, and the other bright luminaries of heaven and of the elements and powers of universal nature. You have been made, to some extent, familiar with their personifications as heroes suffering or triumphant, or as personal gods or goddesses, with human characteristics and passions. And with the multitude of legends and fables that do but allegorically represent their risings and settings, their courses, their conjunctions and oppositions, their domiciles and places of exaltation. Perhaps you have supposed that we, like many who have written on these subjects, have intended to represent this worship to you as the most ancient and original worship of the first men that lived. To undeceive you, if such was your conclusion, we have caused the personifications of the great luminary of heaven, under the names by which he was known to the most ancient nations. To proclaim the old primitive truths that were known to the fathers of our race. 
before men came to worship the visible manifestations of the supreme power and magnificence and the supposed attributes of the universal deity in the elements and in the glittering armies that night regularly marshals and arrays upon the blue field of the firmament. We ask now your attention to a still further development of these truths, after we shall have added something to what we have already said in regard to the chief luminary of heaven. In explanation of the names and characteristics of the several imaginary deities that represented him among the ancient races of men. Atham or Athamari, was the chief and oldest supreme god of Upper Egypt, worshipped at Thebes. The same as the Om or Aum of the Hindus, whose name was unpronounceable, and who, like the Brem of the latter people, was, the being that was, and is, and is to come. The great god, the great omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent one, the greatest in the universe, the Lord, whose emblem was a perfect sphere, showing that he was first, last, midst, and without end. Superior to all nature gods, and all personifications of powers, elements, and luminaries, symbolized by light, the principle of life. Amun was the nature god, or spirit of nature, called by that name or amunre, and worshipped at Memphis in Lower Egypt, and in Libya, as well as in Upper Egypt. He was the Libyan Jupiter, and represented the intelligent and organizing force that develops itself in nature, when the intellectual types or forms of bodies are revealed to the senses in the world's order, by their union with matter. Whereby the generation of bodies is effected. He was the same with Neph, from whose mouth issued the Orphic egg out of which came the universe. Dionysos was the nature god of the Greeks, as Amun was of the Egyptians. In the popular legend, Dionysos, as well as Hercules, was a Theban hero, born of a mortal mother. Both were sons of Zeus, both persecuted by Hyr. But in Hercules the god is subordinate to the hero. While Dionysos, even in poetry, retains his divine character, and is identical with Iacchus, the presiding genius of the mysteries. Personification of the sun in Taurus, as his ox hoofs showed, he delivered earth from the harsh dominion of winter, conducted the mighty chorus of the stars, and the celestial revolution of the year, changed with the seasons. And underwent their periodical decay. He was the sun as invoked by the Aleans, Greek, Pi Upsilon Rho Iota Gamma Epsilon Nu Eta, ushered into the world amidst lightning and thunder, the mighty hunter of the zodiac, Zagreus the golden or ruddy-faced. The mysteries taught the doctrine of divine unity. And that power whose oneness is a seeming mystery, but really a truism, was Dionysos, the god of nature, or of that, moisture, which is the life of nature, who prepares in darkness, in Hades or Iasian, the return of life and vegetation. Or is himself the light and change evolving their varieties. In the Aegean islands he was beauties, Dardanus, Himeros or Imbrus. In Crete he appears as Iasius or even Zeus, whose orgiastic worship, remaining unveiled by the usual forms of mystery, betrayed to profane curiosity the symbols which, if irreverently contemplated, were sure to be misunderstood. He was the same with the dismembered Zagros, the son of Persephone, an ancient subterranean Dionysos, the horned progeny of Zeus in the constellation of the serpent, entrusted by his father with the thunderbolt. And encircled with the protecting dance of Curides. Through the envious artifices of here, the Titans eluded the vigilance of his guardians and tore him to pieces, but Pallas restored the still palpitating heart to his father, who commanded Apollo to bury the dismembered remains upon Parnassus. Dionysos, as well as Apollo, was leader of the Muses, the tomb of one accompanied the worship of the other, they were the same, yet different, contrasted, yet only as filling separate parts in the same drama. And the mystic and heroic personifications, the god of nature and of art, seem, at some remote period, to have proceeded from a common source. Their separation was one of form rather than of substance, and from the time when Hercules obtained initiation from Triptolemus, or Pythagoras received Orphic tenets, the two conceptions were tending to recombine. It was said that Dionysos or Poseidon had preceded Apollo in the oracular office, and Dionysos continued to be esteemed in Greek theology as healer and savior, author of life and immortality. The dispersed Pythagoreans, sons of Apollo, 
immediately betook themselves to the Orphic service of Dionysos, and there are indications that there was always something Dionysiac in the worship of Apollo. Dionysos is the sun, that liberator of the elements, and his spiritual meditation was suggested by the same imagery which made the zodiac the supposed path of the spirits in their descent and their return. His second birth, as offspring of the highest, is a type of the spiritual regeneration of man. He, as well as Apollo, was presenter of the muses and source of inspiration. His rule prescribed no unnatural mortification, its yoke was easy, and its mirthful choruses, combining the gay with the severe, did but commemorate that golden age when earth enjoyed eternal spring, and when fountains of honey, milk, and wine burst forth out of its bosom at the touch of the thyrsus. He is the liberator. Like Osiris, he frees the soul, and guides it in its migrations beyond the grave, preserving it from the risk of again falling under the slavery of matter or of some inferior animal form. All soul is part of the universal soul, whose totality is Dionysos, and he leads back the vagrant spirit to its home, and accompanies it through the purifying processes, both real and symbolical, of its earthly transit. He died and descended to the shades, and his suffering was the great secret of the mysteries, as death is the grand mystery of existence. He is the immortal suitor of Psyche, the soul, the divine influence which physically called the world into being, and which, awakening the soul from its Stygian trance, restores it from earth to heaven. Of Hermes, the Mercury of the Greeks, the Thoth of the Egyptians, and the Todd of the Phoenicians, we have heretofore spoken sufficiently at length. He was the inventor of letters and of oratory, the winged messenger of the gods, bearing the caduceus wreathed with serpents, and in our council he is represented by the orator. The Hindus called the sun Surya, the Persians, Mithras. The Egyptians, Osiris, the Assyrians and Chaldeans, Bel, the Scythians and Etruscans and the ancient Pelasgi, Archelaus or Hercules, the Phoenicians, Adonai or Adon, and the Scandinavians, Odin. From the name Surya, given by the Hindus to the sun, the sect who paid him particular adoration were called Soras. Their painters describe his car as drawn by seven green horses. In the temple of Visvesvara, at Benares, there is an ancient piece of sculpture, well executed in stone, representing him sitting in a car drawn by a horse with twelve heads. His charioteer, by whom he is preceded, is Arun, from, Hebrew, Aur the Crepusculum, or the Dawn, and among his many titles are twelve that denote his distinct powers in each of the twelve months. Those powers are called Adifiers, each of whom has a particular name. Surya is supposed frequently to have descended upon earth, in a human shape, and to have left a race on earth, equally renowned in Indian story with the Heliades of Greece. He is often styled king of the stars and planets, and thus reminds us of the Adon Spoth, lord of the starry hosts, of the Hebrew writings. Mithras was the sun god of the Persians. And was fabled to have been born in a grotto or cave, at the winter solstice. His feasts were celebrated at that period, at the moment when the sun commenced to return northward, and to increase the length of the days. This was the great feast of the Magian religion. The Roman calendar, published in the time of Constantine, at which period his worship began to gain ground in the Occident, fixed his feast day on the 25th of December. His statues and images were inscribed, Deo Soli Invicto Mithro, to the invincible sun god Mithras. Nomen Invictum Sol Mitra. Soli Omnipotenti Mithro. To him, gold, incense, and myrrh were consecrated. The, says Martianus Capella, in his hymn to the sun, the dwellers on the Nile adore as Serapis, and Memphis worships as Osiris. In the sacred rites of Persia thou art Mithras, in Phrygia, Aedes, and Libya bows down to thee as Ammon, and Phoenician Byblos as Adonis, and thus the whole world adores thee under different names. Osiris was the son of Helios, Phra, the divine offspring congenerate with the dawn, and at the same time an incarnation of Neph or Agathodemon, the good spirit, including all his possible manifestations, either physical or moral. He represented in a familiar form the beneficent aspect of all higher emanations and in him was developed the conception of a being purely good, so that it became necessary to set up another power as his adversary called Seth, Babies or Typhon. 
to account for the injurious influences of nature. With the phenomena of agriculture, supposed to be the invention of Osiris, the Egyptians connected the highest truths of their religion. The soul of man was as the seed hidden in the ground, and the mortal framework, similarly consigned to its dark resting place, awaited its restoration to life's unfailing source. Osiris was not only benefactor of the living. He was also Hades, Serapis, and Radamanthus, the monarch of the dead. Death, therefore, in Egyptian opinion, was only another name for renovation, since its god is the same power who incessantly renews vitality in nature. Every corpse duly embalmed was called Osiris, and in the grave was supposed to be united, or at least brought into approximation, to the divinity. For when God became incarnate for man's benefit, it was implied that, in analogy with his assumed character, he should submit to all the conditions of visible existence. In death, as in life, Isis and Osiris were patterns and precursors of mankind. Their sepulchres stood within the temples of the superior gods. Yet though their remains might be entombed at Memphis or Abydus, their divinity was unimpeached, and they either shone as luminaries in the heavens. Or in the unseen world presided over the futurity of the disembodied spirits whom death had brought nearer to them. The notion of a dying god, so frequent in Oriental legend, and of which we have already said much in former degrees, was the natural inference from a literal interpretation of nature worship. Since nature, which in the vicissitudes of the seasons seems to undergo a dissolution, was to the earliest religionists the express image of the deity, and at a remote period one and the same with the varied God, whose attributes were seen not only in its vitality, but in its changes. The unseen mover of the universe was rashly identified with its obvious fluctuations. The speculative deity suggested by the drama of nature, was worshipped with imitative and sympathetic rites. A period of mourning about the autumnal equinox, and of joy at the return of spring, was almost universal. Phrygians and Paphlagonians, Boeotians, and even Athenians, were all more or less attached to such observances. The Syrian damsels sat weeping for Tammuz or Adoni, mortally wounded by the tooth of winter, symbolized by the boar, its very general emblem, and these rites, and those of Aedes and Osiris, were evidently suggested by the arrest of vegetation. When the sun, descending from his altitude, seems deprived of his generating power. Osiris is a being analogous to the Syrian Adoni, and the fable of his history, which we need not here repeat, is a narrative form of the popular religion of Egypt, of which the sun is the hero, and the agricultural calendar the moral. The moist valley of the Nile, owing its fertility to the annual inundation, appeared, in contrast with the surrounding desert, like life in the midst of death. The inundation was in evident dependence on the sun, and Egypt, environed with arid deserts, like a heart within a burning censer, was the female power, dependent on the influences personified in its god. Typhon his brother, the type of darkness, drought, and sterility, threw his body into the Nile. And thus Osiris, the good, the savior, perished, in the twenty-eighth year of his life or reign, and on the seventeenth day of the month Athar, or the thirteenth of November. He is also made to die during the heats of the early summer, when, from March to July, the earth was parched with intolerable heat, vegetation was scorched, and the languid Nile exhausted. From that death he rises when the solstitial sun brings the inundation, and Egypt is filled with mirth and acclamation anticipatory of the second harvest. From his wintry death he rises with the early flowers of spring, and then the joyful festival of Osiris found was celebrated. So the pride of Jemshid, one of the Persian sun heroes, or the solar year personified, was abruptly cut off by Zohak, the tyrant of the West. He was sawn asunder by a fish bone, and immediately the brightness of Iran changed to gloom. Ganymede and Adonis, like Osiris, were hurried off in all their strength and beauty. The premature death of Linus, the burthen of the ancient lament of Greece, was like that of the Persian Siamek, the Bithynian Hylas, and the Egyptian Moneros, son of Menes or the Eternal. The elegy called Moneros was sung at Egyptian banquets, and an effigy enclosed within a diminutive sarcophagus was handed round to remind the guests of their brief tenure of existence. The beautiful Memnon, also, perished in his prime. And Enoch, 
whose early death was lamented at Iconium, lived 365 years, the number of days of the solar year, a brief space when compared with the longevity of his patriarchal kindred. The story of Osiris is reflected in those of Orpheus and Dionysos Zagros, and perhaps in the legends of Absurdus and Peleus, of Aeson, Diestus, Melisertes, Ides, and Pelops. Io is the disconsolate Isis or Niobe, and Rhea mourns her dismembered lord Hyperion, and the death of her son Helios, drowned in the Eridanus. And if Apollo and Dionysos are immortal, they had died under other names, as Orpheus, Linus, or Hyacinthus. The sepulchre of Zeus was shown in Crete. Hippolytus was associated in divine honors with Apollo, and after he had been torn to pieces like Osiris, was restored to life by the Paeonian herbs of Diana, and kept darkling in the secret grove of Egeria. Zeus deserted Olympus to visit the Ethiopians, Apollo underwent servitude to Admetus, Theseus, Perithus, Hercules, and other heroes, descended for a time to Hades. A dying nature god was exhibited in the mysteries, the Attic women fasted, sitting on the ground, during the Thesmophoria, and the Boeotians lamented the descent of Coroproserpine to the shades. But the death of the deity, as understood by the Orientals, was not inconsistent with his immortality. The temporary decline of the sons of light is but an episode in their endless continuity. And as the day and year are more convenient subdivisions of the infinite, so the fiery deaths of Phaethon or Hercules are but breaks in the same phoenix process of perpetual regeneration. By which the spirit of Osiris lives forever in the succession of the Memphian Apis. Every year witnesses the revival of Adonis. And the amber tears shed by the Heliades for the premature death of their brother, are the golden shower full of prolific hope, in which Zeus descends from the brazen vault of heaven into the bosom of the parched ground. Bal, representative or personification of the sun, was one of the great gods of Syria, Assyria, and Chaldea, and his name is found upon the monuments of Nimrod, and frequently occurs in the Hebrew writings. He was the great nature god of Babylonia, the power of heat, life, and generation. His symbol was the sun, and he was figured seated on a bull. All the accessories of his great temple at Babylon, described by Herodotus, are repeated with singular fidelity, but on a smaller scale, in the Hebrew tabernacle and temple. The golden statue alone is wanted to complete the resemblance. The word Baal or Baal, like the word Adon, signifies Lord and Master. He was also the supreme deity of the Moabites, Ammonites, and Carthaginians, and of the Sabaeans in general. The Gauls worshipped the sun under the name of Belen or Belinus, and Bela is found among the Celtic deities upon the ancient monuments. The northern ancestors of the Greeks maintained with hardier habits a more manly style of religious symbolism than the effeminate enthusiasts of the south, and had embodied in their Perseus, Hercules and Mithras. The consummation of the qualities they esteemed and exercised. Almost every nation will be found to have had a mythical being, whose strength or weakness, virtues or defects, more or less nearly described the sun's career through the seasons. There was a Celtic, a Teutonic, a Scythian, an Etruscan, a Lydian Hercules, all whose legends became tributary to those of the Greek hero. The name of Hercules was found by Herodotus to have been long familiar in Egypt and the East, and to have originally belonged to a much higher personage than the comparatively modern hero known in Greece as the son of Alcmena. The Temple of the Hercules of Tyre was reported to have been built 2,300 years before the time of Herodotus, and Hercules, whose Greek name has been sometimes supposed to be of Phoenician origin, in the sense of circuitor, i.e. rover, and perambulator, of earth, as well as Hyperion, of the sky, was the patron and model of those famous navigators who spread his altars from coast to coast through the Mediterranean, to the extremities of the west. Where Archelaus built the city of Gades, and where a perpetual fire burned in his service. He was the lineal descendant of Perseus, the luminous child of darkness, conceived within a subterranean vault of brass. And he a representation of the Persian Mithras, rearing his emblematic lions above the gates of Mycenae, and bringing the sword of Jemshid to battle against the Gorgons of the West. Mithras is similarly described in the Zendavesta as the mighty hero, the rapid runner, whose piercing eye embraces all, 
whose arm bears the club for the destruction of the Darud. Hercules Ingeniculus, who, bending on one knee, uplifts his club and tramples on the serpent's head, was, like Prometheus and Tantalus, one of the varying aspects of the struggling and declining sun. The victories of Hercules are but exhibitions of solar power which have ever to be repeated. It was in the far north, among the Hyperboreans, that, divested of his lion's skin he lay down to sleep, and for a time lost the horses of his chariot. Henceforth that northern region of gloom, called the place of the death and revival of Adonis, that Caucasus whose summit was so lofty, that, like the Indian Meru, it seemed to be both the goal and commencement of the sun's career. Became to Greek imaginations the final born of all things, the abode of winter and desolation, the pinnacle of the arch connecting the upper and lower world, and consequently the appropriate place for the banishment of Prometheus. The daughters of Israel, weeping for Tammuz, mentioned by Ezekiel, sat looking to the north, and waiting for his return from that region. It was while Sibylle with the sun god was absent among the Hyperboreans, that Phrygia, abandoned by her, suffered the horrors of famine. Delos and Delphi awaited the return of Apollo from the Hyperboreans, and Hercules brought thence to Olympia the olive. To all masons, the north has immemorially been the place of darkness, and of the great lights of the lodge, none is in the north. Mithras, the rock-born hero, Greek, Pi Epsilon Tauro Omicron Gamma Epsilon Nueda, heralded the sun's return in spring, as Prometheus, chained in his cavern, betokened the continuance of winter. The Persian beacon on the mountaintop represented the rock-born divinity enshrined in his worthiest temple, and the funeral conflagration of Hercules was the sun dying in glory behind the western hills. But though the transitory manifestation suffers or dies, the abiding and eternal power liberates and saves. It was an essential attribute of a titan, that he should arise again after his fall. For the revival of nature is as certain as its decline, and its alternations are subject to the appointment of a power which controls them both. God, says Maximus Tyrius, did not spare his own son, Hercules, or exempt him from the calamities incidental to humanity. The Theban progeny of Jove had his share of pain and trial. By vanquishing earthly difficulties he proved his affinity with heaven. His life was a continuous struggle. He fainted before Typhon in the desert. And in the commencement of the autumnal season, come Longi Rede Oranoctis, descended under the guidance of Minerva to Hades. He died. But first applied for initiation to Eumalpus, in order to foreshadow that state of religious preparation which should precede the momentous change. Even in Hades he rescued Theseus and removed the stone of Ascalaphus, reanimated the bloodless spirits, and dragged into the light of day the monster Cerberus, justly reputed invincible because an emblem of time itself. He burst the chains of the grave, for Busiris is the grave personified, and triumphant at the close as in the dawn of his career, was received after his labors into the repose of the heavenly mansions. Living forever with Zeus in the arms of eternal youth. Odin is said to have borne twelve names among the old Germans, and to have had 114 names besides. He was the Apollo of the Scandinavians, and is represented in the Voluspa as destined to slay the monstrous snake. Then the sun will be extinguished, the earth be dissolved in the ocean, the stars lose their brightness, and all nature be destroyed, in order that it may be renewed again. From the bosom of the waters a new world will emerge clad in verdure. Harvests will be seen to ripen where no seed was sown, and evil will disappear. The free fancy of the ancients, which wove the web of their myths and legends, was consecrated by faith. It had not, like the modern mind, set apart a petty sanctuary of borrowed beliefs, beyond which all the rest was common and unclean. Imagination, reason, and religion circled round the same symbol. And in all their symbols there was serious meaning, if we could but find it out. They did not devise fictions in the same vapid spirit in which we, cramped by conventionalities, read them. In endeavouring to interpret creations of fancy, fancy as well as reason must guide, and much of modern controversy arises out of heavy misapprehensions of ancient symbolism. To those ancient peoples, this earth was the centre of the universe. To them there were no other worlds, peopled with living beings, to divide the care and attention of the deity. 
To them the world was a great plain, of unknown, perhaps inconceivable limits, and the sun, the moon, and the stars journeyed above it, to give them light. The worship of the sun became the basis of all the religions of antiquity. To them light and heat were mysteries, as indeed they still are to us. As the sun caused the day, and his absence the night, as, when he journeyed northward, spring and summer followed him. And when he again turned to the south, autumn and inclement winter, and cold and long dark nights ruled the earth. As his influence produced the leaves and flowers, and ripened the harvests, and brought regular inundation, he necessarily became to them the most interesting object of the material universe. To them he was the innate fire of bodies, the fire of nature. Author of life, heat, and ignition, he was to them the efficient cause of all generation, for without him there was no movement, no existence, no form. He was to them immense, indivisible, imperishable, and everywhere present. It was their need of light, and of his creative energy, that was felt by all men, and nothing was more fearful to them than his absence. His beneficent influences caused his identification with the principle of good. And the Brahma of the Hindus, the Mithras of the Persians, and Atham, Amun, Phtha, and Osiris, of the Egyptians, the Bel of the Chaldeans, the Adonai of the Phoenicians, the Adonis and Apollo of the Greeks became but personifications of the sun. The regenerating principle, image of that fecundity which perpetuates and rejuvenates the world's existence. So too the struggle between the good and evil principles was personified, as was that between life and death, destruction and recreation, in allegories and fables which poetically represented the apparent course of the sun. Who, descending toward the southern hemisphere, was figuratively said to be conquered and put to death by darkness, or the genius of evil, but, returning again toward the northern hemisphere, he seemed to be victorious, and to arise from the tomb. This death and resurrection were also figurative of the succession of day and night, of death, which is a necessity of life, and of life which is born of death. And everywhere the ancients still saw the combat between the two principles that ruled the world. Everywhere this contest was embodied in allegories and fictitious histories, into which were ingeniously woven all the astronomical phenomena that accompanied, preceded, or followed the different movements of the sun, and the changes of seasons the approach or withdrawal of inundation. And thus grew into stature and strange proportions the histories of the contests between Typhon and Osiris, Hercules and Juno, the Titans and Jupiter, Ormazd and Araman, the rebellious angels and the deity, the evil genii and the good. And the other like fables, found not only in Asia, but in the north of Europe, and even among the Mexicans and Peruvians of the New World, carried thither, in all probability, by those Phoenician voyagers who bore thither civilization and the arts. The Scythians lamented the death of Achman, the Persians that of Zohak conquered by Faridown, the Hindus that of Suraparama slain by Supramuni, as the Scandinavians did that of Baldur, torn to pieces by the blind Hothar. The primitive idea of infinite space existed in the first men, as it exists in us. It and the idea of infinite time are the first two innate ideas. Man cannot conceive how thing can be added to thing, or event follow event, forever. The idea will ever return, that no matter how long bulk is added to bulk, there must be, still beyond, an empty void without limit, in which is nothing. In the same way the idea of time without beginning or end forces itself on him. Time, without events, is also a void, and nothing. In that empty void space the primitive men knew there was no light nor warmth. They felt, what we know scientifically, that there must be a thick darkness there, and an intensity of cold of which we have no conception. Into that void they thought the sun, the planets, and the stars went down when they set under the western horizon. Darkness was to them an enemy, a harm, a vague dread and terror. It was the very embodiment of the evil principle and out of it they said that he was formed. As the sun bent southward toward that void, they shuddered with dread, and when, at the winter solstice, he again commenced his northward march, they rejoiced and feasted. As they did at the summer solstice, when most he appeared to smile upon them in his pride of place. These days have been celebrated by all civilized nations ever since. 
the Christian has made them feast days of the church, and appropriated them to the two saints John, and Masonry has done the same. We, to whom the vast universe has become but a great machine, not instinct with a great soul, but a clockwork of proportions unimaginable, but still infinitely less than infinite, and part at least of which we with our auras can imitate. We, who have measured the distances and dimensions, and learned the specific gravity and determined the orbits of the moon and the planets, we, who know the distance to the sun, and his size, have measured the orbits of the flashing comets, and the distances of the fixed stars, and know the latter to be suns like our sun, each with his retinue of worlds, and all governed by the same unerring, mechanical laws and outwardly imposed forces, centripetal and centrifugal. We, who with our telescopes have separated the galaxy and the nebulae into other stars and groups of stars, discovered new planets, by first discovering their disturbing forces upon those already known. And learned that they all, Jupiter, Venus, and the fiery Mars, and Saturn and the others, as well as the bright, mild, and ever-changing moon, are mere dark, dull opaque clods like our earth, and not living orbs of brilliant fire and heavenly light. We, who have counted the mountains and chasms in the moon, with glasses that could distinctly reveal to us the Temple of Solomon, if it stood there in its old original glory. We, who no longer imagine that the stars control our destinies, and who can calculate the eclipses of the sun and moon, backward and forward, for ten thousand years. We, with our vastly increased conceptions of the powers of the grand architect of the universe, but our wholly material and mechanical view of that universe itself. We cannot, even in the remotest degree, feel, though we may partially and imperfectly imagine, how those great, primitive, simple-hearted children of nature felt in regard to the starry hosts, there upon the slopes of the Himalayas. On the Chaldean plains, in the Persian and Median deserts, and upon the banks of that great, strange river, the Nile. To them the universe was alive, instinct with forces and powers, mysterious and beyond their comprehension. To them it was no machine, no great system of clockwork, but a great live creature, an army of creatures, in sympathy with or inimical to man. To them, all was a mystery and a miracle, and the stars flashing overhead spoke to their hearts almost in an audible language. Jupiter, with his kingly splendors, was the emperor of the starry legions. Venus looked lovingly on the earth and blessed it, Mars, with his crimson fires, threatened war and misfortune and Saturn, cold and grave, chilled and repelled them. The ever-changing moon, faithful companion of the sun, was a constant miracle and wonder, the sun himself the visible emblem of the creative and generative power. To them the earth was a great plain, over which the sun, the moon, and the planets revolved, its servants, framed to give it light. Of the stars, some were beneficent existences that brought with them springtime and fruits and flowers, some, faithful sentinels, advising them of coming inundation, of the season of storm and of deadly winds. Some heralds of evil, which, steadily foretelling, they seemed to cause. To them the eclipses were portents of evil, and their causes hidden in mystery, and supernatural. The regular returns of the stars, the comings of Arcturus, Orion, Sirius, the Pleiades, and Aldebaran, and the journeyings of the sun, were voluntary and not mechanical to them. What wonder that astronomy became to them the most important of sciences, that those who learned it became rulers. And that vast edifices, the pyramids, the tower or temple of Bell, and other like erections everywhere in the east, were builded for astronomical purposes? And what wonder that, in their great childlike simplicity, they worshipped light, the sun, the planets, and the stars, and personified them, and eagerly believed in the histories invented for them. In that age when the capacity for belief was infinite, as indeed, if we but reflect, it still is and ever will be. If we adhered to the literally historic sense, antiquity would be a mere inexplicable, hideous chaos, and all the sages deranged, and so it would be with masonry and those who instituted it. But when these allegories are explained, they cease to be absurd fables, or facts purely local, and become lessons of wisdom for entire humanity. No one can doubt, who studies them, that they all came from a common source. 
and he greatly errs who imagines that, because the mythological legends and fables of antiquity are referable to and have their foundation in the phenomena of the heavens, and all the heathen gods are but mere names given to the sun, the stars, the planets, the zodiacal signs, the elements, the powers of nature, and universal nature herself, therefore the first men worshipped the stars, and whatever things, animate and inanimate, seemed to them to possess and exercise a power or influence evident or imagined, over human fortunes and human destiny. For ever, in all the nations, ascending to the remotest antiquity to which the light of history or the glimmerings of tradition reach, we find, seated above all the gods which represent the luminaries and the elements. And those which personify the innate powers of universal nature, a still higher deity, silent, undefined, incomprehensible, the supreme, one God, from whom all the rest flow or emanate, or by him are created. Above the time god Horus, the moon goddess or earth goddess Isis, and the sun god Osiris, of the Egyptians, was Ammonius, the nature god, and above him, again, the infinite, incomprehensible deity, Atham. Brem, the silent, self-contemplative, one original god, was the source, to the Hindus, of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Above Zeus, or before him, were Kronos and Auranus. Over the Elohayim was the great nature god Al, and still beyond him, abstract existence, Ihuh, he that is, was, and shall be. Above all the Persian deities was the unlimited time, Zeruanacharim. And over Odin and Thor was the great Scandinavian deity Alphadir. The worship of universal nature as a god was too near akin to the worship of a universal soul, to have been the instinctive creed of any savage people or rude race of men. To imagine all nature with all its apparently independent parts, as forming one consistent whole, and as itself a unit, required an amount of experience and a faculty of generalization not possessed by the rude uncivilized mind. And is but a step below the idea of a universal soul. In the beginning man had the word, and that word was from God, and out of the living power communicated to man in and by that word, came the light of his existence. God made man in his own likeness. When, by a long succession of geological changes, he had prepared the earth to be his habitation, he created him, and placed him in that part of Asia which all the old nations agreed in calling the cradle of the human race. And whence afterward the stream of human life flowed forth to India, China, Egypt, Persia, Arabia, and Phoenicia. He communicated to him a knowledge of the nature of his Creator, and of the pure, primitive, undefiled religion. The peculiar and distinctive excellence and real essence of the primitive man, and his true nature and destiny, consisted in his likeness to God. He stamped his own image upon man's soul. That image has been, in the breast of every individual man and of mankind in general, greatly altered, impaired, and defaced, but its old, half-obliterated characters are still to be found on all the pages of primitive history. And the impress, not entirely effaced, every reflecting mind may discover in its own interior. Of the original revelation to mankind, of the primitive word of divine truth, we find clear indications and scattered traces in the sacred traditions of all the primitive nations. Traces which when separately examined, appear like the broken remnants, the mysterious and hieroglyphic characters, of a mighty edifice that has been destroyed. And its fragments, like those of the old temples and palaces of Nimrod, wrought incongruously into edifices many centuries younger. And, although amid the ever-growing degeneracy of mankind, this primeval word of revelation was falsified by the admixture of various errors, and overlaid and obscured by numberless and manifold fictions, inextricably confused and disfigured almost beyond the power of recognition, still a profound inquiry will discover in heathenism many luminous vestiges of primitive truth. For the old heathenism had everywhere a foundation in truth. And if we could separate that pure intuition into nature and into the simple symbols of nature, that constituted the basis of all heathenism, from the alloy of error and the additions of fiction. Those first hieroglyphic traits of the instinctive science of the first men, would be found to agree with truth and a true knowledge of nature, and to afford an image of a free, pure, comprehensive, and finished philosophy of life. The struggle, thenceforward to be eternal, 
between the divine will and the natural will in the souls of men, commenced immediately after the creation. Cain slew his brother Abel, and went forth to people parts of the earth with an impious race, for jetters and defiers of the true God. The other descendants of the common father of the race intermarried with the daughters of Cain's descendants, and all nations preserved the remembrance of that division of the human family into the righteous and impious. In their distorted legends of the wars between the gods, and the giants and titans. When, afterward, another similar division occurred, the descendants of Seth alone preserved the true primitive religion and science, and transmitted them to posterity in the ancient symbolical character. On monuments of stone, and many nations preserved in their legendary traditions the memory of the columns of Enoch and Seth. Then the world declined from its original happy condition and fortunate estate, into idolatry and barbarism, but all nations retained the memory of that old estate. And the poets, in those early days the only historians, commemorated the succession of the ages of gold, silver, brass, and iron. In the lapse of those ages, the sacred tradition followed various courses among each of the most ancient nations. And from its original source, as from a common center, its various streams flowed downward, some diffusing through favored regions of the world fertility in life. But others soon losing themselves, and being dried up in the sterile sands of human error. After the internal and divine word originally communicated by God to man, had become obscured. After man's connection with his Creator had been broken, even outward language necessarily fell into disorder and confusion. The simple and divine truth was overlaid with various and sensual fictions, buried under elusive symbols, and at last perverted into horrible phantoms. For in the progress of idolatry it needs came to pass, that what was originally revered as the symbol of a higher principle, became gradually confounded or identified with the object itself, and was worshipped. Until this error led to a more degraded form of idolatry. The early nations received much from the primeval source of sacred tradition. But that haughty pride which seems an inherent part of human nature led each to represent these fragmentary relics of original truth as a possession peculiar to themselves. Thus exaggerating their value, and their own importance, as peculiar favorites of the deity, who had chosen them as the favored people to whom to commit these truths. To make these fragments, as far as possible, their private property, they reproduced them under peculiar forms, wrapped them up in symbols, concealed them in allegories, and invented fables to account for their own special possession of them. So that, instead of preserving in their primitive simplicity and purity these blessings of original revelation, they overlaid them with poetical ornament. And the whole wears a fabulous aspect, until by close and severe examination we discover the truth which the apparent fable contains. These being the conflicting elements in the breast of man. The old inheritance or original dowry of truth, imparted to him by God in the primitive revelation. An error, or the foundation for error, in his degraded sense and spirit now turned from God to nature, false faiths easily sprung up and grew rank and luxuriant, when the divine truth was no longer guarded with jealous care nor preserved in its pristine purity. This soon happened among most eastern nations, and especially the Indians, the Chaldeans, the Arabians, the Persians, and the Egyptians, with whom imagination, and a very deep but still sensual feeling for nature, were very predominant. The northern firmament, visible to their eyes, possesses by far the largest and most brilliant constellations, and they were more alive to the impressions made by such objects, than are the men of the present day. With the Chinese, a patriarchal, simple, and secluded people, idolatry long made but little progress. They invented writing within three or four generations after the flood, and they long preserved the memory of much of the primitive revelation. Less overlaid with fiction than those fragments which other nations have remembered. They were among those who stood nearest to the source of sacred tradition. And many passages in their old writings contain remarkable vestiges of eternal truth, and of the word of primitive revelation, the heritage of old thought, which attest to us their original eminence. But among the other early nations, a wild enthusiasm and a sensual idolatry of nature soon superseded the simple worship of the Almighty God, and set aside or disfigured the pure belief in the eternal uncreated spirit. 
the great powers and elements of nature, and the vital principle of production and procreation through all generations. Then the celestial spirits or heavenly host, the luminous armies of the stars, and the great sun, and mysterious, ever-changing moon, all of which the whole ancient world regarded not as mere globes of light or bodies of fire, but as animated living substances, potent over man's fate and destinies. Next the genii and tutelar spirits, and even the souls of the dead, received divine worship. The animals, representing the starry constellations, first reverenced as symbols merely, came to be worshipped as gods. The heavens, earth, and the operations of nature were personified, and fictitious personages invented to account for the introduction of science and arts, and the fragments of the old religious truths. And the good and bad principles personified, became also objects of worship, while, through all, still shone the silver threads of the old primitive revelation. Increasing familiarity with early Oriental records seems more and more to confirm the probability that they all originally emanated from one source. The eastern and southern slopes of the Parapismus, or Hindukush, appear to have been inhabited by kindred Iranian races, similar in habits, language, and religion. The earliest Indian and Persian deities are for the most part symbols of celestial light, their agency being regarded as an eternal warfare with the powers of winter, storm, and darkness. The religion of both was originally a worship of outward nature, especially the manifestations of fire and light, the coincidences being too marked to be merely accidental. Deva, God, is derived from the root div, to shine. Indra, like Ormazd or Ahura Mazda, is the bright firmament, Sura or Surya, the heavenly, a name of the sun, recurs in the Zend word where, the sun, whence Kur and Korshid or Korish. Uskas and Mitra are Medic as well as Zend deities and the Amschaspans or immortal holy ones of the Zendavesta may be compared with the seven rishis or Vedic star god of the constellation of the bear. Zoroastrianism, like Buddhism, was an innovation in regard to an older religion, and between the Parsi and Brahmin may be found traces of disruption as well as of coincidence. The original nature worship, in which were combined the conceptions both of a universal presence and perpetuity of action, took different directions of development, according to the difference between the Indian and Persian mind. The early shepherds of the Punjab, then called the country of the seven rivers, to whose intuitional or inspired wisdom, Veda, we owe what are perhaps the most ancient religious effusions extant in any language. Apostrophized as living beings the physical objects of their worship. First in this order of deity stands Indra, the god of the blue, or glittering, firmament, called Devaspati, father of the Devas or elemental powers, who measured out the circle of the sky, and made fast the foundations of the earth. The ideal domain of Varuna, the all-encompasser, is almost equally extensive, including air, water, night, the expanse between heaven and earth. Agni, who lives on the fire of the sacrifice, on the domestic hearth, and in the lightnings of the sky, is the great mediator between God and man. Uskas, or the dawn, leads forth the gods in the morning to make their daily repast in the intoxicating soma of nature's offertory, of which the priest could only compound, from simples a symbolical imitation. Then came the various sun gods, Adifiers or solar attributes, Surya the heavenly, Savitri the progenitor, Pahan the nourisher, Bhaga the felicitous, and Mitra the friend. The coming forth of the eternal being to the work of creation was represented as a marriage, his first emanation being a universal mother, supposed to have potentially existed with him from eternity, or, in metaphorical language, to have been, his sister and his spouse. She became eventually promoted to be the mother of the Indian trinity, of the deity under his three attributes, of creation, preservation, and change or regeneration. The most popular forms or manifestations of Vishnu the Preserver, were his successive avatars or historic impersonations, which represented the deity coming forth out of the incomprehensible mystery of his nature, and revealing himself at those critical epochs which either in the physical or moral world seemed to mark a new commencement of prosperity and order. Combating the power of evil in the various departments of nature, and in successive periods of time, the divinity, though varying in form, is ever in reality the same, whether seen in useful agricultural or social inventions. 
in traditional victories over rival creeds, or in physical changes faintly discovered through tradition, or suggested by cosmogonical theory. As Rama, the epic hero armed with sword, club, and arrows, the prototype of Hercules and Mithras, he wrestles like the Hebrew patriarch with the powers of darkness. As Krishna Govinda, the divine shepherd, he is the messenger of peace, overmastering the world by music and love. Under the human form he never ceases to be the supreme being. The foolish, he says, in Bhagavad Gita, unacquainted with my supreme nature, despise me in this human form, while men of great minds, enlightened by the divine principle within them, acknowledge me as incorruptible and before all things. And serve me with undivided hearts. I am not recognized by all, he says again, because concealed by the supernatural power which is in me, yet to me are known all things past, present, and to come, I existed before Vivaswada and Manu. I am the Most High God, the Creator of the world, the Eternal Puroaska, man-world or genius of the world. And although in my own nature I am exempt from liability to birth or death, and am Lord of all created things, yet as often as in the world virtue is enfeebled, and vice and injustice prevail. So often do I become manifest and am revealed from age to age, to save the just, to destroy the guilty, and to reassure the faltering steps of virtue. He who acknowledgeth me as even so, doth not on quitting this mortal frame enter into another, for he entereth into me, and many who have trusted in me have already entered into me, being purified by the power of wisdom. I help those who walk in my path, even as they serve me. Brahma, the creating agent, sacrificed himself, when, by descending into material forms, he became incorporated with his work. And his mythological history was interwoven with that of the universe. Thus, although spiritually allied to the Supreme, and Lord of all creatures, Prajapati, he shared the imperfection and corruption of an inferior nature, and, steeped in manifold and perishable forms, might be said, like the Greek Uranus, to be mutilated and fallen. He thus combined two characters, formless form, immortal and mortal, being and non-being, motion and rest. As incarnate intelligence, or the word, he communicated to man what had been revealed to himself by the Eternal, since he is creation's soul as well as body. Within which the Divine Word is written in those living letters which it is the prerogative of the self-conscious spirit to interpret. The fundamental principles of the religion of the Hindus consisted in the belief in the existence of one being only, of the immortality of the soul, and of a future state of rewards and punishments. Their precepts of morality inculcate the practice of virtue as necessary for procuring happiness even in this transient life, and their religious doctrines make their felicity in a future state to depend upon it. Besides their doctrine of the transmigration of souls, their dogmas may be epitomized under the following heads, first. The existence of one God, from whom all things proceed, and to whom all must return. To Him they constantly apply these expressions, the universal and eternal essence, that which has ever been and will ever continue, that which vivifies and pervades all things. He who is everywhere present, and causes the celestial bodies to revolve in the course he has prescribed to them. 2d A tripartite division of the good principle, for the purposes of creation, preservation, and renovation by change and death. 3d The necessary existence of an evil principle, occupied in counteracting the benevolent purposes of the first, in their execution by the devata or subordinate genii, to whom is entrusted the control over the various operations of nature. And this was part of their doctrine, one great and incomprehensible being has alone existed from all eternity. Everything we behold and we ourselves are portions of him. The soul, mind for intellect, of gods and men, and of all sentient creatures, are detached portions of the universal soul, to which at stated periods they are destined to return. But the mind of finite beings is impressed by one uninterrupted series of illusions, which they consider as real, until again united to the great fountain of truth. Of these illusions, the first and most essential is individuality. By its influence, when detached from its source, the soul becomes ignorant of its own nature, origin, and destiny. It considers itself as a separate existence, and no longer a spark of the divinity, a link of one immeasurable chain, 
an infinitely small but indispensable portion of one great whole. Their love of imagery caused them to personify what they conceived to be some of the attributes of God, perhaps in order to present things in a way better adapted to the comprehensions of the vulgar, than the abstruse idea of an indescribable, invisible God. And hence the invention of a Brahma, a Vishnu, and a Shiva or a Swara. These were represented under various forms, but no emblem or visible sign of Brim or Brahm, the Omnipotent, is to be found. They considered the great mystery of the existence of the Supreme Ruler of the Universe, as beyond human comprehension. Every creature endowed with the faculty of thinking, they held, must be conscious of the existence of a God, a first cause. But the attempt to explain the nature of that being, or in any way to assimilate it with our own, they considered not only a proof of folly, but of extreme impiety. The following extracts from their books will serve to show what were the real tenets of their creed. By one supreme ruler is this universe pervaded, even every world in the whole circle of nature. There is one supreme spirit, which nothing can shake, more swift than the thought of man. That supreme spirit moves at pleasure, but in itself is immovable, it is distant from us, yet near us, it pervades this whole system of worlds. Yet it is infinitely beyond it. That man who considers all beings as existing even in the Supreme Spirit, and the Supreme Spirit as pervading all beings, henceforth views no creature with contempt. All spiritual beings are the same in kind with the Supreme Spirit. The pure enlightened soul assumes a luminous form, with no gross body, with no perforation, with no veins or tendons, unblemished, untainted by sin. Itself being a ray from the infinite spirit, which knows the past and the future, which pervades all, which existed with no cause but itself, which created all things as they are, in ages most remote. That all-pervading spirit which gives light to the visible sun, even the same in kind am I, though infinitely distant in degree. Let my soul return to the immortal spirit of God, and then let my body, which ends in ashes, return to dust. O Spirit, who pervadest fire, lead us in a straight path to the riches of beatitude. Thou, O God, possessest all the treasures of knowledge. Remove each foul taint from our souls. From what root springs mortal man, when felled by the hand of death? Who can make him spring again to birth? God, who is perfect wisdom, perfect happiness. He is the final refuge of the man who has liberally bestowed his wealth, who has been firm in virtue, who knows and adores that Great One. Let us adore the supremacy of that Divine Son, the Godhead who illuminates all, who recreates all, from whom all proceed, to whom all must return, whom we invoke to direct our understandings aright, in our progress toward His holy seat. What the sun and light are to this visible world, such is truth to the intellectual and visible universe. Our souls acquire certain knowledge, by meditating on the light of truth, which emanates from the being of beings. That being, without eyes sees, without ears hears all, he knows whatever can be known, but there is none who knows him, him the wise call the great, supreme, pervading spirit. Perfect truth, perfect happiness, without equal, immortal. Absolute unity, whom neither speech can describe, nor mind comprehend, all-pervading, all-transcending, delighted with his own boundless intelligence, nor limited by space or time, without feet, running swiftly, without hands, grasping all worlds. Without eyes, all-surveying, without ears, all-hearing, without an intelligent guide, understanding all, without cause, the first of all causes, all-ruling, all-powerful, the creator, preserver, transformer of all things, such is the Great One. This the Vedas declare. May that soul of mine, which mounts aloft in my waking hours as an ethereal spark, and which, even in my slumber, has a like ascent, soaring to a great distance, as an emanation from the light of lights. Be united by devout meditation with the Spirit supremely blessed, and supremely intelligent. May that soul of mine, which was itself the primeval oblation placed within all creatures, which is a ray of perfect wisdom, which is the inextinguishable light fixed within created bodies, without which no good act is performed. In which as an immortal essence may be comprised whatever has passed, is present, or will be hereafter. 
Be united by devout meditation with the Spirit supremely blessed and supremely intelligent. The Being of Beings is the only God, eternal and everywhere present, who comprises everything. There is no God but He. The Supreme Being is invisible, incomprehensible, immovable, without figure or shape. No one has ever seen Him. Time never comprised Him, His essence pervades everything, all was derived from Him. The duty of a good man, even in the moment of his destruction, consists not only in forgiving, but even in a desire of benefiting his destroyer. As the sandal tree, in the instant of its overthrow, sheds perfume on the axe which fells it. The Vedanta and Nyaya philosophers acknowledge a supreme eternal being, and the immortality of the soul, though, like the Greeks, they differ in their ideas of those subjects. They speak of the Supreme Being as an eternal essence that pervades space, and gives life or existence. Of that universal and eternal pervading spirit, the Vedanti suppose for modifications. But as these do not change its nature, and as it would be erroneous to ascribe to each of them a distinct essence, so it is equally erroneous, they say, to imagine that the various modifications by which the all-pervading being exists, or displays his power, are individual existences. Creation is not considered as the instant production of things, but only as the manifestation of that which exists eternally in the one universal being. The Nyaya philosophers believe that spirit and matter are eternal. But they do not suppose that the world in its present form has existed from eternity, but only the primary matter from which it sprang when operated on by the Almighty Word of God, the intelligent cause and supreme being who produced the combinations or aggregations which compose the material universe. Though they believe that soul is an emanation from the Supreme Being, they distinguish it from that being, in its individual existence. Truth and intelligence are the eternal attributes of God, not, they say, of the individual soul, which is susceptible both of knowledge and ignorance, of pleasure and pain, and therefore God and it are distinct. Even when it returns to the Eternal, and attains supreme bliss, it undoubtedly does not cease. Though united to the Supreme Being, it is not absorbed in it, but still retains the abstract nature of definite or visible existence. The dissolution of the world, they say, consists in the destruction of the visible forms and qualities of things, but their material essence remains, and from it new worlds are formed by the creative energy of God. And thus the universe is dissolved and renewed in endless succession. The Jainas, a sect at Mysore and elsewhere, say that the ancient religion of India and of the whole world consisted in the belief in one God, a pure spirit, indivisible, omniscient and all-powerful. That God, having given to all things their appointed order and course of action, and to man a sufficient portion of reason, or understanding, to guide him in his conduct, leaves him to the operation of free will without the entire exercise of which he could not be held answerable for his conduct. Manil, the Hindu lawgiver, adored, not the visible, material sun, but, that divine and incomparably greater light, to use the words of the most venerable text in the Indian scripture, which illumines all, delights all, from which all proceed. To which all must return, and which alone can irradiate our intellects. He thus commences his institutes. Be it heard. This universe existed only in the first divine idea yet unexpanded, as if involved in darkness, imperceptible, undefinable, undiscoverable by reason, and undiscovered by revelation. As if it were wholly immersed in sleep. Then the soul's self-existing power, himself undiscovered, but making this world discernible, with five elements and other principles of nature, appeared with undiminished glory, expanding his idea. Or dispelling the gloom. He whom the mind alone can perceive, whose essence eludes the eternal organs, who has no visible parts, who exists from eternity, even he, the soul of all beings, whom no being can comprehend, shone forth. He, having willed to produce various beings from his own divine substance, first with a thought created the waters. From that which is, precisely the Hebrew, the first cause, not the object of sense, existing everywhere in substance not existing to our perception, without beginning or end, the A and Omega, or the I A Omega, was produced the divine male famed in all worlds under the appellation of Brahma. 
Then recapitulating the different things created by Brahma, he adds, he, meaning Brahma, the Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron, the Word, whose powers are incomprehensible, having thus created this universe, was again absorbed in the Supreme Spirit. Changing the time of energy for the time of repose. The Antariya Aranya, one of the Vedas, gives this primitive idea of the creation, in the beginning, the universe was but a soul, nothing else, active or inactive, existed. Then he had this thought, I will create worlds. And thus he created these different worlds, air, the light, mortal beings, and the waters. He had this thought, behold the worlds, I will create guardians for the worlds. So he took of the water and fashioned a being clothed with the human form. He looked upon him, and of that being so contemplated, the mouth opened like an egg, and speech came forth, and from the speech fire. The nostrils opened, and through them went the breath of respiration, and by it the air was propagated. The eyes opened, from then came a luminous ray, and from it was produced the sun. The ears dilated, from them came hearing, and from hearing space, and, after the body of man, with the senses, was formed. He, the universal soul, thus reflected, how can this body exist without me? He examined through what extremity he could penetrate it. He said to himself, If, without me, the world is articulated, breath exhales, and sight sees. If hearing hears, the skin feels, and the mind reflects, deglutition swallows, and the generative organ fulfills its functions, what then am I? And separating the suture of the cranium, he penetrated into man. Behold the great fundamental primitive truths. God, an infinite eternal soul or spirit. Matter, not eternal nor self-existent, but created, created by a thought of God. After matter, and worlds, then man, by a like thought, and finally, after endowing him with the senses and a thinking mind, a portion, a spark, of God himself penetrates the man, and becomes a living spirit within him. The Vedas thus detail the creation of the world. In the beginning there was a single God, existing of Himself. Who, after having passed an eternity absorbed in the contemplation of His own being, desired to manifest His perfections outwardly of Himself, and created the matter of the world. The four elements being thus produced, but still mingled in confusion, He breathed upon the waters, which swelled up into an immense ball in the shape of an egg, and, developing themselves became the vault and orb of heaven which encircles the earth. Having made the earth and the bodies of animal beings, this God, the essence of movement, gave to them, to animate them, a portion of His own being. Thus, the soul of everything that breathes being a fraction of the universal soul, none perishes. But each soul merely changes its mold and form, by passing successively into different bodies. Of all forms, that which most pleases the divine being is man, as nearest approaching his own perfections. When a man, absolutely disengaging himself from his senses, absorbs himself in self-contemplation, he comes to discern the divinity, and becomes part of him. The ancient Persians in many respects resembled the Hindus, in their language, their poetry, and their poetic legends. Their conquests brought them in contact with China, and they subdued Egypt and Judea. Their views of God and religion more resembled those of the Hebrews than those of any other nation. And indeed the latter people borrowed from them some prominent doctrines, that we are in the habit of regarding as an essential part of the original Hebrew creed. Of the King of Heaven and Father of Eternal Light, of the pure world of light, of the eternal word by which all things were created, of the seven mighty spirits that stand next to the throne of light and omnipotence. And of the glory of those heavenly hosts that encompass that throne, of the origin of evil, and the prince of darkness, monarch of the rebellious spirits, enemies of all good, they entertain tenets very similar to those of the Hebrews. Toward Egyptian idolatry they felt the strongest abhorrence, and under Cambyses pursued a regular plan for its utter extirpation. Xerxes, when he invaded Greece, destroyed the temples and erected fire chapels along the whole course of his march. Their religion was eminently spiritual, and the earthly fire and earthly sacrifice were but the signs and emblems of another devotion and a higher power. 
Thus the fundamental doctrine of the ancient religion of India and Persia was at first nothing more than a simple veneration of nature, its pure elements and its primary energies, the sacred fire, and above all, light, the air. Not the lower atmospheric air, but the purer and brighter air of heaven, the breath that animates and pervades the breath of mortal life. This pure and simple veneration of nature is, perhaps the most ancient, and was by far the most generally prevalent in the primitive and patriarchal world. It was not originally a deification of nature, or a denial of the sovereignty of God. Those pure elements and primitive essences of created nature offered to the first men, still in a close communication with the deity, not a likeness of resemblance, nor a mere fanciful image or a poetical figure. But a natural and true symbol of divine power. Everywhere in the Hebrew writings the pure light or sacred fire is employed as an image of the all-pervading and all-consuming power and omnipresence of the divinity. His breath was the source of life. And the faint whisper of the breeze announced to the prophet his immediate presence. All things are the progeny of one fire. The Father perfected all things, and delivered them over to the second mind, whom all nations of men call the first. Natural works coexist with the intellectual light of the Father, for it is the soul which adorns the great heaven, and which adorns it after the Father. The soul, being a bright fire, by the power of the Father, remains immortal, and is mistress of life, and fills up the recesses of the world. For the fire which is first beyond, did not shut up his power in matter by works, but by mind, for the framer of the fiery world is the mind of mind, who first sprang from mind, clothing fire with fire. Father begotten light. For he alone, having from the Father's power received the essence of intellect, is enabled to understand the mind of the Father. And to instill into all sources and principles the capacity of understanding, and of ever continuing in ceaseless revolving motion. Such was the language of Zoroaster, embodying the old Persian ideas. And the same ancient sage thus spoke of the sun and stars, the Father made the whole universe of fire and water and earth, and all nourishing ether. He fixed a great multitude of moveless stars, that stand still forever, not by compulsion and unwillingly, but without desire to wander, fire acting upon fire. He congregated the seven firmaments of the world, and so surrounded the earth with the convexity of the heavens. And therein set seven living existences, arranging their apparent disorder in regular orbits, six of them planets, and the sun, placed in the center, the seventh, in that center from which all lines, diverging which way soever, are equal. And the swift sun himself, revolving around a principal center, and ever striving to reach the central and all-pervading light, bearing with him the bright moon. And yet Zoroaster added, Measure not the journeyings of the sun, nor attempt to reduce them to rule, for he is carried by the eternal will of the Father, not for your sake. Do not endeavor to understand the impetuous course of the moon. For she runs evermore under the impulse of necessity, and the progression of the stars was not generated to serve any purpose of yours. Ormazd says to Zoroaster, in the Boundahesh, I am he who holds the star-spangled heaven in ethereal space. Who makes this sphere, which once was buried in darkness, a flood of light. Through me the earth became a world firm and lasting, the earth on which walks the Lord of the world. I am he who makes the light of sun, moon, and stars pierce the clouds. I make the corn seed, which perishing in the ground sprouts anew. I created man, whose eye is light, whose life is the breath of his nostrils. I placed within him life's unextinguishable power. Ormazd or Ahura Mazda himself represented the primal light, distinct from the heavenly bodies, yet necessary to their existence, and the source of their splendor. The Amschaspans, Amschaspenta, immortal holy ones, each presided over a special department of nature. Earth and heaven, fire and water, the sun and moon, the rivers, trees, and mountains, even the artificial divisions of the day and year were addressed in prayer as tenanted by divine beings, each separately ruling within his several sphere. Fire, in particular, that most energetic of immortal powers, the visible representative of the primal light, was invoked as son of Ormust. The sun, the Archimagus, that noblest and most powerful agent of divine power, 
who steps forth as a conqueror from the top of the terrible Alborge to rule over the world which he enlightens from the throne of Ormuzd. Was worshipped among other symbols by the name of Mithras, a beneficent and friendly genius, who, in the hymn addressed to him in the Zendavesta, bears the names given him by the Greeks, as the Invincible and the Mediator. The former, because in his daily strife with darkness he is the most active confederate of Ormuzd, the latter, as being the medium through which heaven's choicest blessings are communicated to men. He is called the Eye of Ormuzd, the effulgent hero, pursuing his course triumphantly, fertilizer of deserts, most exalted of the Eyes or Yazadas, the never sleeping, the protector of the land. When the dragon foe devastates my provinces, says Ormuzd, and afflicts them with famine, then is he struck down by the strong arm of Mithras, together with the devs of Mazandaran. With his lance and his immortal club, the sleepless chief hurls down the devs into the dust, when as mediator he interposes to guard the city from evil. Araman was by some Parsi sects considered older than Ormuzd, as darkness is older than light. He is imagined to have been unknown as a malevolent being in the early ages of the world, and the fall of man is attributed in the Boundahesh to an apostate worship of him. From which men were converted by a succession of prophets terminating with Zoroaster. Mithras is not only light, but intelligence, that luminary which, though born in obscurity, will not only dispel darkness but conquer death. The warfare through which this consummation is to be reached, is mainly carried on through the instrumentality of the Word, that ever-living emanation of the Deity, by virtue of which the world exists. And of which the revealed formulas incessantly repeated in the liturgies of the Magi are but the expression. What shall I do, cried Zoroaster, O Ormuzd, steeped in brightness, in order to battle with Daruj Araman, father of the evil law, how shall I make men pure and holy? Ormuzd answered and said, Invoke, O Zoroaster, the pure law of the servants of Ormuzd. Invoke the Ams Chaspans who shed abundance throughout the seven Keshwars. Invoke the heaven, Zeruana Akarana, the birds traveling on high, the swift wind, the earth, invoke my spirit, me who am Ahura Mazda, the purest, strongest, wisest, best of beings. Me who have the most majestic body, who through purity am supreme, whose soul is the excellent word, and ye, all people, invoke me as I have commanded Zoroaster. Ahura Mazda himself is the living word. He is called, firstborn of all things, express image of the eternal, very light of very light, the creator, who by power of the word which he never ceases to pronounce, made in 365 days the heaven and the earth. The word is said in the Yashna to have existed before all, and to be itself a Yazada, a personified object of prayer. It was revealed in Sirish, in Homa, and again, under Gushtasp, was manifested in Zoroaster. Between life and death, between sunshine and shade, Mithras is the present exemplification of the primal unity from which all things arose, and into which, through his mediation, all contrarieties will ultimately be absorbed. His annual sacrifice is the Passover of the Magi, a symbolical atonement or pledge of moral and physical regeneration. He created the world in the beginning. And as at the close of each successive year he sets free the current of life to invigorate a fresh circle of being, so in the end of all things he will bring the weary sum of ages as a hecatomb before God. Releasing by a final sacrifice the soul of nature from her perishable frame, to commence a brighter and purer existence. Iamblichus, Demise. 8, 4, says, The Egyptians are far from ascribing all things to physical causes, life and intellect they distinguish from physical being, both in man and in the universe. They place intellect and reason first as self-existent, and from these they derive the created world. As parent of generated things they constitute a demiurge, and acknowledge a vital force both in the heavens and before the heavens. They place pure intellect above and beyond the universe, and another, that is, mind revealed in the material world, consisting of one continuous mind pervading the universe, and apportioned to all its parts and spheres. The Egyptian idea, then, was that of all transcendental philosophy, that of a deity both immanent and transcendent, spirit passing into its manifestations, but not exhausted by so doing. The wisdom recorded in the canonical roles of Hermes quickly attained in this transcendental lore, 
all that human curiosity can ever discover. Thebes especially is said to have acknowledged a being without beginning or end, called Ammonius or Ammonius Neph, the all-pervading spirit or breath of nature, or perhaps even some still more lofty object of reverential reflection. Whom it was forbidden even to name. Such a being would in theory stand at the head of the three orders of gods mentioned by Herodotus, these being regarded as arbitrary classifications of similar or equal beings, arranged in successive emanations. According to an estimate of their comparative dignity. The eight great gods, or primary class, were probably manifestations of the emanated god in the several parts and powers of the universe, each potentially comprising the whole godhead. In the ancient Hermetic books, as quoted by Iamblichus, occurred the following passage in regard to the Supreme Being. Before all the things that actually exist, and before all beginnings, there is one God, prior even to the first God and King. Remaining unmoved in the singleness of his own unity, for neither is anything conceived by intellect and woven with him, nor anything else. But he is established as the exemplar of the God who is good, who is his own father, self-begotten, and his only parent. For he is something greater and prior to, and the fountain of all things, and the foundation of things conceived by the intellect, which are the first species. And from this one, the self-originated God caused himself to shine forth. For which reason he is his own father, and self-originated. For he is both a beginning and God of gods, a monad from the one, prior to substance and the beginning of substance. For from him is substantiality and substance, whence also he is called the beginning of things conceived by the intellect. These then are the most ancient beginnings of all things, which Hermes places before the ethereal and empyrean and celestial gods. Chang Tiai, or the Supreme Lord or Being, said the old Chinese creed, is the principle of everything that exists, and father of all living. He is eternal, immovable, and independent, his power knows no bounds, his sight equally comprehends the past, the present, and the future, and penetrates even to the inmost recesses of the heart. Heaven and earth are under his government, all events, all revolutions, are the consequences of his dispensation and will. He is pure, holy, and impartial, wickedness offends his sight. But he beholds with an eye of complacency the virtuous actions of men. Severe, yet just, he punishes vice in an exemplary manner even in princes and rulers. And often casts down the guilty, to crown with honor the man who walks after his own heart, and whom he raises from obscurity. Good, merciful, and full of pity, he forgives the wicked upon their repentance, and public calamities and the irregularity of the seasons are but salutary warnings, which his fatherly goodness gives to men, to induce them to reform and amend. Controlled by reason infinitely more than by the imagination, that people, occupying the extreme east of Asia, did not fall into idolatry until after the time of Confucius, and within two centuries of the birth of Christ. When the religion of Buddha or F.O. was carried thither from India. Their system was long regulated by the pure worship of God, and the foundation of their moral and political existence laid in a sound, upright reason, conformable to true ideas of the deity. They had no false gods or images, and their third emperor Hong Ti erected a temple, the first probably ever erected, to the great architect of the universe. And though they offered sacrifices to divers tutelary angels, yet they honored them infinitely less than Xam Ti or Chang Ti, the sovereign lord of the world. Confucius forbade making images or representations of the deity. He attached no idea of personality to him, but considered him as a power or principle, pervading all nature and the Chinese designated the divinity by the name of the divine reason. The Japanese believe in a supreme invisible being, not to be represented by images or worshipped in temples. They styled him Amida or Amith, and say that he is without beginning or end. That he came on earth, where he remained a thousand years, and became the redeemer of our fallen race, that he is to judge all men, and the good are to live forever, while the bad are to be condemned to hell. The Chang Ti is represented, said Confucius, under the general emblem of the visible firmament, as well as under the particular symbols of the sun, the moon, and the earth, because by their means we enjoy the gifts of the Chang Ti. The sun is the source of life and light, 
the moon illuminates the world by night. By observing the course of these luminaries, mankind are enabled to distinguish times and seasons. The ancients, with the view of connecting the act with its object, when they established the practice of sacrificing to the Changtiai, fixed the day of the winter solstice, because the sun, after having passed through the twelve places assigned apparently by the Changtiai as its annual residence, began its career anew, to distribute blessings throughout the earth. He said, the teen is the universal principle and prolific source of all things. The Changtiai is the universal principle of existence. The Arabians never possessed a poetical, high-wrought, and scientifically arranged system of polytheism. Their historical traditions had much analogy with those of the Hebrews, and coincided with them in a variety of points. The tradition of a purer faith and the simple patriarchal worship of the deity appear never to have been totally extinguished among them, nor did idolatry gain much foothold until near the time of Muhammad. Who, adopting the old primeval faith, taught again the doctrine of one God, adding to it that he was his prophet. To the mass of Hebrews, as well as to other nations, seem to have come fragments only of the primitive revelation, nor do they seem, until after their captivity among the Persians. To have concerned themselves about metaphysical speculations in regard to the divine nature and essence. Although it is evident, from the Psalms of David, that a select body among them preserved a knowledge, in regard to the deity, which was wholly unknown to the mass of the people. And those chosen few were made the medium of transition for certain truths, to later ages. Among the Greeks, the scholars of the Egyptians, all the higher ideas and severed doctrines on the divinity, his sovereign nature and infinite might, the eternal wisdom and providence that conducts and directs all things to their proper end. The infinite mind and supreme intelligence that created all things, and is raised far above external nature, all these loftier ideas and nobler doctrines were expounded more or less perfectly by Pythagoras, and Exagoras, and Socrates and developed in the most beautiful and luminous manner by Plato, and the philosophers that succeeded him. And even in the popular religion of the Greeks are many things capable of a deeper import and more spiritual signification. Though they seem only rare vestiges of ancient truth, vague presentiments, fugitive tones, and momentary flashes, revealing a belief in a supreme being, almighty creator of the universe, and common father of mankind. Much of the primitive truth was taught to Pythagoras by Zoroaster, who himself received it from the Indians. His disciples rejected the use of temples, of altars, and of statues. And smiled at the folly of those nations who imagined that the deity sprang from or had any affinity with human nature. The tops of the highest mountains were the places chosen for sacrifices. Hymns and prayers were their principal worship. The Supreme God, who fills the wide circle of heaven, was the object to whom they were addressed. Such is the testimony of Herodotus. Light they considered not so much as an object of worship, as rather the most pure and lively emblem of, and first emanation from, the eternal God. And thought that man required something visible or tangible to exalt his mind to that degree of adoration which is due to the divine being. There was a surprising similarity between the temples, priests, doctrines, and worship of the Persian Magi and the British Druids. The latter did not worship idols in the human shape, because they held that the divinity, being invisible, ought to be adored without being seen. They asserted the unity of the Godhead. Their invocations were made to the one all-preserving power. And they argued that, as this power was not matter, it must necessarily be the deity and the secret symbol used to express his name was O.I.W. They believed that the earth had sustained one general destruction by water. And would again be destroyed by fire. They admitted the doctrines of the immortality of the soul, a future state, and a day of judgment, which would be conducted on the principle of man's responsibility. They even retained some idea of the redemption of mankind through the death of a mediator. They retained a tradition of the deluge, perverted and localized. But, around these fragments of primitive truth they wove a web of idolatry, worshipped two subordinate deities under the names of H.U. and Seridwin, male and female, doubtless the same as Osiris and Isis, and held the doctrine of transmigration. 
the early inhabitants of Scandinavia believed in a God who was, the author of everything that existeth, the eternal, the ancient, the living and awful being, the searcher into concealed things, the being that never changeth. Idols and visible representations of the deity were originally forbidden, and he was directed to be worshipped in the lonely solitude of sequestered forests, where he was said to dwell, invisible, and in perfect silence. The Druids, like their eastern ancestors, paid the most sacred regard to the odd numbers, which, traced backward, ended in unity or deity, while the even numbers ended in nothing. 3 was particularly reverenced. 19, 7 plus 3 plus 3 superscript 230, 7x3 plus 3x3 and 21, 7 by 3, were numbers observed in the erection of their temples, constantly appearing in their dimensions, and the number and distances of the huge stones. They were the sole interpreters of religion. They superintended all sacrifices, for no private person could offer one without their permission. They exercised the power of excommunication. And without their concurrence war could not be declared nor peace made, and they even had the power of inflicting the punishment of death. They professed to possess a knowledge of magic, and practiced augury for the public service. They cultivated many of the liberal sciences, and particularly astronomy, the favorite science of the Orient, in which they attained considerable proficiency. They considered day as the offspring of night, and therefore made their computations by nights instead of days, and we, from them, still use the words fortnight and sin night. They knew the division of the heavens into constellations. And finally, they practiced the strictest morality, having particularly the most sacred regard for that peculiarly Masonic virtue, truth. In the Icelandic prose Edda is the following dialogue. Who is the first or eldest of the gods? In our language he is called Alfadir, Allfather, or the father of. All, but in the old Asgard he had twelve names. Where is this god? What is his power? And what hath he done to display his glory? He liveth from all ages, he governeth all realms, and swayeth all things both great and small. He hath formed heaven and earth, and the air, and all things thereunto belonging. He hath made man and given him a soul which shall live and never perish, though the body shall have mouldered away or have been burnt to ashes. And all that are righteous shall dwell with him in the place called Gimli or Vingolf. But the wicked shall go to hell and thence to Niflhel, which is below, in the ninth world. Almost every heathen nation, so far as we have any knowledge of their mythology, believed in one supreme overruling God, whose name it was not lawful to utter. When we ascend, says Muller, to the most distant heights of Greek history, the idea of God as the supreme being stands before us as a simple fact. Next to this adoration of one God, the Father of heaven, the Father of men, we find in Greece a worship of nature. The original Zeta Epsilon was the god or gods, called by the Greeks the son of time, meaning that there was no god before him, but he was eternal. Zeus, says the Orphic line, is the beginning, Zeus the middle, out of Zeus all things have been made. And the Polyides of Dodona said, Zeus was, Zeus is, Zeus will be, O great Zeus. Zeta Epsilon nu, Zeta Epsilon Sigma Tau nu, Zeta Epsilon Sigma Sigma Epsilon Tau Alpha Iota Mu Epsilon Gamma Lambda Eta Zeta Epsilon, and he was Zeta Epsilon, Kappa Delta Iota Sigma Tau Omicron, Mu Gamma Iota Sigma Tau Omicron, us, best and greatest. The Parsas, retaining the old religion taught by Zaradisht, say in their catechism, We believe in only one God, and do not believe in any beside him, who created the heavens, the earth, the angels. Our God has neither face nor form, color, nor shape, nor fixed place. There is no other like him, nor can our mind comprehend him. The tetragrammaton, or some other word covered by it, was forbidden to be pronounced. But that its pronunciation might not be lost among the Levites, the high priest uttered it in the temple once a year, on the tenth day of the month Tisri, the day of the great feast of expiation. During this ceremony, the people were directed to make a great noise, that the sacred word might not be heard by any who had not a right to it, for every other, said the Jews, would be incontinently stricken dead. The great Egyptian initiates, before the time of the Jews, did the same thing in regard to the word Isis, 
which they regarded as sacred and incommunicable. Origen says, there are names which have a natural potency. Such as those which the sages used among the Egyptians, the Magi in Persia, the Brahmins in India. What is called magic is not a vain and chimerical act, as the Stoics and Epicureans pretend. The names Sabaoth and Adonai were not made for created beings, but they belong to a mysterious theology, which goes back to the Creator. From him comes the virtue of these names, when they are arranged and pronounced according to the rules. The Hindu word Aum represented the three powers combined in their deity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, or the creating, preserving, and destroying powers, A, the first, U or OO, the second, and M, the third. This word could not be pronounced, except by the letters, for its pronunciation as one word was said to make earth tremble, and even the angels of heaven to quake for fear. The word Aum, says the Ramayana, represents, the being of beings, one. Substance in three forms, without mode, without quality, without. Passion, immense, incomprehensible, infinite, indivisible, immutable. Incorporeal, irresistible. An old passage in the Purana says, all the rites ordained in the Vedas, the sacrifices to the fire, and all other solemn purifications, shall pass away. But that which shall never pass away is the word Oom for it is the symbol of the Lord of all things. Herodotus says that the ancient Pelasgi built no temples and worshipped no idols, and had a sacred name of deity, which it was not permissible to pronounce. The Clarion Oracle, which was of unknown antiquity, being asked which of. The deities was named Ia Omega, answered in these remarkable words, the initiated are bound to conceal the mysterious secrets. Learn, then, that Ia Omega is the great God supreme, that ruleth over all. The Jews consider the true name of God to be irrecoverably lost by disuse, and regard its pronunciation as one of the mysteries that will be revealed at the coming of their Messiah. And they attribute its loss to the illegality of applying the Masoretic points to so sacred a name, by which a knowledge of the proper vowels is forgotten. It is even said, in the Gemara of Aboda Zara, that God permitted a celebrated Hebrew scholar to be burned by a Roman emperor, because he had been heard to pronounce the sacred name with points. The Jews feared that the heathen would get possession of the name, and therefore, in their copies of the scriptures, they wrote it in the Samaritan character, instead of the Hebrew or Chaldaic. That the adversary might not make an improper use of it, for they believed it capable of working miracles. And held that the wonders in Egypt were performed by Moses, in virtue of this name being engraved on his rod, and that any person who knew the true pronunciation would be able to do as much as he did. Josephus says it was unknown until God communicated it to Moses in the wilderness, and that it was lost through the wickedness of man. The followers of Muhammad have a tradition that there is a secret name of the deity which possesses wonderful properties, and that the only method of becoming acquainted with it, is by being initiated into the mysteries of the Ism Abla. H.O.M. was the first framer of the new religion among the Persians, and his name was ineffable. Amun, among the Egyptians, was a name pronounceable by none save the priests. The old Germans adored God with profound reverence, without daring to name him, or to worship him in temples. The Druids expressed the name of deity by the letters O.I.W. Among all the nations of primitive antiquity, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul was not a mere probable hypothesis, needing laborious researches and diffuse argumentation to produce conviction of its truth. Nor can we hardly give it the name of faith, for it was a lively certainty, like the feeling of one's own existence and identity, and of what is actually present. Exerting its influence on all sublunary affairs, and the motive of mightier deeds and enterprises than any mere earthly interest could inspire. Even the doctrine of transmigration of souls, universal among the ancient Hindus and Egyptians, rested on a basis of the old primitive religion, and was connected with a sentiment purely religious. It involved this noble element of truth, that since man had gone astray, and wandered far from God, he must needs make many efforts, and undergo a long and painful pilgrimage. Before he could rejoin the source of all perfection, and the firm conviction and positive certainty, that nothing defective, 
impure, or defiled with earthy stains, could enter the pure region of perfect spirits or be eternally united to God. Wherefore the soul had to pass through long trials and many purifications before it could attain that blissful end. And the end and aim of all these systems of philosophy was the final deliverance of the soul from the old calamity. The dreaded fate and frightful lot of being compelled to wander through the dark regions of nature and the various forms of the brute creation, ever changing its terrestrial shape, and its union with God. Which they held to be the lofty destiny of the wise and virtuous soul. Pythagoras gave to the doctrine of the transmigration of souls that meaning which the wise Egyptians gave to it in their mysteries, he never taught the doctrine in that literal sense in which it was understood by the people. Of that literal doctrine not the least vestige is to be found in such of his symbols as remain, nor in his precepts collected by his disciple Lysias. He held that men always remain, in their essence, such as they were created. And can degrade themselves only by vice, and ennoble themselves only by virtue. Hierarchals, one of his most zealous and celebrated disciples, expressly says that he who believes that the soul of man, after his death, will enter the body of a beast, for his vices, or become a plant for his stupidity, is deceived. And is absolutely ignorant of the eternal form of the soul, which can never change. For, always remaining man, it is said to become God or beast, through virtue or vice, though it can become neither one nor the other by nature, but solely by resemblance of its inclinations to theirs. And Timaeus of Locria, another disciple, says that to alarm men and prevent them from committing crimes, they menace them with strange humiliations and punishments. Even declaring that their souls would pass into new bodies, that of a coward into the body of a deer, that of a ravisher into the body of a wolf, that of a murderer into the body of some still more ferocious animal, and that of an impure sensualist into the body of a hog. So, too, the doctrine is explained in the Phaedo. And Lysias says, that after the soul, purified of its crimes, has left the body and returned to heaven, it is no longer subject to change or death, but enjoys an eternal felicity. According to the Indians, it returned to, and became a part of, the universal soul which animates everything. The Hindus held that Buddha descended on earth to raise all human beings up to the perfect state. He will ultimately succeed, and all, himself included, be merged in unity. Vishnu is to judge the world at the last day. It is to be consumed by fire, the sun and moon are to lose their light, the stars to fall. And a new heaven and earth to be created. The legend of the fall of the spirits, obscured and distorted, is preserved in the Hindu mythology. And their traditions acknowledged, and they revered, the succession of the first ancestors of mankind, or the holy patriarchs of the primitive world, under the name of the seven great rishis, or sages of hoary antiquity. Though they invested their history with a cloud of fictions. The Egyptians held that the soul was immortal, and that Osiris was to judge the world. And thus reads the Persian legend. After Araman shall have ruled the world until the end of time, Soziash, the promised redeemer, will come and annihilate the power of the devs, or evil spirits, awaken the dead. And sit in final judgment upon spirits and men. After that the comic Gersher will be thrown down, and a general conflagration take place, which will consume the whole world. The remains of the earth will then sink down into Duzak, and become for three periods a place of punishment for the wicked. Then, by degrees all will be pardoned, even Araman and the Devs, and admitted to the regions of bliss, and thus there will be a new heaven and a new earth. In the doctrines of Lamaism also, we find, obscured, and partly concealed in fiction, fragments of the primitive truth. For according to that faith, there is to be a final judgment before Eslik Khan, the good are to be admitted to paradise, the bad to be banished to hell, where there are eight regions burning hot and eight freezing cold. In the mysteries, wherever they were practiced, was taught that truth of the primitive revelation, the existence of one great being, infinite and pervading the universe, who was there worshipped without superstition. And his marvelous nature, essence, and attributes taught to the initiates, while the vulgar attributed his works to secondary gods, personified, and isolated from him in fabulous independence. These truths were covered from the common people as with a veil. And the mysteries were carried into every country, that, 
without disturbing the popular beliefs, truth, the arts, and the sciences might be known to those who were capable of understanding them, and maintaining the true doctrine incorrupt. Which the people, prone to superstition and idolatry, have in no age been able to do, nor, as many strange aberrations and superstitions of the present day prove, any more now than heretofore. For we need but point to the doctrines of so many sects that degrade the Creator to the rank, and assign to Him the passions of humanity, to prove that now, as always, the old truths must be committed to a few. Or they will be overlaid with fiction and error, and irretrievably lost. Though masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries, it is so in this qualified sense, that it presents but an imperfect image of their brilliancy. The ruins only of their grandeur, and a system that has experienced progressive alterations, the fruits of social events and political circumstances. Upon leaving Egypt, the mysteries were modified by the habits of the different nations among whom they were introduced. Though originally more moral and political than religious, they soon became the heritage, as it were, of the priests, and essentially religious, though in reality limiting the sacerdotal power. By teaching the intelligent laity the folly and absurdity of the creeds of the populace. They were therefore necessarily changed by the religious systems of the countries into which they were transplanted. In Greece, they were the mysteries of Ceres, in Rome, of Bona Dea, the good goddess, in Gaul, the school of Mars. In Sicily, the Academy of the Sciences, among the Hebrews, they partook of the rites and ceremonies of a religion which placed all the powers of government, and all the knowledge, in the hands of the priests and Levites. The pagodas of India, the retreats of the Magi of Persia and Chaldea, and the pyramids of Egypt, were no longer the sources at which men drank in knowledge. Each people, at all informed, had its mysteries. After a time the temples of Greece and the school of Pythagoras lost their reputation, and Freemasonry took their place. Masonry, when properly expounded, is at once the interpretation of the great book of nature, the recital of physical and astronomical phenomena, the purest philosophy, and the place of deposit, where, as in a treasury, are kept in safety all the great truths of the primitive revelation, that form the basis of all religions. In the modern degrees three things are to be recognized, the image of primeval times, the tableau of the efficient causes of the universe, and the book in which are written the morality of all peoples, and the code by which they must govern themselves if they would be prosperous. The Kabbalistic doctrine was long the religion of the sage and the savant, because, like Freemasonry, it incessantly tends toward spiritual perfection, and the fusion of the creeds and nationalities of mankind. In the eyes of the Kabbalist, all men are his brothers, and their relative ignorance is, to him, but a reason for instructing them. There were illustrious Kabbalists among the Egyptians and Greeks, whose doctrines the Orthodox Church has accepted. And among the Arabs were many, whose wisdom was not slighted by the medieval Church. The sages proudly wore the name of Kabbalists. The Kabbalah embodied a noble philosophy, pure, not mysterious, but symbolic. It taught the doctrine of the unity of God, the art of knowing and explaining the essence and operations of the Supreme Being, of spiritual powers and natural forces, and of determining their action by symbolic figures. By the arrangement of the alphabet, the combinations of numbers, the inversion of letters in writing and the concealed meanings which they claimed to discover therein. The Kabbalah is the key of the occult sciences. And the Gnostics were born of the Kabbalists. The science of numbers represented not only arithmetical qualities, but also all grandeur, all proportion. By it we necessarily arrive at the discovery of the principle or first cause of things, called at the present day the absolute. Or unity, that loftiest term to which all philosophy directs itself. That imperious necessity of the human mind, that pivot round which it is compelled to group the aggregate of its ideas, unity, this source, this center of all systematic order, this principle of existence, this central point, unknown in its essence. But manifest in its effects. Unity, that sublime center to which the chain of causes necessarily ascends, was the august idea toward which all the ideas of Pythagoras converged. He refused the title of sage, which means one who knows. 
he invented, and applied to himself that of philosopher, signifying one who is fond of or studies things secret and occult. The astronomy which he mysteriously taught, was astrology, his science of numbers was based on cabalistical principles. The ancients, and Pythagoras himself, whose real principles have not been always understood, never meant to ascribe to numbers, that is to say, to abstract signs, any special virtue. But the sages of antiquity concurred in recognizing a one first cause, material or spiritual, of the existence of the universe. Thence unity became the symbol of the supreme deity. It was made to express, to represent God. But without attributing to the mere number one any divine or supernatural virtue. The Pythagorean ideas as to particular numbers are partially expressed in the following. Lecture of the Kabbalists Chu why did you seek to be received a knight of the Kabbalah? ANS to know, by means of numbers, the admirable harmony which there is between nature and religion. Chu how were you announced? ANS by twelve raps. Chu what do they signify? ANS the twelve bases of our temporal and spiritual happiness. Chu what is a Kabbalist? ANS a man who has learned, by tradition, the sacerdotal art and the royal art. Chu what means the device, omnia in numerus sita sunt. ANS that everything lies veiled in numbers. Chu explain me that. ANS I will do so, as far as the number twelve. Your sagacity will discern the rest. Chu what signifies the unit in the number ten. ANS God, creating and animating matter, expressed by zero, which, alone, is of no value. Chu what does the unit mean? ANS in the moral order, a word incarnate in the bosom of a virgin, or religion. In the physical, a spirit embodied in the virgin earth, or nature. Chu what do you mean by the number two? ANS in the moral order, man and woman. In the physical, the active and the passive. Chu what do you mean by the number three? ANS in the moral order, the three theological virtues. In the physical, the three principles of bodies. Chu what do you mean by the number four? ANS the four cardinal virtues. The four elementary qualities. Chu what do you mean by the number five? ANS the quintessence of religion. The quintessence of matter. Chu what do you mean by the number six? ANS the theological cube. The physical cube. Chu what do you mean by the number seven? ANS the seven sacraments. The seven planets. Chu what do you mean by the number eight? ANS the small number of Elus. The small number of wise men. Chu what do you mean by the number nine? ANS the exaltation of religion. The exaltation of matter. Chu what do you mean by the number ten? ANS the ten commandments. The ten precepts of nature. Chu what do you mean by the number eleven? ANS the multiplication of religion. The multiplication of nature. Chu what do you mean by the number twelve? ANS the twelve articles of faith. The twelve apostles, foundation of the holy city, who preached throughout the whole world, for our happiness and spiritual joy. The twelve operations of nature, the twelve signs of the zodiac, foundation of the prima mobile, extending it throughout the universe for our temporal felicity. The rabbi, president of the Sanhedrin, adds, from all that you have said, it results that the unit develops itself in two, is completed in three internally, and so produces for externally. Whence, through six, seven, eight, nine, it arrives at five, half of the spherical number ten, to ascend, passing through eleven, to twelve, and to raise itself, by the number four times ten, to the number six times twelve, the final term and summit of our eternal happiness. Chu what is the generative number? ANS in the divinity, it is the unit, in created things, the number two, because the divinity, one, engenders two, and in created things two engenders one. Chu what is the most majestic number? ANS three, because it denotes the triple divine essence. Chu what is the most mysterious number? ANS four, because it contains all the mysteries of nature. Chu what is the most occult number? 
ANS5, because it is enclosed in the center of the series. Chu what is the most salutary number? ANS6, because it contains the source of our spiritual and corporeal happiness. Chu what is the most fortunate number? ANS7, because it leads us to the decade, the perfect number. Chu which is the number most to be desired? ANS8, because he who possesses it, is of the number of the Elus and Sages. Chu which is the most sublime number? ANS9, because by it religion and nature are exalted. Chu which is the most perfect number? ANS10, because it includes unity, which created everything, and zero, symbol of matter and chaos, whence everything emerged. In its figures it comprehends the created and uncreated, the commencement and the end, power and force, life and annihilation. By the study of this number, we find the relations of all things. The power of the Creator, the faculties of the creature, the Alpha and Omega of divine knowledge. Chu which is the most multiplying number? ANS 11, because with the possession of two units, we arrive at the multiplication of things. Chu which is the most solid number? ANS 12, because it is the foundation of our spiritual and temporal happiness. Chu which is the favorite number of religion and nature. ANS 4 times 10, because it enables us, rejecting everything impure, eternally to enjoy the number 6 times 12, term and summit of our felicity. Chu what is the meaning of the square? ANS it is the symbol of the four elements contained in the triangle, or the emblem of the three chemical principles, these things united form absolute unity in the primal matter. Chu what is the meaning of the center of the circumference? ANS it signifies the universal spirit, vivifying center of nature. Chu what do you mean by the quadrature of the circle? ANS the investigation of the quadrature of the circle indicates the knowledge of the four vulgar elements, which are themselves composed of elementary spirits or chief principles. As the circle, though round, is composed of lines, which escape the sight, and are seen only by the mind. Chu what is the profoundest meaning of the figure 3? ANS the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From the action of these three results the triangle within the square, and from the seven angles, the decade or perfect number. Chu which is the most confused figure? ANS 0, the emblem of chaos, formless mixture of the elements. Chu what do the four devices of the degree signify? ANS that we are to hear, see, be silent, and enjoy our happiness. The unit is the symbol of identity, equality, existence, conservation, and general harmony. The central fire, the point within the circle. Two, or the duad, is the symbol of diversity, inequality, division, separation, and vicissitudes. The figure one signifies the living man, a body standing upright. Man being the only living being possessed of this faculty. Adding to it a head, we have the letter P, the sign of paternity, creative power, and with a further addition, R, signifying man in motion, going, yens, iturus. The duad is the origin of contrasts. It is the imperfect condition into which, according to the Pythagoreans, a being falls, when he detaches himself from the monad, or God. Spiritual beings, emanating from God, are enveloped in the duad, and therefore receive only illusory impressions. As formerly the number one designated harmony, order, or the good principle, the one and only God, expressed in Latin by solus, whence the word soul, sole, symbol of this God, the number two expressed the contrary idea. There commenced the fatal knowledge of good and evil. Everything double, false, opposed to the single and sole reality, was expressed by the binary number. It expressed also that state of contrariety in which nature exists, where everything is double, night and day, light and darkness, cold and heat, wet and dry, health and sickness, error and truth, one and the other sex, etc. Hence the Romans dedicated the second month in the year to Pluto, the god of hell, and the second day of that month to the manes of the dead. The number one, with the Chinese, signified unity, harmony, order, the good principle, or God. Two, disorder, duplicity, falsehood. That people, in the earliest ages, 
based their whole philosophical system on the two primary figures or lines, one straight and unbroken, and the other broken or divided into two. Doubling which, by placing one under the other, and trebling by placing three under each other, they made the four symbols and eight kua. Which referred to the natural elements, and the primary principles of all things, and served symbolically or scientifically to express them. Plato terms unity and duality the original elements of nature, and first principles of all existence, and the oldest sacred book of the Chinese says, the great first principle has produced two equations and differences. Or primary rules of existence. But the two primary rules or two oppositions, namely Yn and Yng, or repose and motion, have produced four signs or symbols, and the four symbols have produced the eight Kua or further combinations. The interpretation of the Hermetic fable shows, among every ancient people, in their principal gods, first, one, the creating monad, then three, then three times three, three times nine, and three times twenty-seven. This triple progression has for its foundation the three ages of nature, the past, the present, and the future, or the three degrees of universal generation. Birth, life, death. Beginning, middle, end. The monad was male, because its action produces no change in itself, but only out of itself. It represented the creative principle. The duad, for a contrary reason, was female, ever changing by addition, subtraction, or multiplication. It represents matter capable of form. The union of the monad and duad produces the triad, signifying the world formed by the creative principle out of matter. Pythagoras represented the world by the right angle triangle, in which the squares of the two shortest sides are equal, added together, to the square of the longest one. As the world, as formed, is equal to the creative cause, and matter clothed with form. The ternary is the first of the unequal numbers. The triad, mysterious number, which plays so great a part in the traditions of Asia and the philosophy of Plato, image of the supreme being, includes in itself the properties of the first two numbers. It was, to the philosophers, the most excellent and favorite number, a mysterious type, revered by all antiquity, and consecrated in the mysteries, wherefore there are but three essential degrees among masons. Who venerate, in the triangle, the most august mystery, that of the sacred triad, object of their homage and study. In geometry, a line cannot represent a body absolutely perfect. As little do two lines constitute a figure demonstratively perfect. But three lines form, by their junction, the triangle, or the first figure regularly perfect, and this is why it has served and still serves to characterize the Eternal. Who, infinitely perfect in his nature, is, as universal creator, the first being, and consequently the first perfection. The quadrangle or square, perfect as it appears, being but the second perfection, can in no wise represent God. Who is the first? It is to be noted that the name of God in Latin and French, Deus, Dieu, has for its initial the delta or Greek triangle. Such is the reason, among ancients and moderns, for the consecration of the triangle, whose three sides are emblems of the three kingdoms, or nature, or God. In the center is the Hebrew jod, initial of, the animating spirit of fire, the generative principle, represented by the letter G, initial of the name of deity in the languages of the north, and the meaning whereof is generation. The first side of the triangle, offered to the study of the apprentice, is the mineral kingdom, symbolized by tub unspecified currency. The second side, the subject of the meditations of the fellow craft, is the vegetable kingdom, symbolized by shib, an ear of corn. In this reign begins the generation of bodies, and this is why the letter G. In its radiance, is presented to the eyes of the adept. The third side, the study whereof is devoted to the animal kingdom, and completes the instruction of the master, is symbolized by Mach, son of putrefaction. The figure three symbolizes the earth. It is a figure of the terrestrial bodies. The two, upper half of three, symbolizes the vegetable world, the lower half being hidden from our sight. Three also referred to harmony, friendship, peace, concord, and temperance, and was so highly esteemed among the Pythagoreans that they called it perfect harmony. 
3, 4, 10, and 12 were sacred numbers among the Etrurians, as they were among the Jews, Egyptians, and Hindus. The name of deity, in many nations, consisted of three letters, among the Greeks, iota.alpha.omega, among the Persians, HOM. Among the Hindus, AUM, among the Scandinavians, IOW. On the upright tablet of the king, discovered at Nimrod, no less than five of the thirteen names of the great gods consist of three letters each, ANU, SAN, YAV, BAR, and BL. 29. Grand Scottish Knight of Esti. Andrew. A miraculous tradition, something like that connected with the Labarum of Constantine, hallows the ancient cross of St. Andrew. Hungus, who in the ninth century reigned over the Picts in Scotland, is said to have seen in a vision, on the night before a battle, the Apostle St. Andrew, who promised him the victory. And for an assured token thereof, he told him that there should appear over the Pictish host, in the air, such a fashioned cross as he had suffered upon. Hungus, awakened, looking up at the sky, saw the promised cross, as did all of both armies. And Hungus and the Picts, after rendering thanks to the Apostle for their victory, and making their offerings with humble devotion, vowed that from thenceforth, as well they as their posterity, in time of war, would wear a cross of esteem. Andrew for their badge and cognizance. John Leslie, Bishop of Ross, says that this cross appeared to Achaeus, King of the Scots, and Hungus, King of the Picts, the night before the battle was fought betwixt them and Athelstane, King of England, as they were on their knees at prayer. Every cross of knighthood is a symbol of the nine qualities of a knight of St. Andrew of Scotland, for every order of chivalry required of its votaries the same virtues and the same excellencies. Humility, patience, and self-denial are the three essential qualities of a knight of St. Andrew of Scotland. The cross, sanctified by the blood of the holy ones who have died upon it. The cross, which Jesus of Nazareth bore, fainting, along the streets of Jerusalem and up to Calvary, upon which he cried, Not my will, O Father. But thine be done, is an unmistakable and eloquent symbol of these three virtues. He suffered upon it, because he consorted with and taught the poor and lowly, and found his disciples among the fishermen of Galilee and the despised publicans. His life was one of humility, patience, and self-denial. The hospitallers and templars took upon themselves vows of obedience, poverty, and chastity. The Lamb, which became the device of the seal of the Order of the Poor Fellow Soldiery of the Temple of Solomon, conveyed the same lessons of humility in self-denial as the original device of two knights riding a single horse. The Grand Commander warned every candidate not to be induced to enter the Order by a vain hope of enjoying earthly pomp and splendor. He told him that he would have to endure many things, sorely against his inclinations. And that he would be compelled to give up his own will, and submit entirely to that of his superiors. The religious houses of the hospitallers, despoiled by Henry VIII's worthy daughter, Elizabeth, because they would not take the oath to maintain her supremacy, had been almshouses, and dispensaries, and foundling asyla. Relieving the state of many orphan and outcast children, and ministering to their necessities, God's ravens in the wilderness, bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. They had been inns to the wayfaring man, who heard from afar the sound of the vesper bell, inviting him to repose and devotion at once, and who might sing his matins with the morning star, and go on his way rejoicing. And the knights were no less distinguished by bravery in battle, than by tenderness and zeal in their ministrations to the sick and dying. The Knights of Esti Andrew vowed to defend all orphans, maidens, and widows of good family, and wherever they heard of murderers, robbers, or masterful thieves who oppressed the people, to bring them to the laws, to the best of their power. If fortune fail you, so ran the vows of Rouge Croix, in diverse lands or countries wherever you go or ride that you find any gentleman of name and arms, which hath lost goods, in worship and knighthood, in the king's service. Or in any other place of worship, and is fallen into poverty, you shall aid, and support, and succor him, in that you may. And he ask of you your goods to his sustenance, you shall give him part of such goods as God hath sent you to your power, and as you may bear. Thus charity and generosity are even more essential qualities of a true and gentle knight, and have been so in all ages, 
and so also hath clemency. It is a mark of a noble nature to spare the conquered. Valor is then best tempered, when it can turn out a stern fortitude into the mild strains of pity, which never shines more brightly than when she is clad in steel. A martial man, compassionate, shall conquer both in peace and war. And by a twofold way, get victory with honor. The most famed men in the world have had in them both courage and compassion. An enemy reconciled hath a greater value than the long train of captives of a Roman triumph. Virtue, truth, and honor are the three most essential qualities of a knight of St. Andrew. Ye shall love God above all things, and be steadfast in the faith, it was said to the knights, in their charge, and ye shall be true unto your sovereign Lord, and true to your word and promise. Also, ye shall sit in no place where that any judgment should be given wrongfully against any body, to your knowledge. The law hath not power to strike the virtuous, nor can fortune subvert the wise. Virtue and wisdom, only, perfect and defend man. Virtue's garment is a sanctuary so sacred, that even princes dare not strike the man that is thus robed. It is the livery of the King of Heaven. It protects us when we are unarmed. And is an armor that we cannot lose, unless we be false to ourselves. It is the tenure by which we hold of Heaven, without which we are but outlaws, that cannot claim protection. Nor is there wisdom without virtue, but only a cunning way of procuring our own undoing. Peace is nigh. Where wisdom's voice has found a listening heart. Amid the howl of more than winter storms. The halcyon hears the voice of vernal hours. Already on the wing. Sir Lancelot thought no chivalry equal to that of virtue. This word means not continence only, but chiefly manliness, and so includes what in the Old English was called sufferance, that patient endurance which is like the emerald, ever green and flowering. And also that other virtue, droikshire, uprightness, a virtue so strong and so puissant, that by means of it all earthly things almost attain to be unchangeable. Even our swords are formed to remind us of the cross, and you and any other of us may live to show how much men bear and do not die. For this world is a place of sorrow and tears, of great evils and a constant calamity, and if we would win true honor in it, we must permit no virtue of a knight to become unfamiliar to us, as men's friends, coldly entreated and not greatly valued. Become mere ordinary acquaintances. We must not view with impatience or anger those who injure us. For it is very inconsistent with philosophy, and particularly with the divine wisdom that should govern every prince adept, to betray any great concern about the evils which the world, which the vulgar, whether in robes or tatters, can inflict upon the brave. The favor of God and the love of our brethren rest upon a basis which the strength of malice cannot overthrow, and with these and a generous temper and noble equanimity, we have everything. To be consistent with our professions as masons, to retain the dignity of our nature, the consciousness of our own honor, the spirit of the high chivalry that is our boast, we must disdain the evils that are only material and bodily. And therefore can be no bigger than a blow or a cousinage, than a wound or a dream. Look to the ancient days, Sir E., for excellent examples of virtue, truth, and honor, and imitate with a noble emulation the ancient knights, the first hospitallers and templars, and Bayard, and Sidney, and St. Louis. In the words of Pliny to his friend Maximus, revere the ancient glory, and that old age which in man is venerable, in cities sacred. Honor antiquity and great deeds, and detract nothing from the dignity and liberty of any one. If those who now pretend to be the great and mighty, the learned and wise of the world, shall agree in condemning the memory of the heroic knights of former ages. And in charging with folly us who think that they should be held in eternal remembrance, and that we should defend them from an evil hearing. Do you remember that if these who now claim to rule and teach the world should condemn or scorn your poor tribute of fidelity, still it is for you to bear therewith modestly, and yet not to be ashamed. Since a day will come when these who now scorn those who were of infinitely higher and finer natures than they are, will be pronounced to have lived poor and pitiful lives, and the world will make haste to forget them. But neither must you believe that, even in this very different age, of commerce and trade, of the vast riches of many, 
and the poverty of thousands, of thriving towns and tenement houses swarming with paupers, of churches with rented pews. And theaters, opera houses, custom houses, and banks, of steam and telegraph, of shops and commercial palaces, of manufactories and trades unions, the gold room and the stock exchange, of newspapers, elections, congresses, and legislatures. Of the frightful struggle for wealth and the constant wrangle for place and power, of the worship paid to the children of mammon, and covetousness of official station, there are no men of the antique stamp for you to revere. No heroic and knightly souls, that preserve their nobleness and equanimity in the chaos of conflicting passions, of ambition and baseness that welters around them. It is quite true that government tends always to become a conspiracy against liberty, or, where votes give place, to fall habitually into such hands that little which is noble or chivalric is found among those who rule and lead the people. It is true that men, in this present age, become distinguished for other things, and may have name and fame, and flatterers and lackeys, and the ablation of flattery, who would, in a knightly age, have been despised for the want in them of all true gentility and courage. And that such men are as likely as any to be voted for by the multitude, who rarely love or discern or receive truth, who run after fortune, hating what is oppressed, and ready to worship the prosperous, who love accusation and hate apologies. And who are always glad to hear and ready to believe evil of those who care not for their favor and seek not their applause. But no country can ever be holy without men of the old heroic strain and stamp, whose word no man will dare to doubt, whose virtue shines resplendent in all calamities and reverses and amid all temptations. And whose honor scintillates and glitters as purely and perfectly as the diamond, men who are not wholly the slaves of the material occupations and pleasures of life, wholly engrossed in trade, in the breeding of cattle. In the framing and enforcing of revenue regulations, in the chicanery of the law, the objects of political envy, in the base trade of the lower literature, or in the heartless, hollow vanities of an eternal dissipation. Every generation, in every country, will bequeath to those who succeed its splendid examples and great images of the dead, to be admired and imitated, there were such among the Romans, under the basest emperors. Such in England when the long Parliament ruled, such in France during its Saturnalia of irreligion and murder, and some such have made the annals of America illustrious. When things tend to that state and condition in which, in any country under the sun, the management of its affairs and the customs of its people shall require men to entertain a disbelief in the virtue and honor of those who make and those who are charged to execute the laws. When there shall be everywhere a spirit of suspicion and scorn of all who hold or seek office, or have amassed wealth. When falsehood shall no longer dishonor a man, and oaths give no assurance of true testimony, and one man hardly expect another to keep faith with him, or to utter his real sentiments. Or to be true to any party or to any cause when another approaches him with a bribe. When no one shall expect what he says to be printed without additions, perversions, and misrepresentations. When public misfortunes shall be turned to private profit, the press pander to licentiousness, the pulpit ring with political harangues, long prayers to God, eloquently delivered to admiring auditors, be written out for publication. Like poems and political speeches. When the uprightness of judges shall be doubted, and the honesty of legislators be a standing jest. Then men may come to doubt whether the old days were not better than the new, the monastery than the opera booth, the little chapel than the drinking saloon, the convents than the buildings as large as they, without their antiquity. Without their beauty, without their holiness, true Acherusian temples, where the passerby hears from within the never-ceasing din and clang and clashing of machinery, and where, when the bell rings. It is to call wretches to their work and not to their prayers. Where, says an animated writer, they keep up a perennial laudation of the devil, before furnaces which are never suffered to cool. It has been well said, that whatever withdraws us from the power of our senses, whatever makes the past, the distant, or the future, predominate over the present, advances us in the dignity of thinking beings. The modern rivals of the German spa, with their flaunting pretenses and cheap finery, their follies and frivolities, their chronicles of dances and inelegant feasts, and their bulletins of women's names and dresses. 
are poor substitutes for the monastery and church which our ancestors would have built in the deep sequestered valleys, shut up between rugged mountains and forests of somber pine. And a man of meditative temper, learned, and of poetic feeling, would be glad if he could exchange the showy hotel, amid the roar and tumult of the city, or the pretentious tavern of the country town, for one old humble monastery by the wayside. Where he could refresh himself and his horse without having to fear either pride, impertinence, or knavery, or to pay for pomp, glitter, and gaudy ornamentation. Then where he could make his orisons in a church which resounded with divine harmony, and there were no pews for wealth to isolate itself within, where he could behold the poor happy and edified and strengthened with the thoughts of heaven. Where he could then converse with learned and holy and gentle men, and before he took his departure could exalt and calm his spirits by hearing the evening song. Even Freemasonry has so multiplied its members that its obligations are less regarded than the simple promises which men make to one another upon the streets and in the markets. It clamors for public notice and courts notoriety by scores of injudicious journals, it wrangles in these, or, incorporated by law, carries its controversies into the courts. Its elections are, in some orients, conducted with all the heat and eagerness, the office-seeking and management of political struggles for place. And an empty pomp, with semi-military dress and drill, of peaceful citizens, glittering with painted banners, plumes, and jewels, gaudy and ostentatious. Commends to the public favor and female admiration an order that challenges comparison with the noble knights, the heroic soldiery encased in steel and mail, stern despisers of danger and death, who made themselves immortal memories. And won Jerusalem from the infidels and fought at Acre and Ascalon, and were the bulwark of Christendom against the Saracenic legions that swarmed after the green banner of the Prophet Muhammad. If you, Sir E., would be respectable as a knight, and not a mere tinseled pretender and knight of straw, you must practice, and be diligent and ardent in the practice of, the virtues you have professed in this degree. How can a mason vow to be tolerant, and straightway denounce another for his political opinions? How vow to be zealous and constant in the service of the order, and be as useless to it as if he were dead and buried? What does the symbolism of the compass and square profit him, if his sensual appetites and baser passions are not governed by, but domineer over his moral sense and reason, the animal over the divine, the earthly over the spiritual? Both points of the compass remaining below the square. What a hideous mockery to call one, brother, whom he maligns to the profane, lends money unto at usury, defrauds in trade, or plunders at law by chicanery. Virtue, truth, honor. Possessing these and never proving false to your vows, you will be worthy to call yourself a knight, to whom Sir John Chandos might, if living, give his hand, and whom is he. Lewis and Falkland, Tancred and Baldassar Castiglione would recognize as worthy of their friendship. Chivalry, a noble Spaniard said, is a religious order, and there are knights in the fraternity of saints in heaven. Therefore do you hear, and for all time to come, lay aside all uncharitable and repining feeling, be proof henceforward against the suggestions of undisciplined passion and inhuman zeal, learn to hate the vices and not the vicious. Be content with the discharge of the duties which your Masonic and knightly professions require, be governed by the old principles of honor and chivalry, and reverence with constancy that truth which is as sacred and immutable as God Himself. And above all, remember always, that jealousy is not our life, nor disputation our end, nor disunion our health, nor revenge our happiness. But loving kindness is all these, greater than hope, greater than faith, which can remove mountains, properly the only thing which God requires of us, and in the possession of which lies the fulfillment of all our duties. By Il Bro, Rev. W. W. Lord, 32 degrees. We are constrained to confess it to be true, that men, in this age of iron, worship gods of wood and iron and brass, the work of their own hands. The steam engine is the preeminent god of the nineteenth century, whose idolaters are everywhere, and those, who wield its tremendous power securely account themselves gods everywhere in the civilized world. Others confess it everywhere, and we must confess here, how reluctantly soever, that the age which we represent is narrowed and not enlarged by its discoveries, and has lost a larger world than it has gained. 
if we cannot go as far as the satirist who says that our self-adored century. Its broad clown's back turns broadly on the glory of the stars. We can go with him when he adds. We are gods by our own reckoning. And may as well shut up our temples. And wield on amidst the incense steam, the thunder of our cars. For we throw out acclamations of self-thanking, self-admiring. With, at every step, run faster, O oh the wondrous, wondrous age. Little heeding if our souls are wrought as nobly as our iron. Or if angels will commend us at the goal of pilgrimage. Deceived by their increased but still very imperfect knowledge and limited mastery of the brute forces of nature, men imagine that they have discovered the secrets of divine wisdom, and do not hesitate, in their own thoughts. To put human prudence in the place of the divine. Destruction was denounced by the prophets against Tyre and Sidon, Babylon, and Damascus, and Jerusalem, as a consequence of the sins of their people. But if fire now consumes or earthquake shatters or the tornado crushes a great city, those are scoffed at as fanatics and sneered at for indulging in cant, or rebuked for pharisaic uncharitableness. Who venture to believe and say that there are divine retributions and God's judgment in the ruin wrought by His mighty agencies. Science, wandering in error, struggles to remove God's providence to a distance from us and the material universe, and to substitute for its supervision and care and constant overseeing, what it calls forces, forces of nature, forces of matter. It will not see that the forces of nature are the varied actions of God. Hence it becomes antagonistic to all religion, and to all the old faith that has from the beginning illuminated human souls and constituted their consciousness of their own dignity, their divine origin, and their immortality. That faith which is the light by which the human soul is enabled, as it were, to see itself. It is not one religion only, but the basis of all religions, the truth that is in all religions, even the religious creed of masonry, that is in danger. For all religions have owed all of life that they have had, and their very being, to the foundation on which they were reared. The proposition, deemed undeniable and an axiom, that the providence of God rules directly in all the affairs and changes of material things. The science of the age has its hands upon the pillars of the temple, and rocks it to its foundation. As yet its destructive efforts have but torn from the ancient structure the worm-eaten fretwork of superstition, and shaken down some incoherent additions, owl-inhabited turrets of ignorance, and massive props that supported nothing. The structure itself will be overthrown, when, in the vivid language of a living writer, human reason leaps into the throne of God and waves her torch over the ruins of the universe. Science deals only with phenomena, and is but charlatanism when it babbles about the powers or causes that produce these, or what the things are, in essence, of which it gives us merely the names. It no more knows what light or sound or perfume is, than the Aryan cattle herders did, when they counted the dawn and fire, flame and light and heat as gods. And that atheistic science is not even half science, which ascribes the universe and its powers and forces to a system of natural laws or to an inherent energy of nature, or to causes unknown. Existing and operating independently of a divine and supernatural power. That theory would be greatly fortified, if science were always capable of protecting life and property, and, with anything like the certainty of which it boasts. Securing human interests even against the destructive agencies that man himself develops in his endeavors to subserve them. Fire, the fourth element, as the old philosophers deemed it, is his most useful and abject servant. Why cannot man prevent his ever breaking that ancient indenture, old as Prometheus, old as Adam? Why can he not be certain that at any moment his terrible subject may not break forth and tower up into his master, tyrant, destroyer? It is because it also is a power of nature, which, in ultimate trial of forces, is always superior to man. It is also because, in a different sense from that in which it is the servant of man, it is the servant of him who makes his ministers a flame of fire, and who is over nature, as nature is over man. There are powers of nature which man does not even attempt to check or control. Naples does nothing against Vesuvius. Valparaiso only trembles with the trembling earth before the coming earthquake. 
the 60,000 people who went down alive into the grave when Lisbon buried her population under both earth and sea had no knowledge of the causes, and no possible control over the power, that affected their destruction. But here the servant, and, in a sense, the creature of man, the drudge of kitchen and factory, the humble slave of the lamp, engaged in his most servile employment, appearing as a little point of flame, or perhaps a feeble spark. Suddenly snaps his brittle chain, breaks from his prison, and leaps with destructive fury, as if from the very bosom of hell, upon the doomed dwellings of fifty thousand human beings, each of whom, but a moment before, conceived himself his master. And those daring fire brigades, with their water artillery, his conquerors, it seemed, upon so many midnight fields, stand paralyzed in the presence of their conqueror. In other matters relative to human safety and interests we have observed how confident science becomes upon the strength of some slight success in the war of man with nature, and how much inclined to put itself in the place of providence, which, by the very force of the term, is the only absolute science. Near the beginning of this century, for instance, medical and sanitary science had made, in the course of a few years, great and wonderful progress. The great plague which wasted Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries, and reappeared in the 17th, had been identified with a disease which yields to enlightened treatment. And its ancient virulence was attributed to ignorance of hygiene, and the filthy habits of a former age. Another fatal and disfiguring scourge had to a great extent been checked by the discovery of vaccination. From Sangrado to Sydenham, from Paracelsus to Jenner, the healing art had indeed taken a long stride. The faculty might be excused had it then said, man is mortal, disease will be often fatal. But there shall be no more unresisted and unnecessary slaughter by infectious disease, no more general carnage, no more carnivals of terror and high festivals of death. The conceited boast would hardly have died upon the lip, when, from the mysterious depths of remotest India a spectre stalked forth, or rather a monster crept, more fearful than human I had ever yet beheld. And not with sure instinct does the tiger of the jungles, where this terrible pestilence was born, catch the scent of blood upon the air, than did this invisible destroyer, this fearful agent of almighty power. This tremendous consequence of some sufficient cause, sent the tainted atmosphere of Europe and turned westward his devastating march. The millions of dead left in his path through Asia proved nothing. They were unarmed, ignorant, defenseless, unaided by science, undefended by art. The cholera was to them inscrutable and irresistible as Azrael, the angel of death. But it came to Europe and swept the halls of science as it had swept the Indian village and the Persian Khan. It leaped as noiselessly and descended as destructively upon the population of many a high-towered, wide-paved, purified, and disinfected city of the West as upon the pariahs of Tanjore and the filthy streets of Stambul. In Vienna, Paris, London, the scenes of the Great Plague were re-enacted. The sick man started in his bed. The watcher leaped upon the floor. At the cry, Bring out your dead. The card is at the door. Was this the judgment of Almighty God? He would be bold who should say that it was, he would be bolder who should say it was not. To Paris, at least, that European Babylon, how often have the further words of the prophet to the daughter of the Chaldeans, the Lady of Kingdoms, been fulfilled. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge have perverted thee, and thou hast said in thy heart I am and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, thou shalt not know whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, desolation shall come upon thee suddenly. And as to London, it looked like judgment, if it be true that the Asiatic cholera had its origin in English avarice and cruelty, as they suppose who trace it to the tax which Warren Hastings, when Governor-General of India, imposed on salt. Thus cutting off its use from millions of the vegetable-eating races of the East, just as that disease whose spectral shadow lies always upon America's threshold, originated in the avarice and cruelty of the slave trade. Translating the African coast fever to the congenial climate of the West Indies and Southern America, the yellow fever of the former, and the vomito negro of the latter. But we should be slow to make inferences from our petty human logic to the ethics of the Almighty. Whatever the cruelty of the slave trade, or the severity of slavery on the continents or islands of America, 
we should still, in regard to its supposed consequences, be wiser, perhaps. To say with that great and simple casuist who gave the world the Christian religion, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem. Retribution bars retaliation, even in words. A city shattered, burned, destroyed, desolate, a land wasted, humiliated, made a desert in a wilderness, or wearing the thorny crown of humiliation and subjugation, is invested with the sacred prerogatives and immunities of the dead. The base human revenge of exultation at its fall and ruin should shrink back abashed in the presence of the infinite divine chastisement. Forgiveness is wiser than revenge, our Freemasonry teaches us, and it is better to love than to hate. Let him who sees in great calamities the hand of God, be silent, and fear his judgments. Men are great or small in stature as it pleases God. But their nature is great or small as it pleases themselves. Men are not born, some with great souls and some with little souls. One by taking thought cannot add to his stature, but he can enlarge his soul. By an act of the will he can make himself a moral giant, or dwarf himself to a pygmy. There are two natures in man, the higher and the lower, the great and the mean, the noble and the ignoble, and he can and must, by his own voluntary act, identify himself with the one or with the other. Freemasonry is continual effort to exalt the nobler nature over the ignoble, the spiritual over the material, the divine in man over the human. In this great effort and purpose the chivalric degrees concur and cooperate with those that teach the magnificent lessons of morality and philosophy. Magnanimity, mercy, clemency, a forgiving temper, are virtues indispensable to the character of a perfect knight. When the low and evil principle in our nature says, do not give. Reserve your beneficence for impoverished friends, or at least unobjectionable strangers, do not bestow it on successful enemies, friends only in virtue, of our misfortunes, the diviner principle whose voice spake by the despised Galilean says. Do good to them that hate you, for if ye love them, only, who love you, what reward have you? Do not publicans and sinners the same, that is, the tax-gatherers and wicked oppressors, armed Romans and renegade Jews, whom ye count your enemies? 30. Night Kadosh. We often profit more by our enemies than by our friends. We support ourselves only on that which resists, and owe our success to opposition. The best friends of Masonry in America were the Anti-Masons of 1826, and at the same time they were its worst enemies. Men are but the automata of providence, and it uses the demagogue, the fanatic, and the knave, a common trinity in republics, as its tools and instruments to effect that of which they do not dream. And which they imagine themselves commissioned to prevent. The anti-Masons, traitors and perjurers some, and some mere political knaves, purified masonry by persecution, and so proved to be its benefactors, for that which is persecuted, grows. To them its present popularity is due, the cheapening of its degrees, the invasion of its lodges, that are no longer sanctuaries, by the multitude, its pomp and pageantry in overdone display. An hundred years ago it had become known that the, Hebrew, were the Templars under a veil, and therefore the degree was proscribed, and, ceasing to be worked, became a mere brief and formal ceremony, under another name. Now, from the tomb in which after his murders he rotted, Clement V howls against the successors of his victims, in the allocution of Pio Nono against the Freemasons. The ghosts of the dead Templars haunt the Vatican and disturb the slumbers of the paralyzed papacy, which, dreading the dead, shrieks out its excommunications and impotent anathemas against the living. It is a declaration of war, and was needed to arouse apathy and inertness to action. An enemy of the Templars shall tell us the secret of this papal hostility against an order that has existed for centuries in despite of its anathemas, and has its sanctuaries and asyla even in Rome. It will be easy, as we read, to separate the false from the true, the audacious conjectures from the simple facts. A power that ruled without antagonism and without concurrence, and consequently without control, proved fatal to the sacerdotal royalties. While the republics, on the other hand, had perished by the conflict of liberties and franchises, 
which, in the absence of all duty hierarchically sanctioned and enforced, had soon become mere tyrannies, rivals one of the other. To find a stable medium between these two abysses, the idea of the Christian hierophants was to create a society devoted to abnegation by solemn vows, protected by severe regulations. Which should be recruited by initiation, and which, sole depositary of the great religious and social secrets, should make kings and pontiffs, without exposing it to the corruptions of power. In that was the secret of that kingdom of Jesus Christ, which, without being of this world, would govern all its grandeurs. This idea presided at the foundation of the great religious orders, so often at war with the secular authorities, ecclesiastical or civil. Its realization was also the dream of the dissident sects of Gnostics or Illuminati who pretended to connect their faith with the primitive tradition of the Christianity of St. John. It at length became a menace for the Church and society, when a rich and dissolute order, initiated in the mysterious doctrines of the Kabbalah, seemed disposed to turn against legitimate authority the conservative principle of hierarchy, and threatened the entire world with an immense revolution. The Templars, whose history is so imperfectly known, were those terrible conspirators. In 1118, nine knights crusaders in the East, among whom were Geoffroy de saint Omer and Hugues de Payens, consecrated themselves to religion, and took an oath between the hands of the Patriarch of Constantinople. A sea always secretly or openly hostile to that of Rome from the time of Photius. The avowed object of the Templars was to protect the Christians who came to visit the holy places, their secret object was the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon on the model prophesied by Ezekiel. This rebuilding, formally predicted by the Judaizing mystics of the earlier ages, had become the secret dream of the patriarchs of the Orient. The Temple of Solomon, rebuilt and consecrated to the Catholic worship would become, in effect, the metropolis of the universe, the East would prevail over the West, and the patriarchs of Constantinople would possess themselves of the papal power. The Templars, or poor fellow soldiery of the Holy House of the Temple intended to be rebuilt, took as their models, in the Bible, the warrior masons of Zorobabel, who worked, holding the sword in one hand and the trowel in the other. Therefore it was that the sword and the trowel were the insignia of the Templars, who subsequently, as will be seen, concealed themselves under the name of Brethren Masons. This name, Frères Macons in the French, adopted by way of secret reference to the builders of the Second Temple, was corrupted in English into Freemasons, as Pythagore de Crotone was into Peter Gower of Groton in England. Chiram or Kuram, a name misrendered into Hiram, from an artificer in brass and other metals, became the chief builder of the Heikel Kadosh, the holy house, of the temple, the Epsilon Rho Omicron Delta Omicron Mu Omicron. And the words Bonai and Banaim yet appear in the Masonic degrees, meaning builder and builders. The trowel of the Templars is quadruple, and the triangular plates of it are arranged in the form of a cross, making the Kabbalistic pantacle known by the name of the Cross of the East. The Knight of the East, and the Knight of the East and West, have in their titles secret allusions to the Templars of whom they were at first the successors. The secret thought of Hugues de Payens, in founding his order, was not exactly to serve the ambition of the patriarchs of Constantinople. There existed at that period in the East a sect of Johannite Christians, who claimed to be the only true initiates into the real mysteries of the religion of the Saviour. They pretended to know the real history of Jesus the Anointed, and, adopting in part the Jewish traditions and the tales of the Talmud, they held that the facts recounted in the Evangels are but allegories, the key of which St. John gives. In saying that the world might be filled with the books that could be written upon the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. Words which, they thought, would be only a ridiculous exaggeration, if he were not speaking of an allegory in a legend, that might be varied and prolonged to infinity. The Johannites ascribed to St. John the foundation of their secret church, and the grand pontiffs of the sect assumed the title of Christos, anointed, or consecrated, and claimed to have succeeded one another from St. John by an uninterrupted succession of pontifical powers. He who, at the period of the foundation of the Order of the Temple, claimed these imaginary prerogatives, was named Theoclet. He knew Hugues D. E. Payens, he initiated him into the mysteries and hopes of his pretended church, he seduced him by the notions of sovereign priesthood and supreme royalty, and finally designated him as his successor. 
Thus the Order of Knights of the Temple was at its very origin devoted to the cause of opposition to the tiara of Rome and the crowns of kings, and the apostolate of Kabbalistic Gnosticism was vested in its chiefs. For Saint John himself was the father of the Gnostics, and the current translation of his polemic against the heretical of his sect and the pagans who denied that Christ was the Word, is throughout a misrepresentation, or misunderstanding at least. Of the whole spirit of that evangel. The tendencies and tenets of the order were enveloped in profound mystery, and it externally professed the most perfect orthodoxy. The chiefs alone knew the aim of the order, the subalterns followed them without distrust. To acquire influence and wealth, then to intrigue, and at need to fight, to establish the Johann Knight or Gnostic and Kabbalistic dogma, were the object and means proposed to the initiated brethren. The papacy and the rival monarchies, they said to them, are sold and bought in these days, become corrupt, and tomorrow, perhaps, will destroy each other. All that will become the heritage of the temple, the world will soon come to us for its sovereigns and pontiffs. We shall constitute the equilibrium of the universe, and be rulers over the masters of the world. The Templars, like all other secret orders and associations, had two doctrines, one concealed and reserved for the masters, which was Johannism, the other public, which was the Roman Catholic. Thus they deceived the adversaries whom they sought to supplant. Hence Freemasonry, vulgarly imagined to have begun with the Dionysian architects or the German stoneworkers, adopted St. John the Evangelist as one of its patrons, associating with him, in order not to arouse the suspicions of Rome. St. John the Baptist, and thus covertly proclaiming itself the child of the Kabbalah and Essenism together. For the Johannism of the Adepts was the Kabbalah of the earlier Gnostics, degenerating afterward into those heretical forms which Gnosticism developed, so that even Manes had his followers among them. Many adopted his doctrines of the two principles, the recollection of which is perpetuated by the handle of the dagger and the tessellated pavement or floor of the lodge, stupidly called, the indented tessel and represented by great hanging tassels, when it really means a tesserated floor, from the Latin tessera, of white and black lozenges, with a necessarily denticulate or indented border or edging. And wherever, in the higher degrees, the two colors white and black, are in juxtaposition, the two principles of Zoroaster and Manes are alluded to. With others the doctrine became a mystic pantheism, descended from that of the Brahmins, and even pushed to an idolatry of nature and hatred of every revealed dogma. To all this the absurd reading of the established church, taking literally the figurative, allegorical, and mythical language of a collection of oriental books of different ages, directly and inevitably led. The same result long after followed the folly of regarding the Hebrew books as if they had been written by the unimaginative, hard, practical intellect of the England of James I and the bigoted stolidity of Scottish Presbyterianism. The better to succeed and win partisans, the Templars sympathized with regrets for dethroned creeds and encouraged the hopes of new worships. Promising to all liberty of conscience and a new orthodoxy that should be the synthesis of all the persecuted creeds. It is absurd to suppose that men of intellect adored a monstrous idol called Baphomet, or recognized Muhammad as an inspired prophet. Their symbolism, invented ages before, to conceal what it was dangerous to avow, was of course misunderstood by those who were not adepts, and to their enemies seemed to be pantheistic. The calf of gold, made by Aaron for the Israelites, was but one of the oxen under the laver of bronze, and the cherubim on the propitiatory, misunderstood. The symbols of the wise always become the idols of the ignorant multitude. What the chiefs of the order really believed and taught, is indicated to the adepts by the hints contained in the high degrees of Freemasonry, and by the symbols which only the adepts understand. The blue degrees are but the outer court or portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them. But it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. The whole body of the royal and sacerdotal art was hidden so carefully, centuries since, in the high degrees, as that it is even yet impossible to solve many of the enigmas which they contain. It is well enough for the mass of those called masons, to imagine that all is contained in the blue degrees, 
and whose attempts to undeceive them will labor in vain, and without any true reward violate his obligations as an adept. Masonry is the veritable sphinx, buried to the head in the sands heaped round it by the ages. The seeds of decay were sown in the order of the temple at its origin. Hypocrisy is a mortal disease. It had conceived a great work which it was incapable of executing, because it knew neither humility nor personal abnegation, because Rome was then invincible, and because the later chiefs of the order did not comprehend its mission. Moreover, the Templars were in general uneducated, and capable only of wielding the sword, with no qualifications for governing, and at need in chaining, that queen of the world called opinion. The doctrines of the chiefs would, if expounded to the masses, have seemed to them the babblings of folly. The symbols of the wise are the idols of the vulgar, or else as meaningless as the hieroglyphics of Egypt to the nomadic Arabs. There must always be a commonplace interpretation for the mass of initiates, of the symbols that are eloquent to the adepts. Hughes de Payens himself had not that keen and far-sighted intellect or that grandeur of purpose which afterward distinguished the military founder of another soldiery that became formidable to kings. The Templars were unintelligent and therefore unsuccessful Jesuits. Their watchword was, to become wealthy, in order to buy the world. They became so, and in 1312 they possessed in Europe alone more than 9,000 seigneuries. Riches were the shoal on which they were wrecked. They became insolent, and unwisely showed their contempt for the religious and social institutions which they aimed to overthrow. Their ambition was fatal to them. Their projects were divined and prevented. Rome, more intolerant of heresy than of vice and crime, came to fear the order, and fear is always cruel. It has always deemed philosophical truth the most dangerous of heresies, and has never been at a loss for a false accusation, by means of which to crush free thought. Pope Clement V. And King Philip Lobel gave the signal to Europe, and the Templars, taken as it were in an immense net, were arrested, disarmed, and cast into prison. Never was a coup d'état accomplished with a more formidable concert of action. The whole world was struck with stupor, and eagerly waited for the strange revelations of a process that was to echo through so many ages. It was impossible to unfold to the people the conspiracy of the Templars against the thrones and the tiara. It was impossible to expose to them the doctrines of the chiefs of the order. This would have been to initiate the multitude into the secrets of the masters, and to have uplifted the veil of Isis. Recourse was therefore had to the charge of magic, and denouncers and false witnesses were easily found. When the temporal and spiritual tyrannies unite to crush a victim they never want for serviceable instruments. The Templars were gravely accused of spitting upon Christ and denying God at their receptions, of gross obscenities, conversations with female devils, and the worship of a monstrous idol. The end of the drama is well known, and how Jacques de Molay and his fellows perished in the flames. But before his execution, the chief of the doomed order organized and instituted what afterward came to be called the occult, hermetic, or Scottish masonry. In the gloom of his prison, the Grand Master created for metropolitan lodges, at Naples for the east, at Edinburgh for the west, at Stockholm for the north, and at Paris for the south. The initials of his name, J. B. M. Found in the same order in the first three degrees, are but one of the many internal and cogent proofs that such was the origin of modern Freemasonry. The legend of Osiris was revived and adopted. To symbolize the destruction of the order, and the resurrection of Kurum, slain in the body of the temple, of Kurm Abai, the master, as the martyr of fidelity to obligation, of truth and conscience. Prophesied the restoration to life of the buried association. The Pope and the King soon after perished in a strange and sudden manner. Squin de Florian, the chief denouncer of the order, died assassinated. In breaking the sword of the Templars, they made of it a poniard. And their proscribed trowels thenceforward built only tombs. The order disappeared at once. Its estates and wealth were confiscated, and it seemed to have ceased to exist. Nevertheless it lived, under other names and governed by unknown chiefs, revealing itself only to those, who, in passing through a series of degrees, had proven themselves worthy to be entrusted with the dangerous secret. 
The modern orders that style themselves Templars have assumed a name to which they have not the shadow of a title. The successors of the ancient adepts Rosecroy, abandoning by degrees the austere and hierarchical science of their ancestors in initiation, became a mystic sect, united with many of the Templars, the dogmas of the two intermingling, and believed themselves to be the sole depositaries of the secrets of the Gospel of Asti. John, seeing in its recitals an allegorical series of rites proper to complete the initiation. The initiates, in fact, thought in the 18th century that their time had arrived, some to found a new hierarchy, others to overturn all authority, and to press down all the summits of the social order under the level of equality. The mystical meanings of the rose as a symbol are to be looked for in the Kabbalistic commentaries on the canticles. The rose was for the initiates the living and blooming symbol of the revelation of the harmonies of being. It was the emblem of beauty, life, love, and pleasure. Flamel or the Book of the Jew Abraham, made it the hieroglyphical sign of the accomplishment of the great work. Such is the key of the Roman de la Rose. The conquest of the Rose was the problem propounded to science by initiation, while religion was laboring to prepare and establish the universal triumph, exclusive and definitive, of the Cross. To unite the Rose to the Cross, was the problem proposed by the High Initiation, and in fact the occult philosophy being the universal synthesis, ought to explain all the phenomena of being. Religion, considered solely as a physiological fact, is the revelation and satisfaction of a necessity of souls. Its existence is a scientific fact, to deny it, would be to deny humanity itself. The Rosecroy adepts respected the dominant, hierarchical, and revealed religion. Consequently they could no more be the enemies of the papacy than of legitimate monarchy. And if they conspired against the popes and kings, it was because they considered them personally as apostates from duty and supreme favors of anarchy. What, in fact, is a despot, spiritual or temporal, but a crowned anarchist? One of the magnificent pantacles that express the esoteric and unutterable part of science, is a rose of light, in the center of which a human form extends its arms in the form of a cross. Commentaries and studies have been multiplied upon the Divine Comedy, the work of Dante, and yet no one, so far as we know, has pointed out its especial character. The work of the Great Gibellin is a declaration of war against the papacy, by bold revelations of the mysteries. The epic of Dante is Johann Knight and Gnostic, an audacious application, like that of the Apocalypse, of the figures and numbers of the Kabbalah to the Christian dogmas, and a secret negation of everything absolute in these dogmas. His journey through the supernatural worlds is accomplished like the initiation into the mysteries of Eleusis and Thebes. He escapes from that gulf of hell over the gate of which the sentence of despair was written, by reversing the positions of his head and feet, that is to say, by accepting the direct opposite of the Catholic dogma, and then he reascends to the light, by using the devil himself as a monstrous ladder. Faust ascends to heaven, by stepping on the head of the vanquished Mephistopheles. Hell is impassable for those only who know not how to turn back from it. We free ourselves from its bondage by audacity. His hell is but a negative purgatory. His heaven is composed of a series of Kabbalistic circles, divided by a cross, like the pantacle of Ezekiel. In the center of this cross blooms a rose, and we see the symbol of the adepts of the rose croix for the first time publicly expounded and almost categorically explained. For the first time, because Guillaume de Loris, who died in 1260, five years before the birth of Alighieri, had not completed his Roman de la Rose, which was continued by Chopinel, a half century afterward. One is astonished to discover that the Roman de la Rose and the Divina Commedia are two opposite forms of one and the same work, initiation into independence of spirit, a satire on all contemporary institutions. And the allegorical formula of the great secrets of the Society of the Roses Croix. The important manifestations of occultism coincide with the period of the fall of the Templars, since Jean de Mung or Chopinel, contemporary of the old age of Dante, flourished during the best years of his life at the court of Philippe le Bel. The Roman de la Rose is the epic of old France. It is a profound book, under the form of levity, a revelation as learned as that of Apuleius, of the mysteries of occultism. The Rose of Flamel, 
that of Jean de Mung, and that of Dante, grew on the same stem. Swedenborg's system was nothing else than the Kabbalah, minus the principle of the hierarchy. It is the temple, without the keystone and the foundation. Cagliostro was the agent of the Templars, and therefore wrote to the Freemasons of London that the time had come to begin the work of rebuilding the Temple of the Eternal. He had introduced into Masonry a new rite called the Egyptian, and endeavored to resuscitate the mysterious worship of Isis. The three letters L, P, D on his seal, were the initials of the words Lilia Pedibus de True. Tread underfoot the lilies, of France, and a Masonic medal of the 16th or 17th century has upon it a sword cutting off the stalk of a lily, and the words, Talum dabit ultio mesum, such harvest revenge will give. A lodge inaugurated under the auspices of Rousseau, the fanatic of Geneva, became the center of the revolutionary movement in France. And a prince of the blood royal went thither to swear the destruction of the successors of Philippe le Bel on the tomb of Jacques de Molay. The registers of the Order of Templars attest that the regent, the Duc de Orleans, was grand master of that formidable secret society, and that his successors were the Duc de Maine, the Prince of Bourbon Condé, and the Duc de Cosprissac. The Templars compromitted the king, they saved him from the rage of the people, to exasperate that rage and bring on the catastrophe prepared for centuries, it was a scaffold that the vengeance of the Templars demanded. The secret movers of the French Revolution had sworn to overturn the throne and the altar upon the tomb of Jacques de Molay. When Louis XVI was executed, half the work was done. And thenceforward the army of the temple was to direct all its efforts against the Pope. Jacques de Molay and his companions were perhaps martyrs, but their avengers dishonored their memory. Royalty was regenerated on the scaffold of Louis XVI. The Church triumphed in the captivity of Pius VI, carried a prisoner to Valence, and dying of fatigue and sorrow, but the successors of the ancient knights of the Temple perished, overwhelmed in their fatal victory. Consistory 31. Grand Inspector Inquisitor Commander Inspector Inquisitor To hear patiently, to weigh deliberately and dispassionately, and to decide impartially, these are the chief duties of a judge. After the lessons you have received, I need not further enlarge upon them. You will be ever eloquently reminded of them by the furniture upon our altar, and the decorations of the tribunal. The Holy Bible will remind you of your obligation. And that as you judge here below, so you will be yourself judged hereafter, by one who has not to submit, like an earthly judge, to the sad necessity of inferring the motives, intentions, and purposes of men, of which all crime essentially consists, from the uncertain and often unsafe testimony of their acts and words. As men in thick darkness grope their way, with hands outstretched before them, but before whom every thought, feeling, impulse, and intention of every soul that now is, or ever was, or ever will be on earth, is. And ever will be through the whole infinite duration of eternity, present and visible. The square and compass, the plumb and level, are well known to you as a mason. Upon you as a judge, they peculiarly inculcate uprightness, impartiality, careful consideration of facts and circumstances, accuracy in judgment, and uniformity in decision. As a judge, too, you are to bring up square work and square work only. Like a temple erected by the plumb, you are to lean neither to one side nor the other. Like a building well squared and leveled, you are to be firm and steadfast in your convictions of right and justice. Like the circle swept with the compasses, you are to be true. In the scales of justice you are to weigh the facts and the law alone, nor place in either scale personal friendship or personal dislike, neither fear nor favor, and when reformation is no longer to be hoped for. You are to smite relentlessly with the sword of justice. The peculiar and principal symbol of this degree is the Tetractes of Pythagoras, suspended in the east, where ordinarily the sacred word or letter glitters, like it, representing the deity. Its nine external points form the triangle, the chief symbol in masonry, with many of the meanings of which you are familiar. To us, its three sides represent the three principal attributes of the deity, which created, and now, as ever, support, uphold, and guide the universe in its eternal movement. The three supports of the Masonic Temple, itself an emblem of the universe, 
wisdom, or the infinite divine intelligence, strength, or power, the infinite divine will. And beauty, or the infinite divine harmony, the eternal law, by virtue of which the infinite myriads of suns and worlds flash ever onward in their ceaseless revolutions, without clash or conflict, in the infinite of space. And change and movement are the law of all created existences. To us, as Masonic judges, the triangle figures forth the pyramids, which, planted firmly as the everlasting hills, and accurately adjusted to the four cardinal points, defiant of all assaults of men and time. Teach us to stand firm and unshaken as they, when our feet are planted upon the solid truth. It includes a multitude of geometrical figures, all having a deep significance to Masons. The triple triangle is peculiarly sacred having ever been among all nations a symbol of the deity. Prolonging all the external lines of the hexagon, which also it includes, we have six smaller triangles, whose bases cut each other in the central point of the tetractes, itself always the symbol of the generative power of the universe, the sun. Brahma, Osiris, Apollo, Bel, and the deity himself. Thus, too, we form twelve still smaller triangles, three times three of which compose the tetractes itself. I refrain from enumerating all the figures that you may trace within it, but one may not be passed unnoticed. The hexagon itself faintly images to us a cube, not visible at the first glance, and therefore the fit emblem of that faith in things invisible, most essential to salvation. The first perfect solid, and reminding you of the cubical stone that sweated blood, and of that deposited by Enoch, it teaches justice, accuracy, and consistency. The infinite divisibility of the triangle teaches the infinity of the universe, of time, of space, and of the deity, as do the lines that, diverging from the common center, ever increase their distance from each other as they are infinitely prolonged. As they may be infinite in number, so are the attributes of deity infinite, and as they emanate from one center and are projected into space, so the whole universe has emanated from God. Remember also, my brother, that you have other duties to perform than those of a judge. You are to inquire into and scrutinize carefully the work of the subordinate bodies in masonry. You are to see that recipients of the higher degrees are not unnecessarily multiplied. That improper persons are carefully excluded from membership, and that in their life and conversation Masons bear testimony to the excellence of our doctrines and the incalculable value of the institution itself. You are to inquire also into your own heart and conduct, and keep careful watch over yourself, that you go not astray. If you harbor ill will and jealousy, if you are hospitable to intolerance and bigotry, and churlish to gentleness and kind affections, opening wide your heart to one and closing its portals to the other. It is time for you to set in order your own temple, or else you wear in vain the name and insignia of a mason, while yet uninvested with the Masonic nature. Everywhere in the world there is a natural law, that is, a constant mode of action, which seems to belong to the nature of things, to the constitution of the universe. This fact is universal. In different departments we call this mode of action by different names, as the law of matter, the law of mind, the law of morals, and the like. We mean by this, a certain mode of action which belongs to the material, mental, or moral forces, the mode in which commonly they are found to act, and in which it is their ideal to act always. The ideal laws of matter we know only from the fact that they are always obeyed. To us the actual obedience is the only evidence of the ideal rule, for in respect to the conduct of the material world, the ideal and the actual are the same. The laws of matter we learn only by observation and experience. Before experience of the fact, no man could foretell that a body, falling toward the earth, would descend sixteen feet the first second, twice that the next, four times the third, and sixteen times the fourth. No mode of action in our consciousness anticipates this rule of action in the outer world. The same is true of all the laws of matter. The ideal law is known because it is a fact. The law is imperative. It must be obeyed without hesitation. Laws of crystallization, laws of proportion in chemical combination, neither in these nor in any other law of nature is there any margin left for oscillation of disobedience. Only the primal will of God works in the material world, 
and no secondary finite will. There are no exceptions to the great general law of attraction, which binds atom to atom in the body of a rotifier visible only by aid of a microscope, orb to orb, system to system. Gives unity to the world of things, and rounds these worlds of systems to a universe. At first there seem to be exceptions to this law, as in growth and decomposition, in the repulsions of electricity. But at length all these are found to be special cases of the one great law of attraction acting in various modes. The variety of effect of this law at first surprises the senses, but in the end the unity of cause astonishes the cultivated mind. Looked at in reference to this globe, an earthquake is no more than a chink that opens in a garden walk of a dry day in summer. A sponge is porous, having small spaces between the solid parts, the solar system is only more porous, having larger room between the several orbs, the universe yet more so, with spaces between the systems, as small, compared with infinite space. As those between the atoms that compose the bulk of the smallest invisible animalcule, of which millions swim in a drop of salt water. The same attraction holds together the animalcule, the sponge, the system, and the universe. Every particle of matter in that universe is related to each and all the other particles, and attraction is their common bond. In the spiritual world, the world of human consciousness, there is also a law, an ideal mode of action for the spiritual forces of man. The law of justice is as universal and one as the law of attraction. Though we are very far from being able to reconcile all the phenomena of nature with it. The lark has the same right, in our view, to live, to sing, to dart at pleasure through the ambient atmosphere, as the hawk has to ply his strong wings in the summer sunshine, and yet the hawk pounces on and devours the harmless lark. As it devours the worm, and as the worm devours the animalcule. And, so far as we know, there is nowhere, in any future state of animal existence, any compensation for this apparent injustice. Among the bees, one rules, while the others obey, some work, while others are idle. With the small ants, the soldiers feed on the proceeds of the workman's labor. The lion lies in wait for and devours the antelope that has apparently as good a right to life as he. Among men, some govern and others serve, capital commands and labor obeys, and one race, superior in intellect, avails itself of the strong muscles of another that is inferior, and yet, for all this, no one impeaches the justice of God. No doubt all these varied phenomena are consistent with one great law of justice, and the only difficulty is that we do not, and no doubt we cannot, understand that law. It is very easy for some dreaming and visionary theorist to say that it is most evidently unjust for the lion to devour the deer, and for the eagle to tear and eat the wren. But the trouble is, that we know of no other way, according to the frame, the constitution, and the organs which God has given them, in which the lion and the eagle could manage to live at all. Our little measure of justice is not God's measure. His justice does not require us to relieve the hard-working millions of all labor, to emancipate the serf or slave, unfitted to be free, from all control. No doubt, underneath all the little bubbles, which are the lives, the wishes, the wills, and the plans of the two thousand millions or more of human beings on this earth, four bubbles they are. Judging by the space and time they occupy in this great and age-outlasting sea of humankind, no doubt, underneath them all resides one and the same eternal force, which they shape into this or the other special form. And over all the same paternal providence presides, keeping eternal watch over the little and the great, and producing variety of effect from unity of force. It is entirely true to say that justice is the constitution or fundamental law of the moral universe, the law of right, a rule of conduct for man, as it is for every other living creature, in all his moral relations. No doubt all human affairs, like all other affairs, must be subject to that as the law paramount, and what is right agrees therewith and stands, while what is wrong conflicts with it and falls. The difficulty is that we ever erect our notions of what is right and just into the law of justice, and insist that God shall adopt that as his law. Instead of striving to learn by observation and reflection what his law is, and then believing that law to be consistent with his infinite justice, whether it corresponds with our limited notion of justice, or does not so correspond. 
We are too wise in our own conceit, and ever strive to enact our own little notions into the universal laws of God. It might be difficult for man to prove, even to his own satisfaction, how it is right or just for him to subjugate the horse and ox to his service, giving them in return only their daily food. Which God has spread out for them on all the green meadows and savannas of the world, or how it is just that we should slay and eat the harmless deer that only crops the green herbage, the buds, and the young leaves. And drinks the free-running water that God made common to all. Or the gentle dove, the innocent kid, the many other living things that so confidently trust to our protection. Quite as difficult, perhaps, as to prove it just for one man's intellect or even his wealth to make another's strong arms his servants, for daily wages or for a bare subsistence. To find out this universal law of justice is one thing, to undertake to measure off something with our own little tape line, and call that God's law of justice, is another. The great general plan and system, and the great general laws enacted by God, continually produce what to our limited notions is wrong and injustice. Which hitherto men have been able to explain to their own satisfaction only by the hypothesis of another existence in which all inequalities and injustices in this life will be remedied and compensated for. To our ideas of justice, it is very unjust that the child is made miserable for life by deformity or organic disease, in consequence of the vices of its father, and yet that is part of the universal law. The ancient said that the child was punished for the sins of its father. We say that this its deformity or disease is the consequence of its father's vices. But so far as concerns the question of justice or injustice, that is merely the change of a word. It is very easy to lay down a broad, general principle, embodying our own idea of what is absolute justice, and to insist that everything shall conform to that, to say, all human affairs must be subject to that as the law paramount. What is right agrees therewith and stands, what is wrong conflicts and falls. Private cohesions of self-love, of friendship, or of patriotism, must all be subordinate to this universal gravitation toward the eternal right. The difficulty is that this universe of necessities God created, of sequences of cause and effect, and of life evolved from death, this interminable succession and aggregate of cruelties, will not conform to any such absolute principle or arbitrary theory, no matter in what sounding words and glittering phrases it may be embodied. Impracticable rules in morals are always injurious, for as all men fall short of compliance with them, they turn real virtues into imaginary offenses against a forged law. Justice as between man and man and as between man and the animals below him, is that which, under and according to the God-created relations existing between them, and the whole aggregate of circumstances surrounding them is fit and right and proper to be done, with a view to the general as well as to the individual interest. It is not a theoretical principle by which the very relations that God has created and imposed on us are to be tried, and approved or condemned. God has made this great system of the universe, and enacted general laws for its government. Those laws environ everything that lives with a mighty network of necessity. He chose to create the tiger with such organs that he cannot crop the grass, but must eat other flesh or starve. He has made man carnivorous also. And some of the smallest birds are as much so as the tiger. In every step we take, in every breath we draw, is involved the destruction of a multitude of animate existences, each, no matter how minute, as much a living creature as ourself. He has made necessary among mankind a division of labor, intellectual and moral. He has made necessary the varied relations of society independence, of obedience and control. What is thus made necessary cannot be unjust. For if it be, then God the great lawgiver is himself unjust. The evil to be avoided is, the legalization of injustice and wrong under the false plea of necessity. Out of all the relations of life grow duties, as naturally grow and as undeniably, as the leaves grow upon the trees. If we have the right, created by God's law of necessity, to slay the lamb that we may eat and live, we have no right to torture it in doing so, because that is in no wise necessary. We have the right to live, if we fairly can, by the legitimate exercise of our intellect, 
and hire or by the labor of the strong arms of others, to till our grounds, to dig in our mines, to toil in our manufactories. But we have no right to overwork or underpay them. It is not only true that we may learn the moral law of justice, the law of right, by experience and observation. But that God has given us a moral faculty, our conscience, which is able to perceive this law directly and immediately, by intuitive perception of it. And it is true that man has in his nature a rule of conduct higher than what he has ever yet come up to, an ideal of nature that shames his actual of history, because man has ever been prone to make necessity, his own necessity. The necessities of society, a plea for injustice. But this notion must not be pushed too far, for if we substitute this ideality for actuality, then it is equally true that we have within us an ideal rule of right and wrong, to which God himself in his government of the world has never come. And against which he, we say it reverentially, every day offends. We detest the tiger and the wolf for the rapacity and love of blood which are their nature, we revolt against the law by which the crooked limbs and diseased organism of the child are the fruits of the father's vices. We even think that a God omnipotent and omniscient ought to have permitted no pain, no poverty, no servitude, our ideal of justice is more lofty than the actualities of God. It is well, as all else is well. He has given us that moral sense for wise and beneficent purposes. We accept it as a significant proof of the inherent loftiness of human nature, that it can entertain an ideal so exalted. And should strive to attain it, as far as we can do so consistently with the relations which he has created, and the circumstances which surround us and hold us captive. If we faithfully use this faculty of conscience. If, applying it to the existing relations and circumstances, we develop it and all its kindred powers, and so deduce the duties that out of these relations and those circumstances, and limited and qualified by them. Arise and become obligatory upon us, then we learn justice, the law of right, the divine rule of conduct for human life. But if we undertake to define and settle, the mode of action that belongs to the infinitely perfect nature of God, and so set up any ideal rule, beyond all human reach. We soon come to judge and condemn His work and the relations which it has pleased Him in His infinite wisdom to create. A sense of justice belongs to human nature, and is a part of it. Men find a deep, permanent, and instinctive delight in justice, not only in the outward effects, but in the inward cause, and by their nature love this law of right, this reasonable rule of conduct, this justice, with a deep and abiding love. Justice is the object of the conscience, and fits it as light fits the eye and truth the mind. Justice keeps just relations between men. It holds the balance between nation and nation, between a man and his family, tribe, nation, and race, so that his absolute rights and theirs do not interfere, nor their ultimate interests ever clash nor the eternal interests of the one prove antagonistic to those of all or of any other one. This we must believe, if we believe that God is just. We must do justice to all, and demand it of all, it is a universal human debt, a universal human claim. But we may err greatly in defining what that justice is. The temporary interests, and what to human view are the rights, of men, do often interfere and clash. The life interests of the individual often conflict with the permanent interests and welfare of society. And what may seem to be the natural rights of one class or race, with those of another. It is not true to say that, one man, however little, must not be sacrificed to another, however great, to a majority, or to all men. That is not only a fallacy, but a most dangerous one. Often one man and many men must be sacrificed, in the ordinary sense of the term, to the interest of the many. It is a comfortable fallacy to the selfish. For if they cannot, by the law of justice, be sacrificed for the common good, then their country has no right to demand of them self-sacrifice. And he is a fool who lays down his life, or sacrifices his estate, or even his luxuries, to ensure the safety or prosperity of his country. According to that doctrine, Curtius was a fool, and Leonidas an idiot. And to die for one's country is no longer beautiful and glorious, but a mere absurdity. 
then it is no longer to be asked that the common soldier shall receive in his bosom the sword or bayonet thrust which otherwise would let out the life of the great commander on whose fate hang the liberties of his country. And the welfare of millions yet unborn. On the contrary, it is certain that necessity rules in all the affairs of men, and that the interest and even the life of one man must often be sacrificed to the interest and welfare of his country. Some must ever lead the forlorn hope, the missionary must go among savages, bearing his life in his hand, the physician must expose himself to pestilence for the sake of others. The sailor, in the frail boat upon the wide ocean, escaped from the foundering or burning ship, must step calmly into the hungry waters, if the lives of the passengers can be saved only by the sacrifice of his own. The pilot must stand firm at the wheel, and let the flame scorch away his own life to ensure the common safety of those whom the doomed vessel bears. The mass of men are always looking for what is just. All the vast machinery which makes up a state, a world of states, is, on the part of the people, an attempt to organize, not that ideal justice which finds fault with God's ordinances. But that practical justice which may be attained in the actual organization of the world. The minute and wide extending civil machinery which makes up the law and the courts, with all their officers and implements, on the part of mankind, is chiefly an effort to reduce to practice the theory of right. Constitutions are made to establish justice, the decisions of courts are reported to help us judge more wisely in time to come. The nation aims to get together the most nearly just men in the state, that they may incorporate into statutes their aggregate sense of what is right. The people wish law to be embodied justice, administered without passion. Even in the wildest ages there has been a wild popular justice, but always mixed with passion and administered in hate, for justice takes a rude form with rude men, and becomes less mixed with hate and passion in more civilized communities. Every progressive state revises its statutes and revolutionizes its constitution from time to time, seeking to come closer to the utmost possible practical justice and right. And sometimes, following theorists and dreamers in their adoration for the ideal, by erecting into law positive principles of theoretical right, works practical injustice, and then has to retrace its steps. In literature men always look for practical justice, and desire that virtue should have its own reward, and vice its appropriate punishment. They are ever on the side of justice and humanity. And the majority of them have an ideal justice, better than the things about them, juster than the law, for the law is ever imperfect, not attaining even to the utmost practicable degree of perfection. And no man is as just as his own idea of possible and practicable justice. His passions and his necessities ever cause him to sink below his own ideal. The ideal justice which men ever look up to and strive to rise toward, is true. But it will not be realized in this world. Yet we must approach as near to it as practicable, as we should do toward that ideal democracy that now floats before the eyes of earnest and religious men, fairer than the Republic of Plato, or Moore's Utopia, or the Golden Age of Fabled Memory. Only taking care that we do not, in striving to reach and ascend to the impossible ideal, neglect to seize upon and hold fast to the possible actual. To aim at the best, but be content with the best possible, is the only true wisdom. To insist on the absolute right, and throw out of the calculation the important and all-controlling element of necessity, is the folly of a mere dreamer. In a world inhabited by men with bodies, and necessarily with bodily wants and animal passions, the time will never come when there will be no want, no oppression, nor servitude, no fear of man, no fear of God, but only love. That can never be while there are inferior intellect, indulgence in low vice, improvidence, indolence, awful visitations of pestilence and war and famine, earthquake and volcano, that must of necessity cause men to want, and serve, and suffer. And fear. But still the plowshare of justice is ever drawn through and through the field of the world, uprooting the savage plants. Ever we see a continual and progressive triumph of the right. The injustice of England lost her America, the fairest jewel of her crown. The injustice of Napoleon bore him to the ground more than the snows of Russia did, and exiled him to a barren rock, there to pine away and die, his life a warning to bid mankind be just. We intuitively understand what justice is, better than we can depict it. 
what it is in a given case depends so much on circumstances, that definitions of it are wholly deceitful. Often it would be unjust to society to do what would, in the absence of that consideration, be pronounced just to the individual. General propositions of man's right to this or that are ever fallacious, and not infrequently it would be most unjust to the individual himself to do for him what the theorist, as a general proposition, would say was right and his due. We should ever do unto others what, under the same circumstances, we ought to wish, and should have the right to wish they should do unto us. There are many cases, cases constantly occurring, where one man must take care of himself, in preference to another, as where two struggle for the possession of a plank that will save one, but cannot uphold both. Or where, assailed, he can save his own life only by slaying his adversary. So one must prefer the safety of his country to the lives of her enemies, and sometimes, to ensure it, to those of her own innocent citizens. The retreating general may cut away a bridge behind him, to delay pursuit and save the main body of his army, though he thereby surrenders a detachment, a battalion, or even a corps of his own force to certain destruction. These are not departures from justice. Though, like other instances where the injury or death of the individual is the safety of the many, where the interest of one individual, class, or race is postponed to that of the public, or of the superior race. They may infringe some dreamer's ideal rule of justice. But every departure from real, practical justice is no doubt attended with loss to the unjust man, though the loss is not reported to the public. Injustice, public or private, like every other sin and wrong, is inevitably followed by its consequences. The selfish, the grasping, the inhuman, the fraudulently unjust, the ungenerous employer, and the cruel master, are detested by the great popular heart. While the kind master, the liberal employer, the generous, the humane, and the just have the good opinion of all men, and even envy is a tribute to their virtues. Men honor all who stand up for truth and right, and never shrink. The world builds monuments to its patriots. For great statesmen, organizers of the right, embalmed in stone, look down upon the lawgivers of France as they pass to their hall of legislation, silent orators to tell how nations love the just. How we revere the marble lineaments of those just judges, Jay and Marshall, that look so calmly toward the living bench of the Supreme Court of the United States. What a monument Washington has built in the heart of America and all the world, not because he dreamed of an impracticable ideal justice, but by his constant effort to be practically just. But necessity alone, and the greatest good of the greatest number, can legitimately interfere with the dominion of absolute and ideal justice. Government should not foster the strong at the expense of the weak, nor protect the capitalist and tax the laborer. The powerful should not seek a monopoly of development and enjoyment. Not prudence only and the expedient for today should be appealed to by statesmen, but conscience and the right, justice should not be forgotten in looking at interest. Nor political morality neglected for political economy, we should not have national housekeeping instead of national organization on the basis of right. We may well differ as to the abstract right of many things, for every such question has many sides, and few men look at all of them, many only at one. But we all readily recognize cruelty, unfairness, inhumanity, partiality, overreaching, hard dealing, by their ugly and familiar lineaments, and in order to know and to hate and despise them. We do not need to sit as a court of errors and appeals to revise and reverse God's providences. There are certainly great evils of civilization at this day, and many questions of humanity long adjourned and put off. The hideous aspect of pauperism, the debasement and vice in our cities, tell us by their eloquent silence or in inarticulate mutterings, that the rich and the powerful and the intellectual do not do their duty by the poor, the feeble, and the ignorant. And every wretched woman who lives, heaven scarce knows how, by making shirts at sixpence each, attests the injustice and inhumanity of man. There are cruelties to slaves, and worse cruelties to animals, each disgraceful to their perpetrators, and equally unwarranted by the lawful relation of control and dependence which it has pleased God to create. A sentence is written against all that is unjust, written by God in the nature of man and in the nature of the universe, because it is in the nature of the infinite God. 
fidelity to your faculties, trust in their convictions, that is justice to yourself, a life in obedience thereto, that is justice toward men. No wrong is really successful. The gain of injustice is a loss, its pleasure suffering. Iniquity often seems to prosper, but its success is its defeat and shame. After a long while, the day of reckoning ever comes, to nation as to individual. The knave deceives himself. The miser, starving his brother's body, starves also his own soul, and at death shall creep out of his great estate of injustice, poor and naked and miserable. Whoso escapes a duty avoids a gain. Outward judgment often fails, inward justice never. Let a man try to love the wrong and to do the wrong, it is eating stones and not bread, the swift feet of justice are upon him, following with wool and tread, and her iron hands are round his neck. No man can escape from this, any more than from himself. Justice is the angel of God that flies from east to west, and where she stoops her broad wings, it is to bring the counsel of God, and feed mankind with angels' bread. We cannot understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one, and our eyes reach but a little way, we cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. But we can divine it by conscience, and we surely know that it bends toward justice. Justice will not fail, though wickedness appears strong, and has on its side the armies and thrones of power, the riches and the glory of the world, and though poor men crouch down in despair. Justice will not fail and perish out from the world of men, nor will what is really wrong and contrary to God's real law of justice continually endure. The power, the wisdom, and the justice of God are on the side of every just thought, and it cannot fail, any more than God Himself can perish. In human affairs, the justice of God must work by human means. Men are the instruments of God's principles, our morality is the instrument of His justice, which, incomprehensible to us, seems to our short vision often to work injustice, but will at some time still the oppressor's brutal laugh. Justice is the rule of conduct written in the nature of mankind. We may, in our daily life, in house or field or shop, in the office or in the court, help to prepare the way for the commonwealth of justice which is slowly, but, we would fain hope, surely approaching. All the justice we mature will bless us here and hereafter, and at our death we shall leave it added to the common store of humankind. And every mason who, content to do that which is possible and practicable, does and enforces justice, may help deepen the channel of human morality in which God's justice runs. And so the wrecks of evil that now check and obstruct the stream may the sooner be swept out and borne away by the resistless tide of omnipotent right. Let us, my brother, in this, as in all else, endeavor always to perform the duties of a good mason and a good man. 32. Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret Master of Royal Secret The occult science of the ancient Magi was concealed under the shadows of the ancient mysteries, it was imperfectly revealed or rather disfigured by the Gnostics, it is guessed at under the obscurities that cover the pretended crimes of the Templars. And it is found enveloped in enigmas that seem impenetrable, in the rites of the highest masonry. Magism was the science of Abraham and Orpheus, of Confucius and Zoroaster. It was the dogmas of this science that were engraven on the tables of stone by Hanuk and Trismegistus. Moses purified and reveiled them, for that is the meaning of the word reveal. He covered them with a new veil, when he made of the holy Kabbalah the exclusive heritage of the people of Israel, and the inviolable secret of its priests. The mysteries of Thebes and Eleusis preserved among the nations some symbols of it, already altered, and the mysterious key whereof was lost among the instruments of an ever-growing superstition. Jerusalem, the murderess of her prophets, and so often prostituted to the false gods of the Syrians and Babylonians, had at length in its turn lost the holy word, when a prophet announced to the Magi by the consecrated star of initiation came to rend asunder the worn veil of the old temple, in order to give the church a new tissue of legends and symbols, that still and ever conceals from the profane, and ever preserves to the elect the same truths. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute, of this doctrine that is summed up in a word, of this word, in fine, alternately lost and found again. That was transmitted to the elect of all the ancient initiations, 
it was this same remembrance, preserved, or perhaps profaned in the celebrated Order of the Templars, that became for all the secret associations, of the Rose Croix. Of the Illuminati, and of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason of their strange rites, of their signs more or less conventional, and, above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. The Gnostics caused the Gnosis to be proscribed by the Christians, and the official sanctuary was closed against the high initiation. Thus the hierarchy of knowledge was compromitted by the violences of usurping ignorance, and the disorders of the sanctuary are reproduced in the state. For always, willingly or unwillingly, the king is sustained by the priest, and it is from the eternal sanctuary of the divine instruction that the powers of the earth, to ensure themselves durability, must receive their consecration and their force. The hermetic science of the early Christian ages, cultivated also by Jeber, Alpharabius, and others of the Arabs, studied by the chiefs of the Templars, and embodied in certain symbols of the higher degrees of Freemasonry, may be accurately defined as the Kabbalah in active realization, or the magic of works. It has three analogous degrees, religious, philosophical, and physical realization. Its religious realization is the durable foundation of the true empire and the true priesthood that rule in the realm of human intellect, its philosophical realization is the establishment of an absolute doctrine. Known in all times as the Holy Doctrine, and of which Plutarch, in the treatise De Iside et Osiride, speaks at large but mysteriously. And of a hierarchical instruction to secure the uninterrupted succession of adepts among the initiates, its physical realization is the discovery and application, in the microcosm, or little world, of the creative law that incessantly peoples the great universe. Measure a corner of the creation, and multiply that space in proportional progression, and the entire infinite will multiply its circles filled with universes, which will pass in proportional segments between the ideal and elongating branches of your compass. Now suppose that from any point whatever of the infinite above you a hand holds another compass or a square, the lines of the celestial triangle will necessarily meet those of the compass of science, to form the mysterious star of Solomon. All hypotheses scientifically probable are the last gleams of the twilight of knowledge, or its last shadows. Faith begins where reason sinks exhausted. Beyond the human reason is the divine reason, to our feebleness the great absurdity, the infinite absurd, which confounds us and which we believe. For the master, the compass of faith is above the square of reason. But both rest upon the holy scriptures and combine to form the blazing star of truth. All eyes do not see alike. Even the visible creation is not, for all who look upon it, of one form and one color. Our brain is a book printed within and without, and the two writings are, with all men, more or less confused. The primary tradition of the single revelation has been preserved under the name of the Kabbalah, by the priesthood of Israel. The Kabbalistic doctrine, which was also the dogma of the Magi and of Hermes, is contained in the Sefer Yetzirah, the Sohar, and the Talmud. According to that doctrine, the Absolute is the being, in which the Word is, the Word that is the utterance and expression of being and life. Magic is that which it is, it is by itself, like the mathematics. For it is the exact and absolute science of nature and its laws. Magic is the science of the ancient Magi, and the Christian religion, which has imposed silence on the lying oracles, and put an end to the prestiges of the false gods, itself reveres those Magi who came from the East, guided by a star. To adore the Savior of the world in his cradle. Tradition also gives these Magi the title of kings, because initiation into magism constitutes a genuine royalty, and because the grand art of the Magi is styled by all the adepts, the royal art, or the holy realm or empire, sanctum regnum. The star which guided them is that same blazing star, the image whereof we find in all initiations. To the alchemists it is the sign of the quintessence, to the magists, the grand arcanum, to the Kabbalists, the sacred pentagram. The study of this pentagram could not but lead the Magi to the knowledge of the new name which was about to raise itself above all names, and cause all creatures capable of adoration to bend the knee. Magic unites in one and the same science, whatsoever philosophy can possess that is most certain, and religion of the infallible and the eternal. 
It perfectly and incontestably reconciles these two terms that at first blush seem so opposed to each other, faith and reason, science and creed, authority and liberty. It supplies the human mind with an instrument of philosophical and religious certainty, exact as the mathematics, and accounting for the infallibility of the mathematics themselves. Thus there is an absolute, in the matters of the intelligence and of faith. The supreme reason has not left the gleams of the human understanding to vacillate at hazard. There is an incontestable verity, there is an infallible method of knowing this verity, and by the knowledge of it. Those who accept it as a rule may give their will a sovereign power that will make them the masters of all inferior things and of all errant spirits. That is to say, will make them the arbiters and kings of the world. Science has its nights and its dawns, because it gives the intellectual world a life which has its regulated movements and its progressive phases. It is with truths, as with the luminous rays, nothing of what is concealed is lost, but also, nothing of what is discovered is absolutely new. God has been pleased to give to science, which is the reflection of His glory, the seal of His eternity. It is not in the books of the philosophers, but in the religious symbolism of the ancients, that we must look for the footprints of science, and rediscover the mysteries of knowledge. The priests of Egypt knew, better than we do, the laws of movement and of life. They knew how to temper or, intensify action by reaction, and readily foresaw the realization of these effects, the causes of which they had determined. The columns of Seth, Enoch, Solomon, and Hercules have symbolized in the Magian traditions this universal law of the equilibrium. And the science of the equilibrium or balancing of forces had led the initiates to that of the universal gravitation around the centers of life, heat, and light. Thales and Pythagoras learned in the sanctuaries of Egypt that the earth revolved around the sun. But they did not attempt to make this generally known, because to do so it would have been necessary to reveal one of the great secrets of the temple, that double law of attraction and radiation or of sympathy and antipathy. Of fixedness and movement, which is the principle of creation, and the perpetual cause of life. This truth was ridiculed by the Christian Lactantius, as it was long after sought to be proven a falsehood by persecution, by papal Rome. So the philosophers reasoned, while the priests, without replying to them or even smiling at their errors, wrote, in those hieroglyphics that created all dogmas and all poetry, the secrets of the truth. When truth comes into the world, the star of knowledge advises the magi of it, and they hasten to adore the infant who creates the future. It is by means of the intelligence of the hierarchy in the practice of obedience, that one obtains initiation. If the rulers have the divine right to govern, the true initiate will cheerfully obey. The Orthodox traditions were carried from Chaldea by Abraham. They reigned in Egypt in the time of Joseph, together with the knowledge of the true God. Moses carried Orthodoxy out of Egypt, and in the secret traditions of the Kabbalah we find a theology entire, perfect, unique, like that which in Christianity is most grand and best explained by the fathers and the doctors. The whole with a consistency and a harmoniousness which it is not as yet given to the world to comprehend. The Sohar, which is the key of the holy books, opens also all the depths and lights, all the obscurities of the ancient mythologies and of the sciences originally concealed in the sanctuaries. It is true that the secret of this key must be known, to enable one to make use of it, and that for even the most penetrating intellects, not initiated in this secret, the Sohar is absolutely incomprehensible and almost illegible. The secret of the occult sciences is that of nature itself, the secret of the generation of the angels and worlds, that of the omnipotence of God. Ye shall be like the Elohim, knowing good and evil, had the serpent of Genesis said, and the tree of knowledge became the tree of death. For six thousand years the martyrs of knowledge toil and die at the foot of this tree, that it may again become the tree of life. The absolute sought for unsuccessfully by the insensate and found by the sages, is the truth, the reality, and the reason of the universal equilibrium. Equilibrium is the harmony that results from the analogy of contraries. Until now, humanity has been endeavoring to stand on one foot, sometimes on one, sometimes on the other. Civilizations have risen and perished, either by the anarchical insanity of despotism, or by the despotic anarchy of revolt. To organize anarchy, 
is the problem which the revolutionists have and will eternally have to resolve. It is the rock of Sisyphus that will always fall back upon them. To exist a single instant, they are and always will be by fatality reduced to improvise a despotism without other reason of existence than necessity, and which, consequently, is violent and blind as necessity. We escape from the harmonious monarchy of reason, only to fall under the irregular dictatorship of folly. Sometimes superstitious enthusiasms, sometimes the miserable calculations of the materialist instinct have led astray the nations, and God at last urges the world on toward believing reason and reasonable beliefs. We have had prophets enough without philosophy, and philosophers without religion, the blind believers and the skeptics resemble each other, and are as far the one as the other from the eternal salvation. In the chaos of universal doubt and of the conflicts of reason and faith, the great men and seers have been but infirm and morbid artists, seeking the beau ideal at the risk and peril of their reason and life. Living only in the hope to be crowned, they are the first to do what Pythagoras in so touching a manner prohibits in his admirable symbols, they rend crowns, and tread them underfoot. Light is the equilibrium of shadow and lucidity. Movement is the equilibrium of inertia and activity. Authority is the equilibrium of liberty and power. Wisdom is equilibrium in the thoughts, which are the scintillations and rays of the intellect. Virtue is equilibrium in the affections, beauty is harmonious proportion in forms. The beautiful lives are the accurate ones, and the magnificences of. Nature are an algebra of graces and splendors. Everything just is beautiful. Everything beautiful ought to be just. There is, in fact, no nothing, no void emptiness, in the universe. From the upper or outer surface of our atmosphere to that of the sun, and to those of the planets and remote stars, in different directions, science has for hundreds of centuries imagined that there was simple, void, empty space. Comparing finite knowledge with the infinite, the philosophers know little more than the apes. In all that void space are the infinite forces of God, acting in an infinite variety of directions, back and forth, and never for an instant inactive. In all of it, active through the whole of its infinity, is the light that is the visible manifestation of God. The earth and every other planet and sphere that is not a center of light, carries its cone of shadow with it as it flies and flashes round in its orbit, but the darkness has no home in the universe. To illuminate the sphere on one side, is to project a cone of darkness on the other, and error also is the shadow of the truth with which God illuminates the soul. In all that, void, also, is the mysterious and ever-active electricity, and heat, and the omnipresent ether. At the will of God the invisible becomes visible. Two invisible gases, combined by the action of a force of God, and compressed, become and remain the water that fills the great basins of the seas, flows in the rivers and rivulets, leaps forth from the rocks or springs. Drops upon the earth in rains, or whitens it with snows, and bridges the Danubes with ice, or gathers in vast reservoirs in the earth's bosom. God manifested fills all the extension that we foolishly call empty space and the void. And everywhere in the universe, what we call life and movement results from a continual conflict of forces or impulses. Whenever that active antagonism ceases, the immobility and inertia, which are death, result. If, says the Kabbalah, the justice of God, which is severity or the female, alone reigned, creation of imperfect beings such as man would from the beginning have been impossible, because sin being congenital with humanity, the infinite justice. Measuring the sin by the infinity of the God offended against, must have annihilated humanity at the instant of its creation. And not only humanity but the angels, since these also, like all created by God and less than perfect, are sinful. Nothing imperfect would have been possible. If, on the other hand, the mercy or benignity of God, the male, were in no wise counteracted, sin would go unpunished, and the universe fall into a chaos of corruption. Let God but repeal a single principle or law of chemical attraction or sympathy, and the antagonistic forces equilibrated in matter, released from constraint, would instantaneously expand all that we term matter into impalpable and invisible gases. 
such as water or steam is, when, confined in a cylinder and subjected to an immense degree of that mysterious force of the deity which we call, heat, it is by its expansion released. Incessantly the great currents and rivers of air flow and rush and roll from the equator to the frozen polar regions, and back from these to the torrid equatorial realms. Necessarily incident to these great, immense, equilibrated and beneficent movements, caused by the antagonism of equatorial heat and polar cold, are the typhoons, tornadoes, and cyclones that result from conflicts between the rushing currents. These and the benign trade winds result from the same great law. God is omnipotent, but effects without causes are impossible, and these effects cannot but sometimes be evil. The fire would not warm, if it could not also burn, the human flesh. The most virulent poisons are the most sovereign remedies, when given in due proportion. The evil is the shadow of the good, and inseparable from it. The divine wisdom limits by equipoise the omnipotence of the divine will or power, and the result is beauty or harmony. The arch rests not on a single column, but springs from one on either side. So is it also with the divine justice and mercy, and with the human reason and human faith. That purely scholastic theology, issue of the categories of Aristotle and of the sentences of Peter Lombard, that logic of the syllogism which argues instead of reasoning, and finds a response to everything by subtilizing on terms. Wholly ignored the cabalistic dogma and wandered off into the drear vacuity of darkness. It was less a philosophy or a wisdom than a philosophical automaton, replying by means of springs, and uncoiling its theses like a wheeled movement. It was not the human verb but the monotonous cry of a machine, the inanimate speech of an android. It was the fatal precision of mechanism, instead of a free application of rational necessities. St. Thomas Aquinas crushed with a single blow all this scaffolding of words built one upon the other, by proclaiming the eternal empire of reason, in that magnificent sentence, a thing is not just because God wills it. But God wills it because it is just. The proximate consequence of this proposition, arguing from the greater to the less, was this, a thing is not true because Aristotle has said it, but Aristotle could not reasonably say it unless it was true. Seek then, first of all, the truth and justice, and the science of Aristotle will be given you in addition. It is the fine dream of the greatest of the poets, that hell, become useless, is to be closed at length, by the aggrandizement of heaven. That the problem of evil is to receive its final solution, and good alone, necessary and triumphant, is to reign in eternity. So the Persian dogma taught that Araman and his subordinate ministers of evil were at last, by means of a redeemer and mediator, to be reconciled with deity, and all evil to end. But unfortunately, the philosopher forgets all the laws of equilibrium, and seeks to absorb the light in a splendor without shadow, and movement in an absolute repose that would be the cessation of life. So long as there shall be a visible light, there will be a shadow proportional to this light, and whatever is illuminated will cast its cone of shadow. Repose will never be happiness, if it is not balanced by an analogous and contrary movement. This is the immutable law of nature, the eternal will of the justice which is God. The same reason necessitates evil and sorrow in humanity, which renders indispensable the bitterness of the waters of the seas. Here also, harmony can result only from the analogy of contraries, and what is above exists by reason of what is below. It is the depth that determines the height. And if the valleys are filled up, the mountains disappear, so, if the shadows are effaced, the light is annulled, which is only visible by the graduated contrast of gloom and splendor, and universal obscurity will be produced by an immense dazzling. Even the colors in the light only exist by the presence of the shadow, it is the threefold alliance of the day and night, the luminous image of the dogma, the light made shadow. As the Savior is the Logos made man, and all this reposes on the same law, the primary law of creation, the single and absolute law of nature, that of the distinction and harmonious ponderation of the contrary forces in the universal equipoise. The two great columns of the temple that symbolizes the universe are necessity, or the omnipotent will of God, which nothing can disobey, and liberty, or the free will of his creatures. Apparently and to our human reason antagonistic, 
the same reason is not incapable of comprehending how they can be in equipoise. The infinite power and wisdom could so plan the universe and the infinite succession of things as to leave man free to act, and, foreseeing what each would at every instant think and do. To make of the free will and free action of each an instrument to aid in effecting its general purpose. For even a man, foreseeing that another will do a certain act, and in no wise controlling or even influencing him may use that action as an instrument to effect his own purposes. The infinite wisdom of God foresees what each will do, and uses it as an instrument, by the exertion of his infinite power, which yet does not control the human action so as to annihilate its freedom. The result is harmony, the third column that upholds the lodge. The same harmony results from the equipoise of necessity and liberty. The will of God is not for an instant defeated nor thwarted, and this is the divine victory. And yet he does not tempt nor constrain men to do evil, and thus his infinite glory is unimpaired. The result is stability, cohesion, and permanence in the universe, and undivided dominion and autocracy in the deity. And these, victory, glory, stability, and dominion, are the last four sephiroth of the Kabbalah. I am, God said to Moses, that which is, was, and shall forever be. But the very God, in his unmanifested essence, conceived of as not yet having created and as alone, has no name. Such was the doctrine of all the ancient sages, and it is so expressly declared in the Kabbalah. Hebrew, is the name of the deity manifested in a single act, that of creation, and containing within himself, in idea and actuality, the whole universe. To be invested with form and be materially developed during the eternal succession of ages. As God never was not, so he never thought not, and the universe has no more had a beginning than the divine thought of which it is the utterance, no more than the deity himself. The duration of the universe is but a point halfway upon the infinite line of eternity, and God was not inert and uncreative during the eternity that stretches behind that point. The archetype of the universe did never not exist in the divine mind. The Word was in the beginning with God, and was God. And the ineffable name is that, not of the very essence but of the Absolute, manifested as being or existence. For existence or being, said the philosophers, is limitation. And the very deity is not limited nor defined, but is all that may possibly be, besides all that is, was, and shall be. Reversing the letters of the ineffable name, and dividing it, it becomes bisexual, as the word, Hebrew, yud he or jah is, and discloses the meaning of much of the obscure language of the Kabbalah. And is the highest of which the columns Jachin and Boaz are the symbol. In the image of deity, we are told, God created the man, male and female created he them and the writer, symbolizing the divine by the human, then tells us that the woman, at first contained in the man, was taken from his side. So Minerva, goddess of wisdom, was born, a woman and in armor, of the brain of Jove. Isis was the sister before she was the wife of Osiris, and within Brahm, the source of all, the very god, without sex or name, was developed Maya, the mother of all that is. The Word is the first and only begotten of the Father. And the awe with which the highest mysteries were regarded has imposed silence in respect to the nature of the Holy Spirit. The Word is light, and the life of humanity. It is for the adepts to understand the meaning of the symbols. Return now, with us, to the degrees of the blue masonry, and for your last lesson, receive the explanation of one of their symbols. You see upon the altar of those degrees the square and the compass, and you remember how they lay upon the altar in each degree. The square is an instrument adapted for plane surfaces only, and therefore appropriate to geometry, or measurement of the earth, which appears to be, and was by the ancients supposed to be, a plane. The compass is an instrument that has relation to spheres and spherical surfaces, and is adapted to spherical trigonometry, or that branch of mathematics which deals with the heavens and the orbits of the planetary bodies. The square, therefore, is a natural and appropriate symbol of this earth and the things that belong to it, are of it, or concern it. The compass is an equally natural and appropriate symbol of the heavens, and of all celestial things and celestial natures. You see at the beginning of this reading, an old hermetic symbol, 
copied from the Materia Prima of Valentinus, printed at Frankfurt, in 1613, with a treatise entitled Azov. Upon it you see a triangle upon a square, both of these contained in a circle, and above this, standing upon a dragon, a human body, with two arms only, but two heads, one male and the other female. By the side of the male head is the sun, and by that of the female head, the moon, the crescent within the circle of the full moon. And the hand on the male side holds a compass, and that on the female side, a square. The heavens and the earth were personified as deities, even among the Aryan ancestors of the European nations of the Hindus, Zens, Bactrians, and Persians, and the Rig Veda Sanhita contains hymns addressed to them as gods. They were deified also among the Phoenicians, and among the Greeks Auranas and Gea, heaven and earth, were sung as the most ancient of the deities, by Hesiod. It is the great, fertile, beautiful mother, earth, that produces, with limitless profusion of beneficence, everything that ministers to the needs, to the comfort, and to the luxury of man. From her teeming and inexhaustible bosom come, the fruits, the grain, the flowers, in their season. From it comes all that feeds the animals which serve man as laborers and for food. She, in the fair springtime, is green with abundant grass, and the trees spring from her soil, and from her teeming vitality take their wealth of green leaves. In her womb are found the useful and valuable minerals. Hers are the seas that swarm with life, hers the rivers that furnish food and irrigation, and the mountains that send down the streams which swell into these rivers. Hers the forests that feed the sacred fires for the sacrifices, and blaze upon the domestic hearths. The earth, therefore, the great producer, was always represented as a female, as the mother, great, bounteous, beneficent Mother Earth. On the other hand, it is the light and heat of the sun in the heavens, and the rains that seem to come from them, that in the springtime make fruitful this bountifully producing earth, that restore life and warmth to her veins, chilled by winter. Set running free her streams, and beget, as it were, that greenness and that abundance of which she is so prolific. As the procreative and generative agents, the heavens and the sun have always been regarded as male, as the generators that fructify the earth and cause it to produce. The hermaphroditic figure is the symbol of the double nature anciently assigned to the deity, as generator and producer, as Brahm and Maya among the Aryans, Osiris and Isis among the Egyptians. As the sun was male, so the moon was female. And Isis was both the sister and the wife of Osiris. The compass, therefore, is the hermetic symbol of the creative deity, and the square of the productive earth or universe. From the heavens come the spiritual and immortal portion of man. From the earth his material and mortal portion. The Hebrew Genesis says that Yhuah formed man of the dust of the earth, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Through the seven planetary spheres, represented by the mystic ladder of the Mithriac initiations, and it by that which Jacob saw in his dream, not with three, but with seven steps, the souls, emanating from the deity, descended. To be united to their human bodies. And through those seven spheres they must reascend, to return to their origin and home in the bosom of the deity. The compass, therefore, as the symbol of the heavens, represents the spiritual, intellectual, and moral portion of this double nature of humanity, and the square, as the symbol of the earth, its material, sensual, and baser portion. Truth and intelligence, said one of the ancient Indian sects of philosophers, are the eternal attributes of God, not of the individual soul, which is susceptible both of knowledge and ignorance, of pleasure and pain. Therefore God and the individual soul are distinct and this expression of the ancient Nyaya philosophers, in regard to truth, has been handed down to us through the long succession of ages, in the lessons of Freemasonry, wherein we read. That truth is a divine attribute, and the foundation of every virtue. While embodied in matter, they said, the soul is in a state of imprisonment, and is under the influence of evil passions. But having, by intense study, arrived at the knowledge of the elements and principles of nature, it attains unto the place of the eternal, in which state of happiness, its individuality does not cease. The vitality which animates the mortal frame, 
the breath of life of the Hebrew Genesis, the Hindu philosophers in general held, perishes with it, but the soul is divine, an emanation of the Spirit of God, but not a portion of that Spirit. For they compared it to the heat and light sent forth from the sun, or to a ray of that light, which neither lessens nor divides its own essence. However created, or invested with separate existence, the soul, which is but the creature of the deity, cannot know the mode of its creation, nor comprehend its own individuality. It cannot even comprehend how the being which it and the body constitute, can feel pain, or see, or hear. It has pleased the universal Creator to set bounds to the scope of our human and finite reason, beyond which it cannot reach. And if we are capable of comprehending the mode and manner of the creation or generation of the universe of things, He has been pleased to conceal it from us by an impenetrable veil. While the words used to express the act have no other definite meaning than that He caused that universe to commence to exist. It is enough for us to know, what Masonry teaches, that we are not all mortal. That the soul or spirit, the intellectual and reasoning portion of ourself, is our very self, is not subject to decay and dissolution, but is simple and immaterial, survives the death of the body, and is capable of immortality. That it is also capable of improvement and advancement, of increase of knowledge of the things that are divine, of becoming wiser and better, and more and more worthy of immortality. And that to become so, and to help to improve and benefit others and all our race, is the noblest ambition and highest glory that we can entertain and attain unto, in this momentary and imperfect life. In every human being the divine and the human are intermingled. In every one there are the reason and the moral sense, the passions that prompt to evil, and the sensual appetites. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, said Paul, writing to the Christians at Rome, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, he said, writing to the Christians of Galatia, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That which I do, I do not willingly do, he wrote to the Romans, for what I wish to do, that I do not do, but that which I hate I do. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. To will, is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For, I do not do the good that I desire to do, and the evil that I do not wish to do, that I do. I find then a law, that when I desire to do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So then. With the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Life is a battle, and to fight that battle heroically and well is the great purpose of every man's existence, who is worthy and fit to live at all. To stem the strong currents of adversity, to advance in despite of all obstacles, to snatch victory from the jealous grasp of fortune, to become a chief and a leader among men, to rise to rank and power by eloquence, courage, perseverance, study, energy, activity, discouraged by no reverses, impatient of no delays, deterred by no hazards. To win wealth, to subjugate men by our intellect, the very elements by our audacity, to succeed, to prosper, to thrive. Thus it is, according to the general understanding, that one fights well the battle of life. Even to succeed in business by that boldness which halts for no risks, that audacity which stakes all upon hazardous chances. By the shrewdness of the close dealer, the boldness of the unscrupulous operator, even by the knaveries of the stock board and the gold room. To crawl up into place by disreputable means or the votes of brutal ignorance, these also are deemed to be among the great successes of life. But that which is the greatest battle, and in which the truest honor and most real success are to be won, is that which our intellect and reason and moral sense, our spiritual natures, fight against our sensual appetites and evil passions. Our earthly and material or animal nature. Therein only are the true glories of heroism to be won, there only the successes that entitle us to triumphs. In every human life that battle is fought. And those who win elsewhere, 
often suffer ignominious defeat and disastrous rout, and discomfiture and shameful downfall in this encounter. You have heard more than one definition of Freemasonry. The truest and the most significant you have yet to hear. It is taught to the entered apprentice, the fellow craft, and the master, and it is taught in every degree through which you have advanced to this. It is a definition of what Freemasonry is, of what its purposes and its very essence and spirit are, and it has for every one of us the force and sanctity of a divine law, and imposes on every one of us a solemn obligation. It is symbolized and taught, to the apprentice as well as to you, by the compass and the square, upon which, as well as upon the book of your religion and the book of the law of the Scottish Freemasonry, you have taken so many obligations. As a knight, you have been taught it by the swords, the symbols of honor and duty, on which you have taken your vows, it was taught you by the balance, the symbol of all equilibrium, and by the cross, the symbol of devotedness and self-sacrifice. But all that these teach and contain is taught and contained, for entered apprentice, knight, and prince alike, by the compass and the square. For the apprentice, the points of the compass are beneath the square. For the fellow craft, one is above and one beneath. For the master, both are dominant, and have rule, control, and empire over the symbol of the earthly and the material. Freemasonry is the subjugation of the human that is in man by the divine. The conquest of the appetites and passions by the moral sense and the reason, a continual effort, struggle, and warfare of the spiritual against the material and sensual. That victory, when it has been achieved and secured, and the conqueror may rest upon his shield and wear the well-earned laurels, is the true holy empire. To achieve it, the mason must first attain a solid conviction, founded upon reason, that he hath within him a spiritual nature, a soul that is not to die when the body is dissolved. But is to continue to exist and to advance toward perfection through all the ages of eternity, and to see more and more clearly, as it draws nearer unto God, the light of the Divine Presence. This the philosophy of the ancient and accepted right teaches him, and it encourages him to persevere by helping him to believe that his free will is entirely consistent with God's omnipotence and omniscience. That he is not only infinite in power, and of infinite wisdom, but of infinite mercy, and an infinitely tender pity and love for the frail and imperfect creatures that he has made. Every degree of the ancient and accepted Scottish rite, from the first to the thirty-second, teaches by its ceremonial as well as by its instruction. That the noblest purpose of life and the highest duty of a man are to strive incessantly and vigorously to win the mastery of everything, of that which in him is spiritual and divine, over that which is material and sensual. So that in him also, as in the universe which God governs, harmony and beauty may be the result of a just equilibrium. You have been taught this in those degrees, conferred in the Lodge of Perfection, which inculcate particularly the practical morality of Freemasonry. To be true, under whatever temptation to be false. To be honest in all your dealings, even if great losses should be the consequence, to be charitable, when selfishness would prompt you to close your hand, and deprivation of luxury or comfort must follow the charitable act. To judge justly and impartially, even in your own case, when baser impulses prompt you to do an injustice in order that you may be benefited or justified, to be tolerant, when passion prompts to intolerance and persecution. To do that which is right, when the wrong seems to promise larger profit, and to wrong no man of anything that is his, however easy it may seem so to enrich yourself. In all these things and others which you promised in those degrees, your spiritual nature is taught and encouraged to assert its rightful dominion over your appetites and passions. The philosophical degrees have taught you the value of knowledge, the excellence of truth, the superiority of intellectual labor, the dignity and value of your soul, the worth of great and noble thoughts. And thus endeavored to assist you to rise above the level of the animal appetites and passions, the pursuits of greed and the miserable struggles of ambition, and to find purer pleasure and nobler prizes and rewards in the acquisition of knowledge. The enlargement of the intellect, the interpretation of the sacred writing of God upon the great pages of the Book of Nature. And the chivalric degrees have led you on the same path, by showing you the excellence of generosity, clemency, forgiveness of injuries, magnanimity, contempt of danger, and the paramount obligations of duty and honor. They have taught you to overcome the fear of death, 
to devote yourself to the great cause of civil and religious liberty, to be the soldier of all that is just, right and true. In the midst of pestilence to deserve your title of knight commander of the temple, and neither there nor elsewhere to desert your post and flee dastard-like from the foe. In all this, you assert the superiority and right to dominion of that in you which is spiritual and divine. No base fear of danger or death, no sordid ambitions or pitiful greeds or base considerations can tempt a true Scottish knight to dishonor, and so make his intellect, his reason, his soul, the bond-slave of his appetites, of his passions. Of that which is material and animal, selfish and brutish in his nature. It is not possible to create a true and genuine brotherhood upon any theory of the baseness of human nature, nor by a community of belief in abstract propositions as to the nature of the deity, the number of his persons, or other theorems of religious faith, nor by the establishment of a system of association simply for mutual relief, and by which, in consideration of certain payments regularly made, each becomes entitled to a certain stipend in case of sickness. To attention then, and to the ceremonies of burial after death. There can be no genuine brotherhood without mutual regard, good opinion and esteem, mutual charity, and mutual allowance for faults and failings. It is those only who learn habitually to think better of each other, to look habitually for the good that is in each other, and expect, allow for, and overlook, the evil, who can be brethren one of the other, in any true sense of the word. Those who gloat over the failings of one another, who think each other to be naturally base and low, of a nature in which the evil predominates and excellence is not to be looked for, cannot be even friends, and much less brethren. No one can have a right to think meanly of his race, unless he also thinks meanly of himself. If, from a single fault or error, he judges of the character of another, and takes the single act as evidence of the whole nature of the man and of the whole course of his life, he ought to consent to be judged by the same rule. And to admit it to be right that others should thus uncharitably condemn himself. But such judgments will become impossible when he incessantly reminds himself that in every man who lives there is an immortal soul endeavoring to do that which is right and just. A ray, however small, and almost inappreciable, from the great source of light and intelligence, which ever struggles upward amid all the impediments of sense and the obstructions of the passions. And that in every man this ray continually wages war against his evil passions and his unruly appetites, or, if it has succumbed, is never wholly extinguished and annihilated. For he will then see that it is not victory, but the struggle that deserves honor, since in this as in all else no man can always command success. Amid a cloud of errors, of failure, and shortcomings, he will look for the struggling soul, for that which is good in every one amid the evil, and, believing that each is better than from his acts and omissions he seems to be. And that God cares for him still, and pities him and loves him, he will feel that even the erring sinner is still his brother, still entitled to his sympathy, and bound to him by the indissoluble ties of fellowship. If there be nothing of the divine in man, what is he, after all, but a more intelligent animal? He hath no fault nor vice which some beast hath not, and therefore in his vices he is but a beast of a higher order. And he hath hardly any moral excellence, perhaps none, which some animal hath not in as great a degree, even the more excellent of these, such as generosity, fidelity, and magnanimity. Bartizan, the Syrian Christian, in his Book of the Laws of Countries, says, of men, that, in the things belonging to their bodies, they maintain their nature like animals, and in the things which belong to their minds, they do that which they wish. As being free and with power, and as the likeness of God. And Meliton, Bishop of Sardis, in his oration to Antoninus Caesar, says, Let him, the ever-living God, be always present in thy mind, for thy mind itself is his likeness, for it, too, is invisible and impalpable, and without form. As he exists forever, so thou also, when thou shalt have put off this which is visible and corruptible, shalt stand before him forever, living and endowed with knowledge. As a matter far above our comprehension, and in the Hebrew Genesis the words that are used to express the origin of things are of uncertain meaning, and with equal propriety may be translated by the word, generated, produced, made. Or, created, 
we need not dispute nor debate whether the soul or spirit of man be a ray that has emanated or flowed forth from the supreme intelligence, or whether the infinite power hath called each into existence from nothing. By a mere exertion of its will, and endowed it with immortality, and with intelligence like unto the divine intelligence, for, in either case it may be said that in man the divine is united to the human. Of this union the equilateral triangle inscribed within the square is a symbol. We see the soul, Plato said, as men see the statue of Glaucus, recovered from the sea wherein it had lain many years, which viewing, it was not easy, if possible, to discern what was its original nature. Its limbs having been partly broken and partly worn and by defacement changed, by the action of the waves, and shells, weeds, and pebbles adhering to it. So that it more resembled some strange monster than that which it was when it left its divine source. Even so, he said, we see the soul, deformed by innumerable things that have done it harm, have mutilated and defaced it. But the mason who hath the royal secret can also with him argue, from beholding its love of wisdom, its tendency toward association with what is divine and immortal, its larger aspirations, its struggles, though they may have ended in defeat. With the impediments and enthrallments of the senses and the passions, that when it shall have been rescued from the material environments that now prove too strong for it, and be freed from the deforming and disfiguring accretions that here adhere to it, it will again be seen in its true nature, and by degrees ascend by the mystic ladder of the spheres, to its first home and place of origin. The royal secret, of which you are prince, if you are a true adept, if knowledge seems to you advisable, and philosophy is, for you, radiant with a divine beauty, is that which the Sohar terms the mystery of the balance. It is the secret of the universal equilibrium. Of that equilibrium in the deity, between the infinite divine wisdom and the infinite divine power, from which result the stability of the universe, the unchangeableness of the divine law, and the principles of truth, justice, and right which are a part of it, and the supreme obligation of the divine law upon all men, as superior to all other law, and forming a part of all the laws of men and nations. Of that equilibrium also, between the infinite divine justice and the infinite divine mercy, the result of which is the infinite divine equity, and the moral harmony or beauty of the universe. By it the endurance of created and imperfect natures in the presence of a perfect deity is made possible, and for him, also, as for us, to love is better than to hate, and forgiveness is wiser than revenge or punishment. Of that equilibrium between necessity and liberty, between the action of the divine omnipotence and the free will of man, by which vices and base actions, and ungenerous thoughts and words are crimes and wrongs. Justly punished by the law of cause and consequence, though nothing in the universe can happen or be done contrary to the will of God. And without which coexistence of liberty and necessity, of free will in the creature and omnipotence in the Creator, there could be no religion, nor any law of right and wrong, or merit and demerit. Nor any justice in human punishments or penal laws. Of that equilibrium between good and evil, and light and darkness in the world, which assures us that all is the work of the infinite wisdom and of an infinite love. And that there is no rebellious demon of evil, or principle of darkness coexistent and in eternal controversy with God, or the principle of light and of good, by attaining to the knowledge of which equilibrium we can, through faith. See that the existence of evil, sin, suffering, and sorrow in the world, is consistent with the infinite goodness as well as with the infinite wisdom of the Almighty. Sympathy and antipathy, attraction and repulsion, each a force of nature, are contraries, in the souls of men and in the universe of spheres and worlds. And from the action and opposition of each against the other, result harmony, and that movement which is the life of the universe and the soul alike. They are not antagonists of each other. The force that repels a planet from the sun is no more an evil force, than that which attracts the planet toward the central luminary. For each is created and exerted by the deity, and the result is the harmonious movement of the obedient planets in their elliptic orbits, and the mathematical accuracy and unvarying regularity of their movements. Of that equilibrium between authority and individual action which constitutes free government, by settling on immutable foundations liberty with obedience to law, equality with subjection to authority, and fraternity with subordination to the wisest and the best, 
and of that equilibrium between the active energy of the will of the present, expressed by the vote of the people, and the passive stability and permanence of the will of the past. Expressed in constitutions of government, written or unwritten, and in the laws and customs, grey with age and sanctified by time, as precedence and authority. Which is represented by the arch resting on the two columns, Jachin and Boaz, that stand at the portals of the temple builded by wisdom, on one of which masonry sets the celestial globe, symbol of the spiritual part of our composite nature. And on the other the terrestrial globe, symbol of the material part. And, finally, of that equilibrium, possible in ourselves, and which masonry incessantly labors to accomplish in its initiates, and demands of its adepts and princes, else unworthy of their titles. Between the spiritual and divine and the material and human in man. Between the intellect, reason, and moral sense on one side, and the appetites and passions on the other, from which result the harmony and beauty of a well-regulated life. Which possible equilibrium proves to us that our appetites and senses also are forces given unto us by God, for purposes of good, and not the fruits of the malignancy of a devil, to be detested, mortified, and, if possible, rendered inert and dead, that they are given us to be the means by which we shall be strengthened and incited to great and good deeds, and are to be wisely used, and not abused. To be controlled and kept within due bounds by the reason and the moral sense. To be made useful instruments and servants, and not permitted to become the managers and masters, using our intellect and reason as base instruments for their gratification. And this equilibrium teaches us, above all, to reverence ourselves as immortal souls, and to have respect and charity for others, who are even such as we are, partakers with us of the divine nature, lighted by a ray of the divine intelligence. Struggling, like us, toward the light. Capable, like us, of progress upward toward perfection, and deserving to be loved and pitied, but never to be hated nor despised. To be aided and encouraged in this life struggle, and not to be abandoned or left to wander in the darkness alone, still less to be trampled upon in our own efforts to ascend. From the mutual action and reaction of each of these pairs of opposites and contraries results that which with them forms the triangle, to all the ancient sages the expressive symbol of the deity. As from Osiris and Isis, Harori, the master of light and life, and the creative word. At the angles of one stand, symbolically, the three columns that support the lodge, itself a symbol of the universe, wisdom, power, and harmony or beauty. One of these symbols, found on the tracing board of the apprentice's degree, teaches this last lesson of Freemasonry. It is the right angle triangle, representing man, as a union of the spiritual and material, of the divine and human. The base, measured by the number three, the number of the triangle, represents the deity in the divine, the perpendicular, measured by the number four, the number of the square, represents the earth, the material, and the human. And the hypotenuse, measured by five, represents that nature which is produced by the union of the divine and human, the soul and the body. The squares, nine and sixteen, of the base and perpendicular, added together, producing twenty-five, the square root whereof is five, the measure of the hypotenuse. And as in each triangle of perfection, one is three and three are one, so man is one, though of a double nature, and he attains the purposes of his being only when the two natures that are in him are in just equilibrium. And his life is a success only when it too is a harmony, and beautiful, like the great harmonies of God and the universe. Such, my brother, is the true word of a master mason. Such the true royal secret which makes possible, and shall at length make real, the holy empire of true Masonic brotherhood. Gloria Dei est solare verbum. Amen.